Hello, check. Hello, check. Hello, check. Hello, hello.
हेलो 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 हेलो
Hello. Nick, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Excellent. Can you also um, see us? Yeah, I can see everyone. I'll probably turn off my uh, camera when I'm not speaking so I don't hover over everybody. All right, perfect. Hi, Nick. Morning. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Siddharth here. Oh, hi, Siddharth. How are you? Fine, thank you. Looking forward. Just a yeah. quick, you can hear me, right? Uh, just a quick uh, uh, change in the order. Uh, uh, Saurav has asked if he could go first because he's the the non-lawyer in the panel. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Right. So then I'll come to you, at number two. Okay, and uh, and you said about fifteen twenty minutes, right? Yeah, about eighteen minutes. Oh, eighteen minutes, sure. And just feel free to cut me off if I'm going long.
good morning uh, all can you can you hear me clearly yeah thanks so good morning uh, welcome to the first session of the second day of the conference um uh, nick you can hear us clearly great so this is a session on taking stock of the judiciary and uh, we've got four very interesting presentations to come along we'll follow the same format um each of them will make roughly about an 18 minute or thereabouts uh presentation uh i'll try and see if i can intersperse some questions in between but then we'll take questions and follow the same format first of all happy easter uh and the, for those on the financially minded side it's the last day of the financial year as well uh my job today is as a concert master not conductor so i will try and see if everyone will either play in tune or if they are playing different pieces that they are not in dissonance with each other in the sense that that there is some sense of the overall melody and uh, we'll begin with uh, sorov um why don't i ask you to get started right away sorov up to you wherever you'd like to would you like to you can speak from there if you wish yeah all right okay Hmm. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to start the stopwatch so that I don't go beyond my time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, very good morning to all of you. I wanted to go first because I'm the only non-lawyer here. Um, so all the other lawyers can go very technical after me. uh um, as a journalist you know because because of the profession we are not tend to be liked a lot so the chief justice of india dr dhananjay chandrachur he was speaking at uh, the ramnath goenka journalism awards back in march 2023 and he said that journalists and judges share a common occupational hazard of being disliked by virtue of their profession this is no easy cross to bear and i completely agree with him i thank nalsar and particularly professor chohan here uh, and the students for inviting me to speak on this very important subject and through that also acknowledge the critical role that journalists play in bringing attention to issues uh, that require urgent reform so i'll be speaking on the master of the roster issue because i have Uh, reported on this extensively in the past year i'll be addressing the concerns uh, about the lack of transparency within internal processes of the judiciary mainly the supreme court including listing of cases internal committees bench allocations um, lacking subject matter expertise and the collegium i will also emphasize how the media could help bring attention to these issues and catalyze reforms by shaping public discourse all right so master of the roster of course um, i don't need to go too much into the detail here because i'm sure everybody here knows about it but still the privilege and the administrative power of the chief justice of a court to constitute benches and allocate cases at their absolute discretion is called the master of the roster system uh the origin of the system of course is not contained in any law or the constitution but over time has developed as a matter of convention and various apex court judgments um and you need a person to ensure efficient functioning of the judiciary and that burden falls on the chief justice of the court uh and these considerations are very important so the workload management expertise of the judges in specific areas of law
I, I highlighted not only the arbitrary powers of the uh, master of the roster, but a lack of adherence to the court's own rules and convention. The eight cases that I listed out were, uh, uh, I don't want to list them out all here, but I think Umar Khalid's case, uh, the bail petition that he had filed, and the challenges to the constitutional validity of Unlawful Activities Prevention Act are very um, important because the way the case has shifted from senior judges to a junior judge makes for a very interesting case study. So you see the Supreme Court has a handbook uh, which you know details out all the rules and procedures to be followed in allocation of cases and transfer of cases. Now the rules say that the uh, cases should be retained before the senior judge before whom the case was first listed or fresh cases should be listed before a judge hearing a similar case. Of course, if the judge recuses or retires, it then goes before another judge. The junior judge keeps changing over time in the bench. Despite this, the eight cases that I listed out, which had uh, you know huge political ramifications, were shifted from benches, uh, were shifted before benches, either consisting of Justice Bela Trivedi or a bench led by her. I think she was sitting in court number 16, and uh, today she is sitting in court number 15. So let's look at Umar Khalid's case. It makes for a very interesting case study. It's been over 3.5 years since Umar Khalid has been in jail in the larger conspiracy case connected to the 2020 Delhi riots. Uh, that is 1,295 days of incarceration, no bail given by any of the courts, including the Supreme Court. Uh, he is in jail because the Delhi High Court thought that using the words inkilabi salam, which means revolutionary salute, and krantikari istikbal, which means revolutionary welcome, in a speech is an inciting speech. The H Delhi High Court had also questioned Khalid for using the word jumla against the Prime Minister and commented that there should be a Lakshman Rekha for criticism. Anyway, the bail was rejected by the Delhi High Court and it made its way to the Supreme, uh, the appeal made its way to the Supreme Court. Um, in this case, the, the peti Khalid's petition was first listed before a bench headed by Justice Bopanna. He was then the senior, uh, seventh senior most judge uh, after Justice Aniruddha Bose, who was the sixth senior most judge. So back in May 2023, when the matter had first come up, um, Justice Bopanna's bench had said that it is a matter which may take only one or two minutes to decide. Uh, two months later, on 9th August, the accompanying judge on the bench, Justice Prasa Prashant Kumar Mishra, recused himself from the case for reasons we don't know. Um, and few days later, on 18th August, the case was moved from Justice Bopanna's bench to a bench led by Justice Aniruddha Bose. And Justice Aniruddha Bose was sitting with Justice Bela Trivedi. Now, Justice Bopanna's bench did not pass a judicial order asking for the case to be sent before another bench. It was only Justice Mishra who had recused, and the judge, the, and therefore the bench had ordered that the case should be put before him in some other combination because the junior judge keeps changing over time. Now, on 12 October, after the uh, matter was shifted to Justice Bose's bench, which also included Justice Trivedi. Khalid's plea was moved from his bench to a bench headed by Justice Bela Trivedi. The reasons were not given. There was no judicial order. Justice Bose was available. He was hearing cases. He did not retire. He did not recuse. It is only in these circumstances that the master of the roster could uh, transfer cases from one judge to another. How then could the case have been pulled from his bench and shifted before another judge. Now remember Khalid's bail plea by 12 October last year had come before Justice Trivedi's bench and it had remained with her. Now lawyers objected to it, but to no avail. Now around that time, October 2023, as a matter of legal strategy, I believe, uh, Khalid filed a fresh petition challenging the UAPA, uh, the uh, constitutional validity of UAPA. So, uh, but there were a number of other petitions that were already pending before the Chief Justice's court and Justice Sanjeev Khanna's court, who was then uh, judge number three. Now, 
Of course, as the rules have it, the new matter should have been tagged along with the old cases and made their way to the Chief Justice's court, court number one or court number three. But then the matters went, the, the Khalid's petition went before Justice Bose and Justice Bela Trivedi. That was, again, not explained. Now, uh, initially, when the case came up, the UAPA constitutional, uh, constitutionality challenge, the bench ordered that the matter be tagged along with all the other pending uh, cases. So the case should have then made, to, uh, made its way to court number one or two. But then on the next date of hearing, 20th October, it was again listed before the same bench. And the same bench then uh, ordered that the case has to be, the UAPA challenge has to be taken up together along with Khalid's bail plea and should be listed before the appropriate bench. Now remember by that time, Khalid's bail plea had already made its way to Justice Trivedi's court for reasons not known. And this way, the entire UAPA batch petition made its way, was pulled out from the Chief Justice's court and Sanjeev Khanna's court and listed before Justice Bela Trivedi's court. The powers of the Chief Justice are limited to deciding rosters of the judges and constitution of benches. The master's registry pulling out cases being actively heard by a judge and transferring it to another judge without any explanation, without the judge hearing the case, ordering for it, is in violation of the rules and is akin to withdrawing judicial work. Such powers do not exist and cannot be usurped, I think, by the Chief Justice, who is only the first amongst the equal, and this cannot be normalized. Ultimately, in February this year, Khalid withdrew his bail plea and said he would try his luck in the lower courts. I believe it is a severe indictment of our criminal justice system and really our Supreme Court, because more recently, another person, the Chief Minister of Delhi, Arvind Kejriwal, withdrew his petition challenging his arrest by the ED. Incidentally, the special bench uh, before whom his plea was listed legal process and a fair impartial The Ritu Sabria judgment delivered by a two judge bench led by Justice Krishna Murari and Justice C.T. Ravi Kumar was stayed by another bench of the, effectively stayed by another bench of the Supreme Court of the equal strength. Bypassing all procedural requirements is another example of how the master of roster powers are prone to abuse. You I will, uh, I will not go in detail about the Chhabri, uh, how the case uh, proceeded in the Supreme Court, but this is also a very important example. Now you see when uh, the report had come out about, about cases making their way to Justice Bela Trivedi, uh, the Supreme Court attempted to counter the findings in, in the report via an anonymous plant in one of the legal news portals. Such stories only help institutions to evade responsibility and escape institutional accountability. It was some source, senior source apparently within the Supreme Court registry who said that Justice Bela Trivedi is perceived to be a strict judge. But then I think a response to this should have come from the judges themselves and not from some anonymous source in the court. Of course, the Chief Justice of India also in an interview to PTI, I think, towards the end of the year, tried to address these concerns and said the lawyers are not allowed to choose which case would go to which judge. But the objection here was not that. The objection was that number of cases were making their way in violation of rules before a particular judge. That concern was not addressed. 
Now you see a number of people are of the opinion that one must not, um, uh, by a number of people I also mean a lot of lawyers are of the opinion that one must not criticize, one must only criticize the judgment but not the judge. A number of such people are lawyers themselves per, because perhaps they too are beneficiaries of the arbitrariness, the laxity in, the, in adhering to fixed rules and procedures of the court itself. I only ask why then within four corners of their office they tend to say, tell me the name of the judge and I tell you the judgment. People have started taking the requirement to KYJ, know your judge very seriously. Bench hunting, forum shopping is a lived reality. Therefore, if such a review of a judge happens every time a client walks through the door, why then is it not fair that a person be ab able to criticize the work of a judge based on truth and facts? The second thing that I want to, um, how much time do we have? Three minutes, okay. So the second thing I wanted to address very quickly is the lack of transparency in functioning of the courts. The, on 29 June 2023, sources in the Supreme Court announced that a new scientifically prepared roster system based exclusively on the domain expertise of judges is being made effective. But the roster available publicly showed no change. Out of the 16 presiding judges in the Supreme Court today, 14 of them can hear criminal matters. But what in criminal matters, we don't know. The master of the roster can exercise powers to allocate any criminal case to any of these 14 judges, thereby retaining the wide discretion they have. There is no transparency as such as to how a case is allocated to which judge. Senior advocates today have complained that certain cases they file are marked sensitive by the registry and are specially put up before the Chief Justice for instructions. You look at the roster of the Bombay High Court, which is so much more detailed and does a fairly good job, I feel, in cutting down arbitrariness in allocation of cases. This is something you would expect of the Supreme Court, but sadly, that's not the case. I have also made a number of attempts through RTIs to ascertain how a case was deleted or never been listed after, after the last time. Of course, the RTIs were rejected. The registry said they are all on the basis of the orders of the court and rules and regulations. A vague response, uh, much like the roster itself. The manner in which the Delhi riots case has proceeded in the uh, Delhi High Court is also a telling example of this unfairness. Uh, uh, the, the, the accused in the larger conspiracy case, uh, in which Umar Khalid is also an accused, the bail petitions were, in one of the accused cases, the bail petition was heard about 66 times. Okay, 66 times, but the judgment never came through. The, judge, the court sat over the judgment for seven months before both the judges, before one of the judges was transferred out of the Delhi High Court. And you see, there are a number of other RTIs that I tried to um, file and get the data for the CAS data, the assets of judges, sexual harassment committee reports, most of these rejections cited independence of judiciary as a ground to deny information. Uh, yesterday there was a discussion about uh, the Chief Justice being included in the uh, Election Commission uh, um, appointment committee. So uh, similarly, the Chief Justice is part of the committee that uh, selects the CBI di director. Now I filed an RTA asking what criteria did the, did the Chief Justice follow to shortlist candidates. The RTA was rejected on the grounds that fiduciary relationship, personal information and third party information cannot be given. Now uh, other, senior, other former judges of the Supreme Court have said that corruption complaints um, that the court receives, they have no mechanism to really uh, ascertain if the allegations are true or not. Uh, the system currently being followed is I ask him, he asks the other, and then that's how they reach a conclusion to either dismiss a complaint or so do something about it. I think it's a, a matter that needs serious consideration because the Supreme Court judges have no mechanism to really investigate such allegations. There needs to be a system in place. If the current informal system of I ask him, he asks others is acceptable and is used to make such decisions, then should not the media outlets be free to publish Numerous unverified claims they hear regularly. I think, and lastly, the role of the bar. I feel the media plays a very important role in serving as a watchdog and a catalyst for change by raising these issues of transparency and accountability. The media's role is to inform the layman about the law and the judiciary in the simplest terms. 
it has been a challenge for me as well to explain such uh, detailed you know judgments and the kind of language that is being used in the judgments in simpler terms to the public but that is a challenge that most of us journalists have to uh, face and do something about the bar today i think has also failed to enforce uh, high standards on the bench the bar which is to keep a check on the bench has failed and i think lawyers also because they are bound by institutional restrictions uh, because they can't speak freely both inside the court and outside the court because of course you can't prejudice your clients that way i think a healthy collaboration between the bar and the media to advocate for issues of public interest especially today is the need of the hour with that i think i'll conclude thank you thanks thanks so much saurav thank you uh over to you nick if you can hear us please go ahead can you hear us Can now. you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Please, the floor Perfect. is yours. Thanks so much. Um, and I wish I could be joining there uh, today in person. I think the last time I went to Nalsar was 10, 15 years ago, but I have really fond memories of being there. Appreciate the invitation from the students, uh, from Siddharth Chowan. I know there's some friends in the audience. Um, and really uh, feel privileged to be part of this panel. Um, uh, really appreciate the work that uh, Saurav Das and other journalists are doing, um, which I think is really important right now to, um, to bring this level of scrutiny um, and transparency to the court and its inner workings, which is so often just kind of opaque um, to the larger public, but also to, to lawyers themselves. Um, I, I'm going to speak today on constitution benches, um, and I'm speaking about it actually, I, I kind of want to make clear from the beginning, not because I think it's the most um, important um, institu institutional question before the court right now. Um, I, I think there's obviously there's a lot of questions right now that have been brought up, you know, by, uh, by Saurav Das about kind of judicial independence. Um, you know, the court went through a long period where you know, it gained power in the face of a fractured kind of coalition governments um, that were ruling in the center. It's in a different situation now, um, and it's uh, a kind of a different institutional terrain and political terrain um, that it's facing. Um, that said, I think constitutional bench and benches are really significant and important questions. Let me share this. Are you seeing a PowerPoint? Yes, Nick, we can we can see okay. that point. You can see it. Okay, great. Perfect. I get technology to work. I don't always get technology to work, so I'm happy it, it's happening. So um, this is a, um, a part based on a paper that I've been working on um, with uh, Jyotika uh, uh, Randawa, and it's um, part of a larger question um, that I think is less developed, which is, um, you know, what is the ideal structure of a court? You know, there's a lot written about, um, and a, a Supreme Court in particular. So there's been a lot written about parliaments and how parliaments and legislatures should be structured. Um, there's less written about courts, particularly in the academic literature. Um, and you know you I, I think there's reasons to think you could have multiple answers to this question you know so for india for just example you know india's supreme court started out with eight judges um now there's 33 judges and the chief justice um and when you look around the world you see a significant variety in court sizes um and how they sit across countries and i think one way to think about this is to just ask you know, what are the goals that a court is trying to accomplish, right? What, um, and what's the best structure for accomplishing those goals? Um, 
So this, as I said, draws on a paper that I've been working on. Um, that's a part of a, 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 a kind of a broader set of work that I've been doing around over the years on uh, the institution of the Supreme Court. Um, what kinds of cases it hears, how that's changed with time, how it hears those cases, um, how this institutional pattern impacts its adjudication practices and outcomes. Um, you know, I live in the United States now, so I do less of this. I used to turn out more of these articles, but I still, you know, stay engaged. And so I would say just from the outset that, you know, I, I follow less kind of the day to day of the Supreme Court. Um, but I, I'm, uh, it's, it's been um, uh, rewarding to keep thinking about these kinds of like larger academic questions. And I hope that's helpful in this conversation. Um, so I documented in other work. Um, uh, including an article in the EPW years ago with with a number of former students, um, you know, we went through all the Constitution benches um, that's ever sat uh, sat up until that time on the Indian Supreme Court, and seeing one of the main takeaways from that paper is that there was a marked decline in the number of these Constitution benches, um, and that was a more descriptive paper. This is a more prescriptive paper. Um, on, you know, what is the impact of not having as many constitution benches? Should the court have more ben constitution benches? And if it should, how should it move towards that outcome? Um, so I take as a jumping off point, um, the constitutional text itself, and this has always kind of struck me, um, that, you know, I'm, I'm putting it here, you know, the minimum number of judges who are to sit for the purpose of deciding, deciding any case involving a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of this constitution shall be five, right? So there's a constitutional requirement of five or more judges for any query, what this means, a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of this constitution. As many of you know, this same phrase is used in two other places in the constitution. So one is in article 30, 132 appeals, um, for which cases um, high courts can certify to Supreme Courts uh, around constitutional questions. Um, and then the third is in Article 228, right, which is essentially um, which cases um, must be um, uh, uh, withdrawn out of uh, the district courts um, to the high court. Again, involving a constitutional question. So again, this language around a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of this constitution. So big question, what does this mean? Um, what did the drafters of the constitution think this means? So when I've been going back through the constituent assembly debates, um, there isn't as much discussion about 145.3, um, the requirement for having a constitution bench there, but the discussion that is, seems to be where most of the members of the Constituent Assembly think that most constitutional questions, most, you know, for example, a uh, challenge to the constitutional validity of a law would be heard by a constitution bench. And so I'm just putting up a, a quote from Ambikar that hopefully you can all see and read. Um, but as you can kind of see from the way that he's talking about, it, he says, look, you know, for constitutional questions, um, we're going to have a requirement of five judges for all these other questions that come up, civil, criminal, other kinds of cases. We'll have three judge benches, right? There's originally eight, eight judges on the Indian Supreme Court. Um, you see other uh, members of the Constituent Assembly saying, you know, if a constitutional point comes up, it'll go to a constitution bench, right? That was the understanding um, in the Constituent Assembly. I'll flag this and get back to this broader point later. There was some discussion there. Um, or there wasn't a discussion of this, but there was a, a federal court case at the time, um, which also talks about a substantial question as the interpretation of um, the, uh, 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 the 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 um, uh, anyways the the government of India Act, um, and says uh, that you know what is a substantial question of the government of India? Well, it's a question that hasn't been authoritatively decided. So there's this also in the background. They don't talk about it in the Constituent Assembly, but maybe that was the background norm and that's what they were understanding there. But anyways, the long and short of it, there wasn't that much discussion. So then we get into court precedent. I'll go through this pretty quickly because I think there isn't that much. There's never been a constitution bench that has decided when there should be constitution benches, um, which I think is an interesting uh, question. Um, and you, you can see over time, so there's a 1957 judgment that interpreted Article 228 the same 
using the same language, which seems to have a different interpretation, right? So it says the validity of the provision is challenged on the ground that it contra uh, contravenes an article of the Constitution, right? And so that was interpreted as a substantial question of constitutional law. It's just that it's you know any challenge uh, to the uh, to a um, uh, a piece of legislation on on a constitutional ground, um, and you see this kind of develop over time and shift where the court eventually ends up, and I'll, I'll focus on this this last one, uh, this 2019 Supreme Court judgment, where you have a smaller uh, Supreme Court judge bench interpreting 145.3 at length. And it says, you know, if the questions having a determining effect on the final outcome have already been decided by a conclusive authority, then such questions cannot be called as substantial questions of law. And I think that's been, you know, where the court has been more in its jurisprudence, but I think the jurisprudence question is, you know, is conflicting, right? So this 1957 judgment I mentioned, for example, is a five judge, it's a constitution bench. It's never been overruled. Um, so you have a kind of a lack of clarity about this question, which cases should be going to constitution benches um, in the first place. And then you go into court practice. Um, and I think many people know this, um, but the, I'm, uh, here, uh, this is a chart from this, this upcoming paper that's borrowed also from the CPW article, where you see, you know, you go back into the 1960s, you had well over 100 constitution benches a year, um, some years um, in the 1960s. By the time you get into certainly, you know, the 90s, but also into the 2000s, 2010s, you're consistently hearing less than 10 constitution benches a year. And this was not the understanding of the early court of how this would work either. I put a quote up from the India Law Commission that you can all read about um, how the court was imagining it would be, uh, be, uh, be deciding cases, kind of a telling sentence at the end where they had to revise the rules so that now you could have division benches here, cases with two judges, because it was never thought at the beginning that you'd have these two judge benches. It would be either five or it'd be three or it'd be seven, it would be another number, right? Um, so, but it, they did this because of all of these appeals, they, I, they, because there was so much access to the court um, and particularly through the SLP and the standard li uh, leave petition, um, there was, this mass um, expansion of the appellate um, uh, uh, number of appellate cases that the court was hearing. I think most people are familiar with that story. But what's telling about it is the reduction in the amount of constitution benches wasn't because of any change in precedent. It's not like the court came up with new criteria. It's because they got overwhelmed with cases, right? And then they just had fewer judges, even though they were getting, you know, the court expanded, but there were fewer judges available to hear these constitution benches. So why does this matter? Um, so I think there's a few things here. So one is consistency. Um, and um, I, I'll start with a broader point here. So, you know, I think the, the broader argument here is that the larger the bench you have, it reduces the influence of any one judge, right? So what are the implications of that? So one is consistency. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism over the years about kind of the inconsistency of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, of conflicting jur uh, jurisprudence, um, of bench hunting that happens as a result of that. Um, and arguably, as you get larger benches, um, you'll have more consistency. That doesn't mean you'll have perfect consistency, um, but you'll have more. I think that has very kind of real rule of law values. It helps set precedent for the lower court, uh, for the uh, high courts and uh, the district courts. So litigants know uh, more what to expect, um, that those judges know how to apply the law. Um, I think there's a separate question you could get into here, and I've written about others, about kind of the benefits of a polyvocal court, right? Um, that you have all these benches saying different things. And so maybe that keeps people engaging and coming back um, because it's harder to kind of capture any, if it was just one bench that sat there, um, it might be harder to capture that entirely. Um, uh, but I think overall, there's clearly some benefits to consistency. Um, two, quality. Really hard to judge quality of judgments. You know, it's very subjective in many ways. But I think there's a couple ways to think about this. One is, you know, we've just seen high profile incidents of um, smaller benches later being overturned by lower benches of the Supreme Court. So, um, you know, as many people know, for example, the anti sodomy law was upheld by a, a smaller bench of the Indian Supreme Court later to be. Um, overturned by a larger bench. 
Um, I, I think you can find other examples like that. I think if you go into the group psychology literature, um, there's a lot out there that says larger groups um, tend to come up with more accurate, less biased decisions. Um, there's challenges to larger groups as well. You get into like group think issues like this. And I think there's clearly a size that you would get to where this breaks down. So Keisha Van Barati, really obviously very famous case, 13 judges, largest bench ever of the Indian Supreme Court. Um, for those law students who are there who have tried to read this judgment, right? You know, 700 pages, 11 different opinions, uh, lots of, you know, conflicting opinions about what it means, partly because so many bench, um, so many judges were hearing it and came up with so many different uh, decisions. So there's limits to size, I, I think, quite clearly as well. Um, and it's important to, to say, you know, even if you have a larger benches and, and constitution benches, they can still be captured. Um, I think there's greater legitimacy that can come with larger benches. Um, uh, um, I think there's still issues around chief justice bench setting of constitution benches, and you can get into how should these uh, benches be put together in the first place. Um, but clearly, if you have more judges, it's harder to, to set benches um, on those benches rather than if you just have uh, 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 two judges. Um, and you can also have more diversity on those benches too. If, if the co overall court has diversity, you can have more women, you can have more minorities, you can have uh, different uh, groups that are represented on those benches. Of course, they take up more judicial resources. Um, so there's an argument if you could do the same with less, um, why not do that? Um, there's a question about judicial innovation. Um, and I can come back to this later. Um, but the you know public interest litigation in India arguably would not have developed, right? If you had larger all cases, constitution, important constitutional cases being heard by larger benches, you know, somebody like Justice Bhagwati heard a lot of these on smaller benches, pioneered PIL, that took off, you know, that's become a really important part of what the, the court does. Um, and I won't get into this as much um, just for the sake of time, but I think there's a real question about um, what happens as the court hears more if you had more constitution benches being heard by the Supreme Court, that would push most more constitutional adjudication down to the high courts. And what does that do in a system like India where you don't have as much constitutional adjudication in the district court? So you're you're putting a lot on the high courts then um, with, with, with less possibility for appeal. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, so I think a lot of people have pointed to this problem of or the, this question of why don't we have more um, constitutional benches. The question is, well, how do we go about, how do we get from where we are now, right, to where we might want to go in the future if we want to have more of these constitution benches? Um, and I would argue there's kind of three reform strategies that I think have to be interlinked. Um, one is around just kind of the basic substantive criteria of when should you have a constitution bench? And you can um, Think about this in different ways. So, for example, turn up Kaitan um, at LSE. You know, he has an article where he lists out, you know, ten kinds of cases that should always go to a constitution bench. So, anything have involving the basic structure doctrine, or a constitutional challenge to a law, um, or if there is a dispute between, you know, two constitutional functionaries. All those have to go, he argues, to a constitution bench. And I think you've seen others do this too, trying to list out these cases in detail. And I think that's out of a distrust of the court, right? of seeing so many cases where you think these should be going to larger constitution benches um, and they're not. And I would argue there's merit to that, but it's also very constraining. I um, mean, you don't see other courts do that. I think actually having a broader um, criteria of something just like important cases, right? In court, clearly a basic structure doctrine case is an important case, you know, a constitutional challenge to an important law. Um, but that becomes a subjective category, right? We think there's not as many of these cases going to constitution benches as we should. So how could we think about, how do we make sure this criteria is applied um, in a more consistent way? So one thing I think to, that could be thought about is to have an admission bench that's a constitution bench. Um, so for example, even if you have, and we can get to this in a minute, like a permanent constitution bench setting or two permanent constitution benches setting, they could also be sitting there deciding which cases should um, uh, uh, be heard by constitution benches. And I think there's benefit to this because you then have a group of judges who are probably gonna hear some of these constitution benches themselves um, thinking about 
what kinds of cases should be being heard by larger benches and trying to apply that criteria systematically. Um, I think you could also think about, you know, high courts having a greater role and also setting constitution benches. I think you could have a rule that says smaller benches don't create binding constitutional precedent, right? And then third, and this is kind of my uh, last set of points here, is around judicial capacity. If this whole story began um, because there were so many admission matters um, being appealed up and so less ability to constitute these constitution benches, then you also have to address that side of the problem as well. Um, so one of these is hearing fewer SLP matters. There's been a lot of proposals about that. I think a lot of those make sense about the court hearing too many SLP matters and that in trying to give access to more people, it actually overwhelms the court, creates all these appeals um, and makes it harder uh, the access to the high courts and district courts less meaningful if everything has to be appealed up through the system. Um, and then there's been a discussion of a dedicated constitution bench. And I know for, you know, the last many months, um, there has been a constitution bench that's been sitting. Um, and I think that's an, an interesting development. Another thing that's been interesting to me, I think over the first, if I have this right, the first 16 months of that bench sitting, it's decided 19 constitution bench cases which is a fair amount in the context of India. But when you compare it to other courts, that actually isn't that many judgments over 16 months, which raises a question, why isn't it deciding more cases? And I think that gets to the questions about how long these hearings are, um, how judges have to be engaged in other matters while they're sitting on constitution benches. And so those kinds of things have to be addressed at the same time, um, including, um, uh, how these cases, who would then get to sit on constitution benches as well? Right now it's this kind of chief, chief justice dominant system. Um, and you could imagine other systems as well, such as random allocation. Um, and you can think about which might be a better system. You have a chief justice dominant system where there's more leadership to this fractured court, right? There's benefits and drawbacks to that, or you have kind of a rule-based order or just by lottery, there's benefits and strengths to that system as well. Sorry to come in over yeah, here. And that, I, that's that's my last point right there. Right. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to other speakers. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. <coughs> we'll next have Chitrakshi. As Chitrakshi is getting set up, I have a, a common question for both you, Saurav and Nick. Can you hear me, Nick? Yeah? So you you were sort of you were talking about the the, um, the the question of the of the roster and and the way in which it is set up, right? Um, I and and Nick was mentioning about you know the statistics which show that there have been lesser constitution benches, although anecdotally now there seem to be more number of them, or at least there's a there's a seemingly larger number of them. So my question is this that it at the intersection between managing the roster and the route taken by many of those cases to come to the constitution bench a point that uh, nick alluded to just your thoughts on how the interplay between managing the roster on the one hand has an impact on the number and the way in which constitution benches and the types of matters that they are hearing is set up, and is there a relationship between the two? Just a minute each, if if sort of you can go, Nick, and, and followed by Nick. Right. So uh, I think Dr. Apuna Chandra's book, Court on Trial, also mentions that a large docket of the Supreme Court really consists of SLPs coming down from the high courts, um, and SLP originally was supposed to be an extraordinary measure where not all cases should have come to the Supreme Court, but now because it forms such a huge uh, uh, chunk of the court's uh, docket, I think that really affects how many cases the, the Chief Justice can really assign to the Constitution bench. But I still feel that uh, because the Supreme Court has to interpret the Constitution and that's, that is its basic job, um, it it has to find ways, uh, maybe by reducing the number of SLPs it admits, or even because SLPs lawyers really uh, benefit from the court hearing SLPs. Um, so I think the court has to tackle that problem in order to perhaps make more time for constitution benches and you know hearing those okay. matters. Thanks. Thanks. Nick, if I could just ask you to come in over there on that question. 
the relationship between the way in which the route taken to get to the Supreme Court has an impact on the managing of the roster. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. And I, I there was a recent quote from Chief Justice Chandrachud, I forget in which newspaper, where he's talking about, yeah, we need to constitute more of these constitution benches. But look, we just have so many cases coming in, so many of these SLPs. And I think many chief justices up until at least recently would judge how many chief justices would judge kind of how well they had done during their term by how much they had brought down the pendency, right? How much they had brought down the backlog. Um, and I think that was a tension, right? In, you know, for not just the chief justice, but the court itself on how it thought about whether it was doing a successful job or not. And, you know, there was all these complaints about this backlog. So we got to bring that down. So we got to hear more of these cases. So we got to have more of these two judge benches. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I think there needs to be a different approach. And, you know, one of the things we're doing in this paper, it doesn't have to be this approach, but, you know, of thinking about, for example, setting up a constitution bench as the admission bench for constitutional matters. And then when lawyers think that they have a case that deserves to be heard by one of these benches, they can approach that directly, um, might bypass some of that system. So it's just a different way of, of thinking about it. And also, quite frankly, taking the chief justice out of the equation in a certain way. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. Hold the thought. I'm sure they'll have more. We'll have more questions in the brief Q&A that will follow. Chitrakshi, sorry. Apologies. Please go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to the organizing committee of Courts and Constitution and Review for inviting me. Of course, uh, this institution has um, I'm deeply indebted to, not only in terms of the mentorship that I received, but also the very meaningful friendships that nourished me while I was here and continue to do so as I age. Um, uh, with that, I begin and I hope, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you something that is not really been discussed, but to follow from where Nick left as to what are the matters that the Supreme Court should be deciding. And I'll give you examples of matters that it, in fact, it should, it has no business deciding. Uh, I'll start with that. I was going to conclude with, but I think it will, uh, you know, it'll have more synergy with what we just heard. Uh, what I'm largely addressing is administration of justice, the way courts are provisioned for, and what is the system of administration that they're subjected to. Now, of course, we know that the Supreme Court and the high courts, uh, you know, their administration is, uh, they have more independence, etc. And the district judiciary is subject to a system of administrative control by the high court. And that responsibility is jointly shared with the state governments in, in limited capacity because, after all, it is a state public service under list two. So under Article 2309, the governor, the state governments are entitled to make rules which determine the terms of service of the district judges. And district judges, I mean uh, civil judges, civil judges, senior uh, division, and the district judges, of course. Now, while this is the constitutional scheme, uh, what uh, we have witnessed in the last three decades is that uh, defying this constitutional scheme, the Supreme Court has sort of uh, anointed itself as the de facto administrative head of the district judiciary. And it has happened through a series of litigations and other administrative develop developments. But I'll start with the series of litigations that where, where the high court's powers and the state government's powers have been impinged upon by the Supreme Court. Uh, of course, this usurpation began with uh, a litigation called the All India Judges Association case uh, in the early 90s, where this association was demanding through the PIL route uh, better service conditions for the judges of the district judiciary. And I am not uh, doubting the fact that they were not well provided for. They were not. Uh, we know the state of infrastructure in the courtrooms. And we, of course, understand that uh, the public finance in India works under severe resource constraints. And uh, in the 1990s, this was a very valid claim that the district, ju the, the district judges were not provided for. The courtrooms, they were uh, working out of rented buildings. The infrastructure was not really present. And therefore, this court went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court appointed a commission and later gave orders that uh, the revised pay should be implemented by the state governments. Now, even when this order was made by the Supreme Court, the Union of India and the state governments had filed a review petition 
challenging the power of the Supreme Court to issue those directions, saying that A, it's placing a huge financial burden on the states, and the Supreme Court should not be the one deciding how healthy the fiscal capacity of the state is, whether it, in fact it can provide for those judges. Because uh, you should know that the, the, the judges were covered by the state pay commissions. It's not that the states were not really, perhaps they were uh, different in their capacities to provide for the judges. Maybe there was not a uniform pay parity between district judges, but the state governments were provisioning for uh, district judges then. This is, of course, in 1993. The Supreme Court rejected those objections and said that you cannot really uh, argue, for, you know, uh, fiscal constraints when it, uh, when it, uh, when it is an obligation that the state should mandatory fulfill and providing for judges is one such obligation. Now, this reasoning is also used by the Supreme Court very recently in a similar litigation also initiated by the All India Judges Association, where again, the Union of India and state governments had filed a review petition and it was concluded uh, in January this year. But the review petition was decided last year in 2023, where Union of India and the state governments raised similar objections. In fact, the state of Uttar Pradesh had very pointedly accused the court of usurping the powers under 235 and 309, saying that this is a violation of the constitution scheme, that the court is appointing commissions and the court is directing how much and when to pay uh, uh, the uh, judicial officers, which are primarily governed by state governments and the high courts. Uh, the second series of litigations uh, that uh, is Malik Mazar Sultan uh, versus the UP Public Service Commission, now, originally, uh, the, the court was asked to decide a very simple legal question about the legality of a UP judicial service rule. Uh, eventually, this case transformed into the vehicle to initiate all sorts of reforms. And currently, the case is still uh, you know, on the rolls. And currently, the Supreme Court is monitoring the recruitment cycles of judicial officers. Now, not only has the court prescribed timelines, it also directs the government officials to continuously supply the court with data, whether they're adhering to the set timelines, and it generates multiple orders every year. The third series of litigation that is uh, relevant to us is Imtiaz Ahmed versus State of UP. Again, it was a criminal appeal where the court was approached to decide, uh, originally in 2009, uh, the court was approached to decide on a prolonged stay of criminal proceeding, which was granted by the Allahabad High Court. Uh, the court used this case to not only uh, get the law commission to decide on various ways to calculate judge strength. In 2017, it directed that the NCMS committee, uh, it, it also directed the NCMS committee to come up with the formula to calculate judge strength. In 2017, it directed that that interim formula uh, developed by the committee be implemented by all state governments to calculate judge strength. Uh, and this was an interim formula. The NCMS committee was still preparing a final report, which would, uh, you know, have a different formula for calculating judge strength. And that that report was submitted in 2019. And I'm sure there will be another direction which said that perhaps you should implement the final report of the NCMS committee and the required formula to calculate judge strength. So, uh, the so far what we have seen is not only is the court deciding what the judicial officer should be paid. Uh, when they should be recruited, there are timelines prescribed by the Supreme Court. What is the formula calculating judge strength? Now, this is really at the root of provisioning for the district judiciary, because if you look at a budget, it primarily comprises of salaries, maintenance of courts, and courtroom infrastructure. That's primarily what uh, you know a functioning courtroom needs, and court staff, and the ministerial services. Now, the court controls various aspects. Uh, the state governments and uh, the high courts primarily control various aspects of budget preparation. And uh, of course, uh, the judiciary is not very you know proficient in planning and uh, budget preparations. They generally just use budgets from the previous financial years, and that demand is just rolled over with very simple modifications. Now, while state governments primarily provision for the salaries and day-to-day -day maintenance of courts, the central government has been supplementing the resources of the states. And this is why I think we also uh, need to see whether the court, in the, the, the Supreme Court's interventions are in fact useful because uh, there are two uh, problems with that. A, whether public finances, whether the Supreme Court or in, judiciary for that matter should have a meaningful control over public finance. Uh, of course, we know that the judiciary is not financially autonomous. Of course, the salaries of the judges of the upper courts are charged on the expenditure of the consolidated funds of the country and the respective states. 
uh, but it's not the case with the judicial officers of the state. Secondly, what we can surmise from uh, what the constitution thought, if the constitution thought uh, the judges should have these financial powers and financial autonomy can be surmised from the debates uh, on Article 146, which gives uh, which gives the court control over its own establishment and recruiting uh, the officers of the court. Now, it was very clear uh, the assembly was trying to balance two needs while it did recognize that giving the courts independence will make it function better. It also uh, was trying to balance it with financial accountability and Ambedkar especially felt that the executive is better positioned to understand the financial health of the state governments. So every time a rule which uh, applies to the officers of the court uh, under 229 and 146, if it has any burden, if it increases the salaries, etc., the governor has to be consulted in that uh, in when such a rule is being passed. So it's quite clear that the 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 assembly thought that financial autonomy is not really uh, is not really something that uh, you know court should be given any systematic control over. Uh, of course, we can decide, but I, I do think that public money should be under parliamentary control. Now, the court, has, Supreme Court, has also in other iterations been making more claims towards financial autonomy. You would see that in many public speeches of ex CJIs. Uh, Justice Thakur had once, in a very public outcry, said that we needed, you know, the judiciary is very, very under-provisioned, et cetera, under-resourced, and we needed 70,000 judges uh, to actually compensate for, uh, you know, to make sure that there is no delay and we deal with all the backlog. And the, these claims are, of course, made informally in speeches, but also uh, sometimes more, uh, these claims are more thoughtful. For example, when Justice Ramana was Chief Justice, he had floated a proposal to create a national judicial infrastructure corporation. And uh, this proposal was, of course, sent to the law ministry. And what it, in fact, uh, wanted was, it, of course, wanted state judicial infrastructure corporations, but also uh, it made sure that the Supreme Court was acting in, as patron in chief, et cetera, and, uh, and creating a, a hierarchy where there exists none, in fact. Uh, there is a way that the central government supplements the resources of the government for provisioning for the judiciary. This wasn't the case in the earlier decades of the independence. Uh, the judiciary was very, uh, there was a funding shortfall. But since uh, the 1993, they have been running a centrally sponsored scheme for judicial infrastructure. The Finance Commission has been making dedicated grants for improvement of justice delivery. And as anyone who has ever dabbled in public finance would know, for a lot of finances in India, the question is not really of allocation, but of spending, because most of these grants go underutilized. And this was also the case with the 13 Finance Commission's grant, which was uh, a very generous grant of 5,000 crores. Eventually, 1,500 crores were released, and even that couldn't be fully utilized. And therefore, I mean, what we do need to question here is whether it's really financial autonomy that will solve these problems of capacity and state capacity in public finance and the issues with fiscal federalism because these these finance commission grants and also the centrally sponsored scheme and as Ayman was pointing out yesterday there is not really uh, the encroachment on you know the state's powers is not really is rooted through various conditionalities and these conditionalities are present in these grants uh, these conditionalities are present in the working of the CSS because uh, for the central government to release funds to the state, the state has to really subscribe to a lot of conditions imposed by the central government. They have to file some utilization certificates. They have to calculate, uh, you know, the sanction strength of judges, etc. They have to make sure that to be to avail those funds, they have to meet those conditions. So uh, there is a larger debate on, you know, whether it really should be on how do we deal with this these uh, disparities and imbalances in our landscape of fiscal fiscal federalism and whether really giving the courts more power over you know over finances would solve these problems and the th uh, and this is uh, the last leg of why i think these are very concerning developments which is uh, the court's own attitude towards accountability now uh, the district judges are subject to administrative control uh, by the high court judges. The high courts, when deciding on administrative matters, either sit collectively in committees or full courts. And they have, you know, the high court rules will tell you what are the matters that are to be brought up before the administrative committees and which are the matters uh, that the full court decides upon. 
generally related to infrastructure, fortune, et cetera, they will have designated committees. There will be building committees, infrastructure committees, which evaluate the proposals or where a courtroom and why a courtroom, whether there is a need for building an extra courtroom, et cetera. Uh, these are the committees that, uh, you know, uh, not to, they actually proofread these proposals and sanction them and then send it to the state governments. Earlier, there were conflicts between the high courts and the state governments, and this is in 60s and 90s. If you re read Bakshi's Crisis of the Indian Legal System, he has some anecdotes about how 36 proposals by Allahabad High Court were sent, out of which 31 were rejected. So, I mean, this was definitely an issue, but I do not think after the after the CSS has been introduced and there is a more systematic way of uh, not only uh, coming up with a rationale of making more courtrooms, making more residential accommodations, this has been devised and sort of been dealt with. What is uh, the, the problematic aspect here is not really that the CSS functions, but the High Court Administrative Committee still have a lot of power, but they do not make the minutes of these committees uh, public nor do they respond to applications made under the RTI Act. We had tried. Uh, and this is part of a larger work that I'm doing with my colleague Prashant Reddy. And this is uh, uh, this is one aspect of uh, their opacity that I wanted to highlight. And uh, it's not that uh, the example is set by the Supreme Court. I'll give you one example. In March 2022, the Parliament Standing Committee, when it was looking at the demands for grants for Ministry of Law and Justice, as a remark said that the Supreme Court registry had been laid by two years to respond to objections which were filed by the CAG audit. So the DG Audit Central Expenditure, who audits the finances of the Supreme Court, had in fact told the registry that there are certain violations of the financial code in your finances, etc. I would like to receive a reply. Not only had the registry not filed the reply when we asked for, because, and, and we of course came upon it because we saw it in the report of the standing committee. We asked under, I made an application under the RTI Act to the Supreme Court asking for not only the report of the Auditor General, which had flagged these violations, but also the replies sent by the Supreme Court and whether they had in fact sent those replies. Uh, I got a reply from the public information officer saying that the replies have been sent and they refused the to share the copy of the report prepared by the CAG to me and justify the non-disclosure on the grounds that it will prejudicially affect the sovereignty and integrity of the country and cause a breach of parliamentary privileges. Um, now, of course, on the other hand, I filed uh, for the report with the office of the CAG and they very, very easily uh, gave me the copy of the report, which I do have and I will develop upon later. Not in this speech. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is not just one violation. If you ask, uh, for example, uh, the other problem with the Supreme Court making these courtroom uh, policies is also the, perhaps what the Supreme Court is trying to address is the non-uniformity in application of standards, right? For example, when it's saying that you implement uh, the interim report of the NCMS committee, the outcome it wants is that all the states would do the same thing. But if you file applications with the high courts, you would realize that they are all still calculating the judge strength very differently. For example, some don't even, they are not probably even, and this is when we file with the registries of the high court, not really, you know. Of course, there will be an order and a letter saying that this is the formula that you should apply while calculating judge strength. But when you file with the registries of the high court, increasingly you will see that a high court sometimes is not even aware of the decision. And they are still using population as a criteria, which was a very old criteria. And there's a very infamous law commission report in 1980, that had said that population should be a criteria. Although that report had cautioned that this is only a temporary measure and you should perhaps become get a more scientific way to calculate judges. But uh, for the longest time, it used to be the dominant criteria, of, I mean, at least visible to us, uh, in addition to disposal rates, et cetera, that high courts were using to calculate judge strength of the entire states. Uh, I would like to end with the question of accountability. Uh, and of course, the fact that not only are they resistant to applications under the RTI Act, especially when it concerns dispersal of large funds, it also goes against what the Assembly had thought the, uh, the role that the Supreme Court would be playing, not only in terms of the hierarchy between destabilizing the administrative hierarchy of the courts, where the High Court is the head of the state judiciary, 
Uh, the other way they have done it is through the e-committee of the Supreme Court of India, which is also a central project in, in that it's entirely centrally funded. So there's one way when you judicialize resources through the courtroom. Uh, there's also increments in power of the administrative power of the Supreme Court, where they have e-committee of the Supreme Court of India. They made the first national policy in 2005. Uh, the, you know, the third phase has been approved last year. The Ministry of Finance had said that there is an additional outlay of 7,000 crores for the next five years, where and there was a significant delay in the implementation of the third phase. And this we can surmise from the parliamentary standing committee, which was because the, the fundamental problem with this court being given this administrative power is that it's not really accountable to the budgetary process. When the standing committee is uh, scrutinizing the demand for grants, it's actually the Department of Justice, uh, which is, you know, the Secretary Department of Justice, which is the witness before the committee. Uh, this this question of when whenever the court asks so greater autonomy in dispersal of funds, and this was a question that was considered when the uh, the National Commission of which was reviewing the working of the Constitution was preparing its report, uh, whether the court should in fact be given more financial powers because it comes up in each Chief Justice's conferences. The state governments had retaliated, saying that if they are willing to come before uh, an accounts or an estimates committee of the Assembly, uh, perhaps you should consider giving them more power. But I don't see a scenario where uh, high court judges or Supreme Court judges would willingly subject themselves to any uh, legislature scrutiny. So that's the second problem. When you give, uh, for example, the e-committee's work, uh, a lot of it is, of course, it's done in joint collaboration with the Department of Justice. But it's also really this, uh, I don't think uh, that relationship is one of equals. So I don't think the unless uh, the the court is willing to subject itself to a corresponding level of accountability, I think these are very concerning developments. Okay, I'm on time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sitrakshi. I guess on the appropriately on the last day of the financial year in this conference on courts and constitution, we've had. Finally, some references to the financial issues that dog our courts and to some extent, and thank you for that as well. We've moved the topic of our debate beyond just the Supreme Court. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Rahul uh, will be our last uh, speaker for this session. Yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Raja, for this opportunity. I'm grateful to NALSA, Azim Premji University, and the LOA, LAOT blog um, for the opportunity to be here. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be with all of you. I propose to speak on two issues. Um, uh, one is the accessibility of courts for persons with disabilities, because I think that is also an important part when we take stock of the judiciary in terms of how accessible our courts are to various marginalized groups. And the one that I propose to speak from the vantage point of is persons with disabilities. And the second is uh, the issue of important constitutional and social justice matters not being heard in a time bound manner and, uh, you know, how it ties into the trend of what some scholars have called judicial evasion uh, and, and, you know, some healthy practices that can be adopted in that regard, at least so far as social justice matters are concerned, which is what I have more direct experience with to date. So the first one, uh, you know, I plan to, uh, what I would like to talk about is how accessible our constitutional courts are for persons with disabilities as different stakeholders within the system. So as lawyers, uh, you know, judges, litigants, amongst others. Uh, now on the first part, uh, section 12 of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, which as some of you might know, guarantees the right to access justice to persons with disabilities. Uh, and I'd just like to read out one part of that, which, which says the, the, the subsections 1, uh, 3 and 4, these three I would like to read out. So subsection 1 says the appropriate government shall ensure that persons with disabilities are able to exercise the right to access any court, tribunal, authority, commission, or any other body having judicial or quasi-judicial or investigative powers without discrimination on the basis of disability. So this creates the general right to be able to access any judicial body which inheres in persons with disabilities. Uh, 
the third part which is subsection 3 is on legal aid which i'll come to in a minute but for now i'm just reading out the subsection it says the national legal services authority and the state legal services authorities constituted under the legal services authority act 1987 shall make provisions including reasonable accommodation to ensure that persons with disabilities have access to any scheme program facility or service provided by them equally with others so the point being that you need to provide reasonable accommodation measures to ensure that persons with disabilities that who i will call pwds for short are able to access legal aid uh, without any difficulty and then subsection 4 is important because it sets out the specific measures which are to be taken to facilitate access to justice it says the appropriate government shall take steps to to and then number 1 ensure that all their public documents are in accessible formats that's one part second part is ensure that the filing departments registries or other offices of record are supplied with necessary equipment to enable filing storing and referring to documents and evidence in accessible format so this would basically mean things like having braille printers a scanning machine to be able to scan files to so that people who are visually impaired can access them once they are scanned and ocr you know having appropriate ocr equipment that kind of thing and the third part is make available all necessary facilities and equipment to facilitate recording of testimonies arguments or opinion given by persons with disabilities in their preferred language and means of communication now this would also i would argue include sign language interpretation so um for people who are hearing impaired and wish to participate in a judicial proceeding either wish to or are compelled to it is important to ensure that we make available sign language interpretation and also in other uh you know important matters which 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 constitutional courts here and i'll uh, as i move along talk a little bit about some efforts that that you know i've tried to take in this direction and how successful or unsuccessful those have been uh so this provision this section 12 after its enactment in 2017 it was initially lying dormant for a while and uh, even now much needs to be done to enliven it but some steps which have been taken in that direction uh, are the following so first is this supreme court judgment call all india judges association versus union of india which is of 2nd august 2018 justices uh, chief justice deepak mishra khanvilkar and chandrachud which say, which says and i'm reading out the relevant portion we have to move from disabled uh, uh, disabled friendly buildings to workable and in implementable and so they are basically talking about things which can practically be achieved differently friendly able court infrastructure now i do not i mean i am not a votary of the use of this term differently able but we'll keep this to one side for the moment uh, uh, and it says ramps for such categories of persons must be operable feasible tried and tested such ramps should definitely have steel railings and handles the court infrastructure must also keep in view the accessibility for visually impaired persons and therefore courts must have tactile pavements and signage in braille for the benefit of visually impaired citizens so uh, this is at the level of uh, intent in terms of what the judgment says then uh, some initiatives which the e committee has undertaken uh, because a part a key part of the accessibility like the the barrier to access that persons with disabilities face relates to the digital in interface of our court system which the e committee is responsible for managing uh, so few initiatives which have been taken in that direction is one removal of captchas on court websites either removal or uh, you know addition of audio captchas in addition to uh, inaccessible image based captchas because if 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 you have a web a court website which only has an image based captcha then that is not something which someone who is visually impaired would be able to access uh because their screen reader which is the software that talks to them on the screen won't be able to make out the content of that captcha so one part of it uh has been working with the high courts to ensure that wherever there are court websites that have these inaccessible image based captchas that you have an audio captcha or a text captcha to go with that 
the second part is uh, accessibility of PDFs. So, you know, some guidance has been issued to the high courts by the e committee. What so basically, concretely, what has been done is that there is an SOP on generating accessible code documents, which the e committee has prepared and circulated to the high courts, uh, which contain which contains very specific guidance on what needs to be done to make court filings, uh, judgments, etc., accessible, such as, you know, ensuring that they are properly tagged, they are searchable, um, you know, page pagination is not just by hand, but it is by, uh, uh, but it is in printed form. So the screen reader can track it. These may sound like small things, but actually they place a lawyer with a disability at a competitive disadvantage uh, when you are competing with your able-bodied counterparts and it becomes extremely challenging then to be able to realize your full potential in a profession which is anyway, uh, you know, where no corners are given uh, uh, and, 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 you know, one has to really be able to perform optimally to remain competitive. Uh, the other aspect is with respect to accessibility of cause lists, right? So this is something which, which I've been working on uh, with the Delhi High Court also, and I'll explain in a minute kind of what this specifically is, but that is also something which the E committee has been working on. And also, so when I joined the Chief Justice in 2020 as his law clerk, uh, the current Chief Justice, uh, CJI, the one thing which we, uh, which I reported to him and to the registry was that the court had an inaccessible captcha, like the Supreme Court itself, right? In the sense that it only had an image-based captcha, so there's no way that you could actually go uh, and uh, no way that I could go and obtain court orders on my own. Uh, for example, if I was making a note on a matter on a, on a paper book, I could not track down the orders to date in that matter. And that was promptly addressed and uh, that continues to kind of be accessible to date. So that's one thing which, 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 which is positive. Um, now, you know, I'll come to the work which the Supreme Court Accessibility Committee uh, has done so far, like what it's what the vision was, what the key recommendations are, and kind of where we are going from here. Uh, so I was a part of the subcommittee that was set up for this. The whole committee was set up on 3rd December 2022, uh, you know, on the International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Uh, under Justice Ravindra Bhatt's leadership, uh, the, the, the committee functioned uh, for uh, about uh, eight to 10 months during which period it prepared a very comprehensive report on, you know, what it, what needs to be done to make the Supreme Court accessible, not just to persons with disabilities, but also to pregnant women and senior citizens. Uh, so there were sort of eight main principles, uh, which the report advocated, and I will quickly tell you what those are. So one is evolving commitment to accessibility, right? So this is not something which is set in stone and you just say that, okay, now it has become accessible and everyone can go home, right? It's, 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 it's a continued engagement, which, which you need to uh, keep having so as to ensure that as you launch new technology, new sol solutions, et cetera, you continue to check them for accessibility. The second is twin track approach, right? Which is that even as you strive to make quote unquote, mainstream services accessible, you also need to ensure that you have specialized support for persons with disabilities that goes along with that. So that, for example, while the ideal situation would be where all court documents are designed accessibly for persons with disabilities, that's practically not going to happen anytime soon because it's uh, going to require a lot of changes in the way court documents are typically made. So therefore, the, the the second track as of now would be to at least have a system in place to enable persons with disabilities to access code documents in accessible form, at least in cases that involve them and having a system in place for that. Uh, the third is amplifying voices of persons with disabilities, which is the idea of nothing about us without us, right? You can't make decisions about us without actually involving us in the decision making process. And this is always work in progress. Uh, the fourth part is challenging the status quo, right? So it can't, you can't, and this, this, this argument often gets made about reasonable accommodation that, oh, this is the way we work. Sorry, we, uh, we, we don't know things, um, 
we, we we don't know any different um and you know if we were to try and accommodate someone with a disability it would cause complication these are our rules this is how we operate sorry so the idea when we say challenging the status quo is to say that look you know you have to uh, recognize that the status quo is not designed with the needs of the disabled in mind and you need to go the extra mile if you are to provide them additional support otherwise there's no point in actually uh, having that guarantee at all uh, and the fifth part is proactive design choices and the sixth one is universal design philosophy which go together which is to say that as you like like i've been saying when when you launch something new you have to ensure that it complies with universal design principles and that it is accessible so you know physical infrastructure digital infrastructure all of that needs to be checked for accessibility uh seventh part is continued training and awareness which is uh, self uh, evident what that means and the eighth part is tech integration which is to say that technology has an Im important role to play in bridging the gaps and uh, you know addressing the barriers the disabled otherwise face so ensuring that it's used optimally to actually bridge those gaps to the extent possible but again when technology itself is not designed with the need of the disabled in mind it can in fact reinforce the barriers that they face in the physical world as opposed to breaking them down now what the committee also did in this report was in chapter 4 of the report to divide the recommendations into two parts one is those that are immediate and the second is those which are progressively realizable and it had very concrete timelines for you know what recommendation was to be implemented by when so for instance on the immediate front uh, on physical accessibility it talked about having accessible route maps uh, and braille signages right so you have it in tactile uh, sorry you have it in textual form or in braille form where someone can actually figure out what's the map like what the layout of this court is like having hydraulic lifts right so basically portable ramps for those who cannot access stairs etc where you can't have like for example in the courtrooms you can't have ramps sometimes so therefore they you know, have a portable ramp so that they can be uh, transported on those in a dignified manner right you don't want a situation where you're picking up someone's wheelchair and putting it from point x to point y which is not a dignified way to proceed uh, so this is on the physical front on the functional front sign language interpretation was a suggestion accessible documents right which i have just mentioned uh, having braille printers and things like that and on the progressive realization front the suggestions were things like having an equal opportunity policy so under the rpwd act all establishments have to have an equal opportunity policy this report actually contains a draft equal opportunity policy for the supreme court to adopt uh, and 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 now it, it needs to be enacted actually uh having qr navigation based technology right so you should be able to figure out uh for instance if you are using your phone with the qr code which is placed there that like as to you know on your on your phone it should be able to give you a textual map where you are uh you know details of an accessibility officer that you can contact in case you have additional needs and things like that and also fire safety and evacuation measures how those need to be tailored to meet the needs of persons with disabilities uh and uh, now uh, one thing which uh, which i will come to is when i talk about the way forward is you know where we are in terms of implementing this report and how we proceed with that uh but before i come to that let me talk about the delhi high court accessibility committees work so i am uh, you know a part of that committee uh, it is headed by justice shakdar uh, you know it was formed in august last year uh, i mean we were writing to the high court with multiple multiple issues uh, the biggest one was the issue with accessing cause lists because they were not rendered in an accessible form the issue was really this that in order to access the cause list on the website you had to open a pdf now in the pdf the information of cases listed for a particular day was all listed in, out in a as a big wall of text so as a sighted person you can jump through those entries and figure out 
well this is item 18 it is effective item 30 on uh, in so and so courts uh, in so and so judges court so that then you can you know accordingly plan and uh, guide others who are appearing in the matter but the way the cause lists were laid out was such that uh, you had to access everything to be able to get to that item 18 so you couldn't really skim through the material with your screen reader uh, so we wrote to Justice Shagdar about it and uh, then what, what eventually ended up happening is that, uh, you know, they, they launched an HTML version of the cause list so that now if you go to the Delhi High Court website, you can put in the court name, uh, the date, etc. And it will present the information to you in a tabular accessible form where you can uh, uh, easily make out what the effective item number in your matter is. Again. Uh, you know, it may seem like a small low hanging fruit, but has huge implications for those uh, home it benefits. Uh, uh, Rahul, yes. I'll have to ask you to wrap yes. up in a couple of minutes, please. Yes. Thank All you. right. I will. Uh, you know, and accessibility of documents is is something else that the court uh, again has put out, has put in place the process for, which is to say that. Uh, if I am a lawyer with a disability and if the court filings in a particular matter are not accessible, I can reach out to the e-seva kendra of the court and get them to OCR and bookmark the file and make it accessible. Now, in terms of the way ahead, so two or three quick points I will made in, make in closing. In terms of the Supreme Court's recommendations, while these are there on paper, a lot needs to be done still to practically implement them. One important step which has been taken in this direction recently has been the constitution of an accessibility help desk, which is a single window system for people to get the support they need. But a lot of these recommendations need to be implemented. Sign language interpretation is one which we really tried hard for last year, but it did not happen. And I think this it's important to sort of figure that out and, and resolve that issue. The second part is really prioritization of social justice matters. So in our courts, um, you know, I litigate on behalf of persons with disabilities and others who do important social justice and constitutional matters will also tell you that there needs to be an institutional focus on ensuring that such matters are given the importance which they deserve. And some things like having fixed timings for such hearings to take place, you know, ensuring that even if the court has a heavy board, it is able to take time out for such matters. Uh, and like, for instance, the functioning of a constitution bench on a permanent or on a long term basis in the last 12 to 18 months has been a good step in this direction. Uh, but 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 we really need to make sure that cases of this nature where the temporal element becomes important, where you need to provide justice in a time bound manner that these are, you know, given priority. Now, obviously, to every litigant, his case is the most important. But we need to have, for example, within the roster of courts, a line item on disability rights and social justice cases and a practical mechanism needs to be evolved on an institutional basis to ensure that such cases are prioritized and given the importance that they deserve. So in closing, uh, you know, I just like to say that it's I, I, I think it's extremely important for us to continue working towards making our courts more accessible for persons with disabilities and also ensuring that we in embed institutional healthy institutional practices so that in a proactive and intentional way, we are able to ensure that important constitution and social justice matters are heard in a timely and effective manner. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, thank you so much, Rahul. I think we've had a good session. We've covered issues relating to the master of the roster, lack of transparency. We've looked at constitution benches and reform strategies for the same. We've looked at how administration of justice can be better provisioned for financial aspects in the other parts of the judiciary, you know, the relationship of the Supreme Court and the high courts with the lower judiciary as well. And, and on, on the issues relating to uh, accessibility and uh, uh, the way ahead in terms of reform and continuing, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 to, 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 to prioritize social justice matters. Um, I think we have time for a, maybe five minutes or so of question. <laughs> uh, we'll just take. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes. So I'll like in the other sessions, Point out, we'll probably take about four or five questions. 
Um, before that, I request everybody to please switch off their Wi-Fi. The video is buffering. All right, we have uh, a question over here. Yes, please. Uh, good morning. I'm Santil Jarabin from Bangalore, and I'm doing my PG in Human Rights Law in NLS. My question is, uh, you know, taking stock of judiciary, but have you considered these aspects? And uh, predominantly to Ms. Chitrakshi and Mr. Nicholas, has the judiciary upgraded itself to today's needs of the population? And how can citizens get better justice or faster justice in India? I'm going to give some stats today. You know, uh, in 1940, we had the literacy rate of around 12 to 14 percent, and which means to say 5.4 crore people were educated. And in 2023, we have 146 crore people, and we have 113 crore people who are literate. There are 25 lakh practicing lawyers today, and in uh, then they were much lower. And if you take Karnataka, for instance, there are one lakh practicing lawyers today, and in 1947, there are 32. So how do we add the math to you know get faster justice? Have the numbers been correlated and connected so that we can set up a system or look at the judiciary in a way where you know justice can be given faster? You need more judges. You need more courts. How are we going to do that? Has it been considered? Is my Great. question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, should I continue? Should I ask? Or, yeah. Sorry, I can't try. All right. So uh, my question is to Nick and Saurav. Uh, as this connects both to the bench allocation uh, element and the constitutional bench element. So if uh, one sees in the history of the Indian Republic uh, and observes all the constitution benches, there is a disproportionate number of them with the chief justice in them. Uh, even in the case of Dr. Chandrachud, as far as I remember, he has constituted 11 constitutional benches as of January 2024, and he is part of every single one of them. Now, considering that in the entire history of all constitutional benches, the CGI is in the minority in constitutional bench judgments only 13 times, the latest being Supreme Court Union of India, the marriage equality case. So, uh, two question to Saurav is that any comments as to how such a practice gives CGI a lot of influence over quote unquote matters of seminal importance? And to Nick, uh, is this not a counter to the argument of having more constitutional benches? So, yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Rujal. Uh, my question is for Saurav, sir. So, Saurav, sir, uh, in all of your reporting, sir, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. So, Saurav, sir, in all of your reportings, what has, in taking stock of the judiciary, what has been your personal experience with the Contempt of Courts Act? In that uh, we have seen recently that a lot of journalists have been called to the courts for their reportings on the judges. So what has been your personal experience with the contempt of courts? Has it been a hindrance? And what changes would you recommend to the current court contempt of courts regime? Because of course, the judiciary, of course, would probably not bring about any changes itself. And of course, any changes to the law brought by the legislature would, pro would be eventually be reviewed by the judiciary itself. So how would, the changes would you recommend to this regime? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And Okay, so there's no more. No, there is. Oh. I have a question here, this side. Uh, so my question is to all the panelists, whoever would like to answer, and which is that, you know, we often speak about a time in the past when the ju judiciary was undergoing um, credibility crisis. We usually refer to the time of the emergency. Uh, but a lot of people have started speaking about a similar phenomenon being observed now, so much so that when the electoral bonds judgment came out, there was a general sense of surprise, if not shock, that the judiciary finally stood up to, to, to the executive and struck down the scheme. Uh, so could that, and as uh, Saurav also spoke about uh, petitioners withdrawing their cases from the Supreme Court as a vote of no confidence, Rahul also spoke about not spending enough time on social justice issues. Uh, so could that also be, are we seeing a general sense of hesitation um, and, uh, you know, like a, something similar to a chilling effect, which is preventing people from approaching the court? Uh, especially on seminal questions involving the interpretation of the Constitution, if the trust in the judiciary to resolve these questions in uh, favor of the people and against the state is low, is that preventing people from approaching the courts? Great, thank you. Hi. So, uh, I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Nick, and uh, in particular uh, to the point you raised about uh, the Constitution bench, 
um, I mean, despite sitting for 16 months, hearing only 19 cases. Um, and, uh, and one of the, uh, in response to that, one of the suggestions that has been routinely made uh, is to limit the time uh, that is allocated for oral hearings. Uh, I mean, in constitutional cases, but um, eliminating it for certain category of cases. And I know you've done some work in past comparing India and America on that. Uh, so if you could just shed some light on that. Great. Thank you. Um, what I'll do is, uh, may I ask that these these questions go, we follow the order in which uh, uh, this people, you know you folks spoke. So first, uh, sort of, I think you had a uh, couple of questions or points directed to you. Yeah, so, yeah. So I've made note of that. I'll take the second and third question because they were directed at me. Uh, so the Constitution Bench, uh, you asked about how the master of the roster is in a majority of these constitution benches and very few times he is in the minority, right? So I think over time when uh, the chief justice works with his fellow judges, he understands the psyche of the judge and what kind of leaning the judge has. We cannot be under the impression that uh, judges do not have their bias, they do not have their leanings. Every judge does and every person does for that matter how uh, independent the judge can be of his biases and uh, you know uh, his biases and views uh, when judging a case that is what defines a good judge and a bad judge so i think because the chief justice already is uh, you know aware of how the judge is uh, working uh, along with all the uh, roster that he assigns all, all the cases that he assigns to the judges it's fairly easy for the Chief Justice to understand and, you know, constitute a bench of such nature where uh, the decisions could be uh, decided before, you know, beforehand. So I think that is how the system is really working. And I think the point is to address the master of the roster system here. Many people advocate for, you know, the th three senior most judges to decide the roster. Um, to eliminate a uh, level of arbitrariness. And I think we need to find such mechanisms to really cut down uh, this problem. The second question was on contempt of court and my experience with it. Uh, I have personally so far uh, not faced any such problem, touch wood, and I hope not. Um, what I have over the time uh, faced is a legal notice sent by a sitting judge of the Supreme Court to me. Uh, because, you know, as a journalist, you are supposed to, uh, you know, allow them the right to reply to your questions or to whatever you are reporting. So when I did send a, a few questions about a critical, a critical reportage I was about to write, the judge was not very happy and sent me a legal notice. But that is, I think, uh, the only hurdle that I've faced so far in my reporting. And uh, what needs to change, I think, uh, the court do need the powers of contempt because uh, you know respect has to be commanded as well not only earned but also sometimes you need to make sure that uh, people follow what you say but it really is dependent on the judge to you know have shoulders broad enough to take in fair criticism not personal attacks of course but fair criticism and to also ignore a lot of things that are being said on social media by uh, which are not very fair. So it really depends on the judge. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Arup. Uh, Nick, can you hear us? Those two questions, I think, directed yeah. to you, which was on the on the counter to more benches, given the disproportionate involvement of the CJI. And the last question on this limited a limitation on the number of oral hearings, perhaps even getting rid of them in some matters. I think those are the two that I got. If you have something else to add, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, the um, point taken, right, on, and I've worked on this and others have worked on this about the Chief Justice um, being less likely to be in dissent on Constitution benches. But I think, you know, it does point to this broader kind of problem around the master of the roster in that you can set up Constitution benches, but Chief Justices can also push cases off um, to two judge benches or take the case to their own bench where they're sitting as as the, the senior most uh, judge on either two or three judge uh, bench and then be able to decide that 
in a way similarly, but perhaps less apparently or, or, or less um, less apparent to the public um, in a way that uh, would favor the way that they want the case to come out. Um, and I do think it goes again to this broader question of, do you have like the three most senior judges involved in this allocation? Do you have it um, through random selection? And I think there's a question about how much um, you want. So when some chief justices come in, as you know, some people are excited because they think many of the judges aren't deciding in the way they would like, but the chief justice will push these cases in a way that they would. And there's kind of a leadership element to the court. Um, but um, obviously, this so there's merits and there's dismerits to that system. Um, versus others. Um, and then the second on this limiting time for oral hearings, I have looked at this some, I know others have looked at, at this as well. And the hearings just go on from an outside perspective, they go on and on and on. <laughs> and um, having been a, a clerk and hearing some of these hearings, it always just surprised me of like, oh, the argument's been made. Oh, and the argument's being made again. And the argument's being made again um, before some of these constitution benches. I think was looking at something recently and one case went on for like 40 days um, in constitu uh, before a constitution bench. And clearly you're not gonna get through too many cases when oral arguments um, are that long. And so I do think there needs to be ways of limiting that both for uh, constitution benches, but just for oral arguments for admission hearings um, in other contexts as well, of just like the court needs to be able to value its time and be what's the most useful way that I can use the most scarce resource that the court has, which is its time. Um, and as as I've written with like Mark Galanter and others, I think a lot of this does come out of the bar um, and uh, the way that the bar is compensated by their clients, which is by, by the hearing and, and it creates these kind of perverse in incentives. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Chitrakshi. You can take any of the questions. I mean, there was a question on the, the chilling effect. If you've got to put it on. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. So the first question was about whether the judiciary has been upgraded and, you know, response to the corresponding increase in literacy rate and whether there should be more judges, more courtrooms. That's how I read it. Uh, so there is empirical evidence supporting the fact that states which are more prosperous uh, uh, automatically have more litigation rates. So states, for example, Punjab and Haryana will be more litigious than Bihar, although the population might be, you know, differently variable. So I think automatically the litigiousness would respond to that. Uh, litigation is sort of like, you know, is also responding to your socioeconomic capacity to litigate. Uh, Secondly, whether there should be more judges and more courtrooms, I don't think it's just a resource constraint, as I mentioned. Uh, the new formula that has, in fact, been endorsed by the National Court Management Systems Committee, I think, takes into account time. So they have uh, re referred to a formula called the timely weighted disposal method to calculate the judge strength, which should, in fact, factor in the productivity of judges while calculating judge strength. Because if you are just blindly increasing judge strength, what happens is that uh, you and not accounting for productivity, you are sort of making sure that they all function at a level which is not really, you know, if there's no benchmark, then you're just increasing more inefficient judges. You know, so I don't think it's just a matter of more courtrooms, more judges. You have to have a, a rationale for increasing judges, and that should be based on uh, various factors. Uh, to Mansi's question, whether there is a crisis of legitimacy, I think, of course, the chilling effect, etc. aside, uh, the greater crisis is obviously the outcome uncertainty because of the backlog and the delay. And what might be happening, which is perhaps more sinister, is that the aims of litigation are subverted in this sense, because when you don't know when your case is finally being decided, uh, people will use the deficiencies of the system, uh, will use the deficiencies of the system to subvert the aims of litigation, uh, which is, I think, perhaps the more uh, concerning development of something like this. Because they will use the forum to use the delay and subvert interests of litigants. That's you know, what I wanted Thanks. to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I? Rahul, yes, yes. please. Uh, just one minute, I'll take three, sure, quick, please. three quick points I wanted to make. One on the question on citizen-centric justice. So I come at these issues more from a practitioner's perspective. So one thing I can say, 
is i think it's also important for us to ensure that um, you know as litigants for instance that we hold lawyers to account a lot of lawyers prioritize the commercial work they do at the cost of citizen centric work so it's necessary for citizens who have cases going on with them uh, with these lawyers to also ensure that these are taken to their logical conclusion a lot of lawyers may do pro bono matters just because they need to tick that box so that uh, needs to be checked and sort of held to again to be held to account number two on uh, this issue of the cji often being in the majority in constitution benches so one other explanation for it which at least i have observed in my limited practical experiences sometimes a lot of judges are persuadable also in the sense that you know i i won't name one particular senior judge of the supreme court who was when there was a different chief justice that same judge was being criticized for taking a very conservative stance and just recently i heard that judge being uh, you know hailed as a liberal hero in terms of making very positive observations in constitution bench matters so very often a lot of judges also modulate their approach to a case based on way, the which way the wind is blowing so to that ex extent also we shouldn't undermine any chief justice's persuasive power to bring uh, other judges to uh, uh, to their perspective and third on hesitation and chilling effect undoubtedly uh, people have that and i have clients who come to me and say that you know if, if it's going to take so many years uh, like what's the point but but we need to continue to fight that because i think there are enough judges in the system who want to do the right thing and despite the backlog want to be able to provide justice but we have to continue to be persistent and and sort of utilize the existing levers that we have to the best of our ability thank you rahul on that positive note may i ask that we give a round of applause to this panel thank you oh uh, can i please request uh, mr siddharth raja to uh, hand over a small token of appreciation to our panelists uh, mr chitrakshi jain Mr. Saurav Das, and Mr. Rahul Bajaj. Thank you. No, no, it's just okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. From Mr. Nicholas Robinson, will be sending it over. Uh, everyone, uh, the next session will begin at twelve fifteen. Uh, please Yours be back on time. Nick. Thank you. Uh, please be back on time. And tea is served near uh, thinking man. Yeah, thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sixth panel of the Courts and Constitution 2023 in review on the developments in equality jurisprudence. I will, I'm Srijan Sandeep Mandal. I teach history here and I'll be moderating this panel. It's my privilege to do so. I'm rather looking forward to it. Um, as the concept note of this panel written by Abni Vijay from Law and Other Things states, the objective of this panel is to critically analyze the evolution of equality jurisprudence in the private sphere by examining the stance of the Supreme Court of India on the issues of gender, sexuality, and religion. The panel will embark on this analysis by examining the jurisprudence of discrimination itself as developed in Nepal. It will then come to the Indian experience of discrimination in the institution of marriage, which led to a momentous, if problematic judgment before ending with the legislative use of the rhetoric of discrimination to introduce a uniform civil code in the state of Uttarakhand. Our inaugural speaker in the panel is the Honorable Justice Sapna Prasad Pradhan Malla, who is a judge of the Supreme Court of Nepal. Before her elevation to the bench, she was a public interest lawyer, renowned for her involvement in the leading cases concerning gender discrimination in Nepal. These cases dealt with pressing issues such as the right to inheritance for women, the right to reproductive health, and the criminalization of marital rape, among others. Beyond her work as an advocate and judge, she has contributed to the drafting of laws in Nepal and the constitution of Nepal itself as a member of the country's constituent assembly. Among the multiple laws she has helped draft are the Gender-Based Violence Amendment Act of 2015, the Untouchability Prohibition Act of 2011, and the Domestic Violence Act of 2008. Her advocacy for the equality of women and other excluded groups is not limited to Nepal alone. She has worked towards amending discriminatory laws around the world through global organizations like the Center for Reproductive Rights, Equality Now, International Women's Rights Action Watch Asia Pacific, and the United Nations. It is therefore our particular privilege to have the Honorable Justice Malla speak at this conference and especially on this panel. So without further ado, I invite Justice Malla to deliver her remarks. Panelists, uh, professors, students, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to focus my remarks mostly on what discrimination is? Why do we need to have a conceptual understanding of discrimination? And why prohibition of discrimination is critical for gender equality? To start, I want to go back to uh, one of the decisions of Supreme Court of Nepal in 2002, where a law that said, if you rape uh, that time, the word used, prostitute woman, the punishment is up to 500 rupees or three months imprisonment, the R. And that incident took place, and a man was acquitted with 500 rupees fine. So immediately that time, I was the lawyer. We challenged that law. The Supreme Court of Nepal, the special bench said, state made law itself is encouraging to rape certain category of women and getting impunity from punishment. And the, the court also said that you cannot discriminate based on whether prostitute, sex work, or other women. So you cannot have a categorization. And they says the effect is resulting in impunity and therefore this law should be declared unconstitutional that law was declared unconstitutional on the same day the other case went the other case was the marital rape very popular marital rape case in that case uh, the the law was, the law said rape means raping other than your wife so the court says when you you marry in case of marriage, uh, your, your uh, free consent is important uh, for, for marriage. Similarly, if you want to have a 
any is relation. Sorry, I, I was out of my glasses. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, the court said that when you solemn, sol, solemn, solemnized marriage, uh, consent is critical. So sexual relationship, even after solemnization, marriage cannot be established in the absence of consent. And the court, the, in this case, the court says, uh, rape is rape. Rape is a severe form of violence against women. No matter who is rapist, they cannot get exempted from the punishment. And the court issued uh, a directive to enact the law. So as a result, law was amended. But we were quite excited, in fact, with that case because it was a huge success because of recognition. And, um, and and declaration that even in marriage for um, uh, for uh, sexual relation you need consent uh, accountability of respect was created and uh, in looking into both case even a client or husband was not getting uh, you know not getting exempted from the punishment so law came in place it's the law said uh, three um, the law came and the law made it up to three years imprisonment and it was available so immediately after that, the two cases uh, was registered on uh, on marital rape, and and the the they were the husbands were released on bail, and immediately those two women went to the court. And in this case, the following case, the court says, um, the court says that it is not appropriate to minimize punishment based on a marital relationship. So now we have a law uh, which provides. Um, protection order under the domestic violence law, as well as women also has a choice for divorce. So what I would like to say here is that, uh, um, um, and, and also I want to add two more cases uh, following this, uh, which uh, is very important case in fact in Nepal in rape, because a rape uh, um, incident took place and in this case, it was a gang rape and um, and and gang rape and the um, um, rape was established, but she was not able to give a consistent statement. As a result, the the, the accused was acquitted from both district court and high court. And when it came to the Supreme Court, we found the woman right after the girl right after the rape she was admitted in the mental hospital for three months and only after that she was able to give the statement and and, and in both the case the reason of acquittal was she was not able to give consistent statement and in this case um, it was in my bench and I, we said and that um, um, there, there is a rape trauma syndrome which we have to keep into consideration. And secondly, we said, why you are looking into the location and why you are confused with the location? Because in case of rape, woman's body is a location of crime. And in this case also we said that uh, it's not only, because generally we say it's an it's a offense against woman's bodily integrity, but in this case we also said it's also against her personhood. Because after gang rape, what she went through, the mental trauma and treatment, she was not able to study because she, she was, um, uh, the, her education was delayed. Her, there was adverse effect on her career. And then we said, we need to provide um, compensation. And even in case of compensation, we changed the dynamics from reasonable compensation to adequate compensation. Uh, I, I'm just sharing all these uh, cases, but also want to connect with then what uh, what um, uh, free consent. Uh, so there was a case where um, 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 a woman who was a sweeper in an army and an officer, there was a relation and the man said it was a consensual relation, but but we have, what we said is because when there is an unbalanced power relation, the, the, the woman cannot give free uh, consent and free consent is uh, critical in this kind of power hierarchy where um, um, the other party is saying it was a consensual relationship. Um, I was just sharing these two cases in relation to rape, uh, but then uh, again connecting with uh, the discrimination because I said the, the, the court prohibited discrimination one on the basis of 
different status, but secondly, on the basis of marital status and consent was criti critical uh, of women. And then third, uh, we again went, uh, I also want to share on discrimination because uh, property right case was an important case in Nepal. And in, in the beginning, when the case went to the court, the court uh, said property right is a conditional provision. It's not a discrimination. Uh, but now, after many, many cases, because one message what I want to give here to uh, student as well as to the PIL lawyer that once you file the case and you may, maybe you not, do not, will not get the verdict what you expect, you cannot stop. You have to continuously engage in the process. And secondly, what helped during that time was a mapping of law and uh, impact analysis of those law because we were able to show that time the effect of the law, um, law whether it is excluding women or whether it is uh, treating her differently or some restrictions are created. And then what we did is we did not only look into the uh, directly discriminating law, but we also looked at indirect discrimination or, or, or where there's a gaps. Or even we looked into the special measure because the ultimately how you determine what discrimination is, is the effect, the result, and whether the result is treating her equally or differently, the result is exclusion or restrictions. So based on that, we were doing all those research and those research with victims' voices helped us that time to do the advocacy. Uh, and still, I feel like that, that can be instrumental in your court advocacy or outside advocacy. So two, two things, what I said, continuous engagement is critical and evidence-based research is also important in this process. And then when, when it came to the property right case, finally the court says you cannot discriminate on, um, um, on the basis of marital status. And even um, after marriage, marriage is only your social change of your social status, but not legal status. Because previously when the law um, the, the previous judgment says that there is no discrimination because woman has a right either as a daughter, as a divorcee, as a widow, or married woman. So there is no discrimination. So rights were created on the basis of marital status, and that is where we challenged. Uh, so after this, what I also want to connect with uh, some of ongoing cases on uh, sexual minorities issues, because Nepal was one of the country where we also um, um, many cases related to sexual uh, minorities' rights came, and first case of Sunil Babu Pant, where uh, the existence of um, uh, sexual minority uh, was recognized, and their identity were protected, and after the court verdict, now everyone has an ID card, um, 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 their nationality card, their passport, with the, their identity, and, uh, and then in second case, uh, second case, um, uh, where uh, the, we have legitimized marriage, uh, legitimization has been made to those marriages who that was taken place outside the uh, country, but when they entered, they were denied visa. So the couple were able to get visa uh, through in those two cases. So I, I will say um, legitimization. But in third case, although it was related to um, uh, visa legitimization process, but it, in this case, two things came out. One is you have to use dignified word uh, for, um, uh, for these uh, groups, like then they suggested that we should use either gender minority or sexual minority. And then the third, they also said that uh, our constitution recognizes um, 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 right to, uh, right to um, um, family, right to marriage, uh, because it says you cannot discriminate and even um, uh, discriminate on, on, on any ground, because that is 18.3, uh, which can include all the minority group. And, th and the proviso says that uh, the, the proviso says uh, that the state can make special uh, laws for the protection and advancement of uh, different, it includes different groups, but also includes sexual minorities. And in the fourth case, which is a Pokhrel's case, in that case, the court has issued acts, the, um, issued um, uh, a directive to enact the law uh, for, for, um, uh, for, for marriage. And fourth um, um, incident I would also like to mention in brief, because now recently there is another case 
for marriage registration, uh, the interim order is there, and that is seen as uh, Nepal has, um, um, you know, has a law legalized, uh, but it has uh, asked uh, as an interim period to register the marriage, uh, marriage, and the full uh, final hearing is under the consideration, and I will not go into uh, the detail. Uh, but looking into all these cases um, and and how how the um, the jurisprudence of uh, non discrimination is um, uh, building uh, building uh, I, I would like to say that um, yes uh, it is very much uh, important uh, for equality that we identify what discrimination is. We also need to identify where discrimination lies, the location of discrimination. We, it is also equally important that, um, that we create accountability in prohibiting discrimination, uh, but identifying why that discrimination is prevalent, uh, where discrimination is, what discrimination is, and then develop our own strategy uh, to deal with that. And therefore, like uh, again, um, having uh, getting opportunity in the constitution drafting process, we we are able to, to a specific uh, clause on non discrimination, which not only uh, includes like sex, caste, creed, but new uh, constitution also includes non discrimination based on physical status, um, health status. Um, um, marital status, because you know, rights creating on the basis of uh, different marital status was an issue in our country. Discrimination based on pregnancy. So we have been able to bring Article One of the CEDA. I don't know how many of you have gone through the CEDA, because CEDA is a basic a bill of right for women, and all the South Asian countries have ratified CEDA, and in, it is also referred in Bishaka case. So I think it's very important for us to use that framework and then um, um, translate, uh, we have been able to translate that as a constitutional framework along with the equality clause. Um, and, and, and now the understanding of equality is substantive equality and not only opportunity um, excess, but in result. So that framework has been, been brought and not only in the constitution, but we have also been able to um, bring that uh, conceptual understanding of um, uh, prohibition of discrimination within the uh, um, criminal code, and now it is also an offense. It is an, also an offense. Uh, therefore, um, uh, I, 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 I would uh, like to say, uh, conclude uh, because of the time, um, I would like to conclude by saying uh, that, um, yes, uh, um, identification of uh, discrimination is important, but when we try to identify the discrimination, uh, whether it's an impairment or, or a newlifying uh, situation, uh, we also need to look into the intersectionality. Sometimes we also need to look into compound uh, forms of discrimination because in many cases at the moment, uh, Nepali court has been able to bring those conceptual um, aspects in its judgment because of the time limitation. I will not go into detail, but when you work for change, it's when you work for change, and I was um, hearing uh, Supriyo um, judgment because everyone is like maybe frustrated, tired, uh, but what I, message I would like to give is it's, it's a process. And uh, when you challenge the law, you are not only challenging the law, you are challenging the state, you are challenging the culture, you are challenging the religion, you are challenging the custom. You are challenging the patriarchy. It's not easy. Everyone stands against you. But you have to keep fighting, use the tool, what you have, the PIL, and with conceptual understanding, challenge with the, with the conceptual framework. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Malla, for that insightful and inspiring overview of how discrimination has been dealt with in the Nepali courts. And from the Nepali experience of discrimination, we now come back to India and the experience of discrimination here. And our second set of speakers 
to address that issue are Mr. Supriyo Chakraborty and Mr. Abhay Dang, who are the lead petitioners in the case Supriyo versus Union of India, in which they sought legal recognition for same-sex marriage in our country. They did so by challenging the constitutionality of Section 4C of the Special Marriage Act of 1954, which restricts marriage to heterosexual couples, thereby discriminating against same-sex couples. They came to file this momentous petition in 2022 because their wedding a year earlier, in 2021, before their families, friends, and well-wishers had given them neither recognition as a married couple nor rights of a married couple. In other words, they were married in the eyes of everyone that mattered except the law, which is the wrong they sought to right with the petition. Beyond their role as petitioners in this consequential case, Mr. Chakraborty is an entrepreneur and an advocate for inclusion, equity, and diversity. And Mr. Dang is a senior manager at a multinational corporation here in the city. Mr. Chakraborty holds a bachelor's degree in hospitality management from Edinburgh Napier University, while Mr. Dang holds a dual degree in computer science and engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Roorkee. We are truly honored, truly honored that Mr. Chakraborty and Mr. Dang have agreed to speak about their quest for marriage and equality at this conference, and especially on this panel. So I now invite Mr. Chakraborty and Mr. Dang to deliver their remarks. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for uh, Justice uh, uh, Pradhan for setting the stage and talking about discrimination. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Before we talk about uh, the case, I think we all should know who we are behind the case. My name is Shupriyo. Um, born and brought up in a place called Ashoknagar, which is around 50 kilometers away from Calcutta. Um, as a queer kid, growing up, studying in a government school, where my first exposure to internet when I stepped into my college. Um, and then um, from here, I did my hospitality degree and moved to Hyderabad. And uh, we met in 2012 through a dating site. And uh, here we are. It's been 12 years. We, um, so when we met, uh, Abhay was open to his family. I wasn't uh, from a very uh, middle class family. It was difficult. But I got the, we got the courage. I told my parents. We met each other's parents and happily ever after. It sounds like a Bollywood, but yes, we had our shares of um, fights, misunderstanding, agreement to each other's disagreements. Um, we literally grew together. We are living together. We are sailed through the judgment, the 2013 judgment, Kaushal judgment. We sailed through definitely our 18 Johar judgment and definitely 23 Supriyo judgment. Um, why, why marriage, right? Because marriage indeed holds a significant place in the story of Indian civilization. Today, if somebody asked, are you settled? People understand, are you married? For me, marriage is for companionship, dignity, and security. When I say dignity, so, uh, so we were in a vacation last week. He came last night, and um, we met. We had to answer more than 10 odd people that who, who we are, our relationship. Most of the cases, people ask, are you brothers? Because we are traveling, me, Abhay, and my parents. And um, we are kind of used to do it because it's thousand times most probably we dealt with it because people always think we are brothers. Um, but you know, shamelessly, we need to say, hey, we are friends uh, because we are in a relationship. It has no name. It's not just for me. You know, when all my friends, my families, all our families accepted us, but still they don't know how to answer this question. 
because I don't like when my mother says that he is my son's friend. We are the most important person for each other's life, but in the eyes of law, we are strangers. I think I will ask Abhay to join me here to continue. Thank you, Supriyo. Am I audible? Yeah. Thank you, Supriyo, for talking about our background, how we've grown together, why marriage is important to us um, as a social unit. I'll focus on why marriage is important to us from a practical standpoint as well. So uh, I work at a major MNC, and I have a health insurance policy from my uh, employer. Thankfully, that policy covers Supriyo, so it covers uh, same-sex spouse. Um, however, that policy will lapse once, let's say, I move on to a different company. So we decided to get a separate health insurance policy as well. And uh, we had to go for two separate policies. Why? Because nobody recognizes us as a queer couple. So we had to go for two different insurance policies. We are paying more. But it's not just about paying more. Uh, the nominee in my health insurance policy is my dad who is 1,500 kilometers from here. He lives in Delhi. And the nominee for Supriyo's policy is uh, his mom, who lives 1,500 kilometers from here in Kolkata, which means if, God forbid, something were to happen and uh, you know we're incapacitated, we can't sign on each other's behalf right, to approve of the medical procedure. Um, life insurance. Uh, there is no recognition, again, to a same-sex spouse. So if any one of us were to pass away, uh, those benefits won't accrue. Inheritance, um, of course, uh, if we die in the state, we don't have the uh, you know, right to inherit each other's property, which means uh, we are, again, like nobodies. So we had to go for our own wills. Just for this reason, something that heterosexuals would not have to think about. Uh, even something as basic as getting an address proof for Supriyo was challenging. Um, so the house that I have is, is in my name. Um, so uh, both of us live together. And because he's not legally considered my spouse, and he's not my tenant as well, so what do we show? Uh, what evidence do we show for him uh, to get an address proof? So it was very, very challenging. Even something as basic as getting an address proof was not so basic for us. So, so we decided that enough is enough, and uh, you know we need to change the status quo. Um, this is a cause that directly impacts us because we are a queer couple. Um, we are relatively privileged in the sense that our families accept us. We are out and open at our workplaces, so which means that we can go ahead and fight for our rights. Not everybody has those uh, privileges available to them. Um, we, during the COVID period, we realized that life is very fragile. Uh, you know, anything can happen to anybody on any day. Uh, and then, uh, so therefore getting married and asking for legal equality became even more important for us. And there's another thing, you know, I always say to uh, my friends and colleagues that, you know, when I'm very old and I'm reflecting back on my life, I'm not gonna think about, hey, how much I earned or, what all complex technical problems we solved, I'm going to reflect back on whether I was able to make any social or legal change. So this is the reason uh, we both decided that it's important for us to join this legal battle and we filed the case. Uh, 25th November 2022 was the date when uh, the, the, the uh, matter came up for admission hearing and we were very, very anxious because uh, um, there were multiple cases that had been filed before various high courts. There, was a, there were multiple cases in Delhi High Court. There was a case in Kerala High Court. So we were worried that the judges may say that, hey, let those cases happen. Um, or uh, they may say that, hey, it's too soon. Why are you coming to us right away? In hindsight, that would have been better <laughs> if that had happened. But the court decided to admit the matter for hearing. And... Um, Later on, they invoked their powers under Article 145 to refer this to a five-judge bench. We attended all the hearings. We attended 
uh, the admission hearing in person. Uh, we attended uh, most of the interim hearings uh, virtually, and then again when the Constitution bench began hearing the matter, I was there in person for one week and Supri was there in person for two weeks, and the rest of the hearings we heard uh, virtually. So we were very, very passionately connected with the case. We had to go through lots of challenges even just to get into the court because, you know, you're there, to get into the court, you have to kind of get a pass, and getting that pass is not easy. You have to stand in the queue, and it's very, it's very congested. So it's, it becomes really challenging. So we, uh, we did all that. Um, obviously, when the hearings were going on, we were kind of getting some positive vibes, positive signals that, hey, the judges definitely seem empathetic to the cause. So, um, you know, um, I, uh, I and Sophie were, because we were based in Hyderabad, right, and we wanted to attend uh, uh, the judgment day as well. And, you know, every evening around six o'clock, we would check the Supreme Court website to see hey, what are the judgments that are due next day, to see if there is a possibility of our judgment being delivered the next day. So we were like very, very anxious. We were very excited. We were thinking that something tangible was going to happen basis the, uh, the hearings themselves. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Um, you know, we, we got nothing. There was no tangible outcome. Uh, there was sympathy, but nothing more than that. Um, so it was a very disheartening uh, judgment for us. Uh, Professor Narayan will give a detailed critique of the judgment, but what I would say is that you know, one of the things we kept hearing during the judgment day, there is no fundamental right to marriage in our constitution. My response to that would be, there isn't, fine, but there is at least a fundamental right to equality. So if there is a statutory right to marriage, how can you say that that statutory right will exist only for one class of people and not for the others? Where What happened to right to equality in that case? I, I think the court had a duty to uh, remedy the wrongs, and that didn't happen. So we lost the court battle, uh, but I think uh, we, um, we opened up multiple conversations. Uh, there were many, many dinner table conversations that happened. There were many um, media conversations that happened. And uh, I think there was a Pew Research finding that indicated that uh, more than 50% of Indian population now supports the right for same-sex couples to be able to get married. And I would hope that part of that change is also due to us as well, because we went out in, in public domain. Hopefully that has also had some impact. So it's not all lost. Um, there has been the social battle that you know, we, we seem to be uh, going in the right direction of. And yes, we have lost this battle in the court, but eventually we will win the war. Uh, we will have marriage equality one day in this country. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chakravarti and Mr. Dang for, in some ways, adding a human face and the real life high stakes that are involved in petitions like this, which sometimes are reduced to simple doctrine that are taught in classrooms. So there are actual individuals behind it. And thank you for being change makers to inaugurate this possibility of change in the country. So from the lived experience of discrimination, now we move on to the critique of the judgment that perpetuates discrimination with Professor Arvind Narayan, who's our third speaker, and who's on the visiting faculty of both the National School of India University and the School of Policy and Governance at the Azim Premji University in Bengaluru. Beyond teaching, he's involved in research, writing, and practice related to law and social concerns as evident from his prolific output. As a leading scholar, he has authored India's Undeclared Emergency, Constitutionalism, and the Politics of Resistance, and Queer, Despise Sexualities, Law, and Social Change, as well as co-authored of Life and Law Con Conversations with Upendra Bakshi, which he will discuss with one of his co-authors, Professor Sitaram Kakarala, here today, and Breathing Life into the Constitution, Human Rights Lawyering in India. And as a leading lawyer, he co-founded the Alternative Law Forum in Bengaluru, and with a team of lawyers, challenged the constitutionality of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code from the Delhi High Court in 2009 to the Supreme Court in 2018. He's currently finishing his doctoral thesis on mapping the elements of an Ambedkarite jurisprudence at NLSIU, from where he also holds a bachelor's degree in law. 
He holds a master's degree in law as well from the University of Warwick, where he had gone on achieving scholarship. We are genuinely grateful for his unstinting support of this conference since its inception and happy to welcome him back here as a speaker on this panel. So I invite now Professor Narayan to deliver his remarks. Thanks, uh, thanks Rijan for that really generous and warm introduction. It's really a privilege to be on this panel for two very important reasons. One is I'm following Justice, Justice uh, Sapna Pradhan Malla, and Nepal is really a forerunner on the LGBTQ rights question in the South Asian region. Justice Muller uh, ju referred to the fact that in 2007, Sunil Baba Pant case that recognized the rights of persons in terms of the identities they choose to live in, they recognize the right to marriage. And in fact, in the marriage hearings, uh, the, the case of Adep Pokhral was cited before the bench, saying that the South, another South Asian country has taken the lead. India should follow this other South Asian country. Nepal has been the leader on this particular issue. And so it's really a privilege to follow you on this particular question. The other great privilege I've had is to follow uh, both Supriyo and, and, and Abe as petitioners in this case. You heard a really passionate account, and I think really moving account of why they chose to file this case. And I was uh, sharing with Sridharan, even from the academic point of view, there's a lot out there. What in effect you have is you can tell a people's history of the Indian Supreme Court through stories such as Supriyo's and Abe's. And the stories out there, if you go back to, again, the, the US context, there's a marvelous book by Dale Carpenter called Flagrant Misconduct on the case Lawrence versus Texas. And who's the petitioner? John Lawrence. Similarly, there's another wonderful case on the Loving versus Virginia, which is the case on, decrim on, de on decriminalization of the miscegenation laws in the US about Called, tell the court, I love my wife. Again, you get the strong emotion involved in these books. And so I think there's a really marvelous book, of course, in a, in a slightly different sense, because we're not talking about the end point of the process. We're talking about a, a book which will hopefully generate more of the public opinion and passion and emotion. We need to bring about that kind of change. And the other point, I think, to note is Supriyo and Abe are petitioners. The 19 other petitioners with them. And what is so moving to me is the petitioners come across the length and breadth of the country and across the diversity of the, of the sexuality identities we have. The gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender uh, people are all petitioners before the court. And I think to me, at the most mo perhaps the only the most successful point of the petition is really the, the debunking of the idea which the, the government put forward in the beginning that this is an elite problem is there may be a middle class problem. Large majority of people are not concerned. Who debunked that, I think, very beautifully and very powerfully was Mr. Raju Ramchandran, who began his, uh, his presentation by invoking Justice Vivian Bose, saying that the Constitution of India is meant not only for the rich and the privileged, but meant for the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And then he invoked his two clients. He said, one of my clients is a young woman who's a lesbian baker from Uttar Pradesh. The other woman who, who's in a relationship with my, with my client is, uh, is a chartered account, is an is a accountant, again, from Haryana. And these are the butchers and the bakers who are really before this court. And after the court recognized the fact, this is not an elite issue. It's an issue that affects the vast majority of people. And I think that, if you had one point about the judgment we can make, I mean, there are lots to be said about it, but maybe one point what can make is that uh, all its flaws, what the judgment did, is held the line established in Afti Singh Johar. We did not backslide, we did not go backwards as far as rights are concerned, but we held the line because if you read the judgment closely, it's very, very difficult to identify a kind of a biased or a prejudiced perspective vis-a-vis vis vis LGBT people. And those submissions were there before the court by the government, but the judgment doesn't, at the conscious surface level, reflect a level of bias or prejudice uh, with the community. So that's maybe you can read it as one positive. Again, uh, the, the judgment is a complicated judgment because the areas of agreement and areas of disagreement. The areas of agreement, again, perhaps is something for us to learn from. One area of agreement, of course, is that, that I just mentioned the, that, that uh, LGBTQ people are not urban elite. 
they all agree that all the five judges agree that transgender people have the right to uh, right to marry. Transgender people in heterosexual relationships have the right to marry. Sorry, I, I have to clarify that or, or, or uh, caveat that. Then the judges also agree, as, as you just rightly indicated, that uh, there is no fundamental right to marry. Again, that's a very troubling conclusion, and it's a tough one to reconcile, as you rightly indicated, because it makes no sense. You read the previous jurisprudence of the Indian Supreme Court, you say that, you know, they would, they would read that right in Article 21. Why did they not do it? And perhaps there's an answer to that. An answer to that, perhaps, again, is dependent on the research you all guys do with the, with the resources you have, with the people you have access to, to find out why. Why did the court come to that particular conclusion? I would think maybe it's linked to one particular point, again, it's worth considering, is that you have five judges, and the judges, the, the, the minority was trying to craft a majority. And to craft a majority, perhaps the minority felt, let go of the fundamental right to marry. And let's look at the question of relationship recognition. But unfortunately, the minority was not able to craft the majority and it lost out even on the, on, on the su subsidiary relief, which I think they thought about. Perhaps in, anyway, we'll leave, leave that point aside. But the, 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 the other point I want to make is the, the other conclusion they all come to is the, the Special Marriage Act is constitutional, other than Justice Call, of course, who says that it does violate the right to equality. But again, see, the point they come to, I think what seems to unite all five judges on this question, is I think Justice Call's opinion where he agrees that on the face of it, there's no doubt about it, that the, that the SMA is discriminatory because you're excluding same-sex couples. But the point, again, he comes back to, he says that the problem we face is what he calls the spider web of legislation, which changes one law, a whole range of other laws have to change, and we can't go into, into lawmaking because that's not our domain. So that seems to be, in my opinion, a fairly compelling argument in terms of the SMA. It seems very, very difficult to make any headway with the, with the, with the SMA. But the second part is where I have a lot of problems with, which is the subsidiary relief crafted by the minority, which is Justice Chandrachud and Justice Call, where they made the point that, fine, there is no right to marry. Fine, SMA we can't do anything about, but we can do something. What is it we can do? We can recognize the right to recognition of, uh, of what, what he called unions, or right to form unions. And the fact that if you form a union, certain rights flow out of being in a relationship with another person. I think we just heard uh, uh, Abe describe in some detail, what are the rights which flow out of being in a long-term relationship with, 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 a, with a person, and how those rights Need any need a, need a kind of a legal protection, and again, uh, if you read it closely, Justice Chandrachud doesn't go that far. He basically, my reading, he basically says, let a committee be constituted, let that committee decide the question of the rights which flow out of this relationship, and that's why it's very troubling the fact that the minority or the majority in this case saw fit to say that even that minimal thing of the constitution of committee which is going to look into these questions. Uh, we can't particularly give you. The second question, of course, is the entire question of adoption. Again, the, the way Justice Chandrachur crafted the relief, looking at the CARA guidelines, basically saying that you have the, the right to adoption can't be restricted to what he called married couples in a stable relationship. What is the basis of distinguishing a married couple from an unmarried couple in a stable relationship? Uh, if you have this kind of a distinction, you, in, you, very, you strongly affect LGBTQ couples for the simple reason that LGBTQ couples can't get married. Therefore, there's a level of, though it's facially neutral kind of a regulation, it ends up unfairly discriminating against the LGBTQ population. <laughs> he, he argued that it should be struck down. And again, the, if you read Justice, uh, the, uh, Justice Butts, uh, majority in this case, uh, it's hard to see it as, a, as any other way than uh, you get a sense that Justice Butt acknowledges the question of discrimination. He acknowledges the fact that discrimination, but he seems to feel that as far as the, the statute is concerned, it's the interest of the best interest of the child is the main consideration, and the best interest of the child may not be served by this entire question of, uh, of opening it out to unmarried couples. Justice Chandrachud, of course, responds to that is where's the evidence to indicate that it will not, that unmarried couples are any the worse off than married couples who might be in a stable relationship as far as the, the best interest of the child is concerned. Again, so this is the other uh, 
problem. The third, okay, the third problem, the third problem I'll make in terms of the disagreement is the entire question of remedies. Again, this is the most critical and the fundamental point because you get a sense of sympathy from the, as, as you rightly put it, a lot of sympathy from the majority. But Justice Chandrachar's point is very clear. What's the point of a remedy? What's the point of a right if there's no remedy? And I think we agree with him on the point. What's the point of expressing all the sympathy you have if you can't craft a single remedy as far as the community is concerned? That's the third point of disagreement. And here, okay, I want to go on to one more point, or uh, two more points actually. Uh, Justice Butt delivered an opinion on the last day he was uh, before he demitted office in a case called Balram was Union of India. Again, a very, very important case, I think. Because it's a case which is about operationalizing the Manual Scavenging Act. The Manual Scavenging Act is a dead letter law and passes a range of regulations, range of range of uh, range of directions to operationalize that particular act. Again, you read those guidelines closely. It's a very, it's a very powerful and empathetic judgment. You get a sense he brings Article 17 to life in this particular judgment. You get a sense of the way the way the judicial judicial heart should beat for the person who is dispossessed and the person who is marginalized. But the the range of directions he gives, you look at those directions, it's very difficult to argue that he could not have given any of those directions in the context of the, of the, uh, of the, of the, of the marriage case as well. Again, if you look at the Justice Chandrachur case in, the, in, the, on the, on the, on in this particular, uh, in this judgment, he goes, the relationship, the question of the recognition of, the, of union is one point. The second point is the adoption question. The third, actually is a range of directions he passes with respect to protection of LGBTQ persons, addressing the question of discrimination, addressing the issue of stigma, addressing the issue of police violence, and a range of directions. Again, people will argue that what's the great point of these directions, but actually they're very, very important. Because you go to the grassroots level, it is these directions which lawyers use, which activists use to say that, you know, we want protection for the people who are in trouble. Again, getting going to the 2000 and 18 Navtej judgment, it was followed by over 40 judgments uh, by various high courts. And most of them were to do with transgender and lesbian couples who were going before the court for protection against violence from natal families. And this is again the range of directions which, the, which Justice Chandrachur gives or uh, directs in this particular case, but which Justice Butt really uh, dissents from. And again, that to me is very troubling. How can you have not give anything at all is the question which, which was there in my, my, my heart. How can you give nothing at all, you know, when there's so much you could have done even within the parameters of what is possible. The range of reasons Justice Bird gives as to why he dissents, why he can't give these opinions, but to my mind, again, maybe people think differently, uh, to my mind, they're not particularly convincing reasons. Because if you think of human rights, again, going back to the Vienna program, as, the, as interrelated and indivisible, there's a way in which there's almost, in my mind, the, what, what you see is a certain kind of hierarchy as far as rights are concerned, and certain way, way inability to conceptualize reliefs as far as uh, the LGBTQ community, in this case, as far as the marriage case, uh, is really concerned. And maybe one, I'll end with one last point, which is, yeah. after? Yep. yep. Okay. Oh, okay, fine. Okay. The, the last point I wanted to get to is, uh, is what is the, post supreme legal landscape. Again, I, I, when I look at Supreme and say post supreme, supreme legal landscape, I feel like, you know, we can't be speaking lawyers when he's over here. But uh, the question is, what is the way the court has decided on the matter post the judgment in Supreme? Again, I'll try looking it up and seeing what are the judgments we have. And it's quite interesting. On the question, again, which we refer to the question of, you know, habeas corpus cases and cases of uh, LGBTQ couples who run away and uh, forced in, uh, forced by the families to to separate from each other. We have a case uh, called uh, Divu Nair versus State of Kerala, again, uh, authored by, in this case, by Justice Chandrachud, where the, the guidelines of the regular, or the, the guidelines which he passes in Supriyo, which become the dissent, become the majority as far as this particular case is concerned, where the range of guidelines which are there on, if you're in a situation of a couple who sort of be separated, uh, by the by, the police of the state, there are a range of guidelines which are passed in terms of how the police should respond at the uh, and the, how the judiciary should respond to habeas corpus cases in the case of uh, these these kinds of these kind of matters. The second case is a case again in the of the of the of the Kerala High Court, which is a case of conversion 
conversion therapy sought to change a person's sexual orientation, where again, it's being heard currently by the Kerala High Court, where the idea is that uh, the prayer is for the prohibition of conversion therapy is a violation of the right to dignity and the right to personhood and, and selfhood. Again, interesting that Supreo is there as a judgment, but there are ways in which the courts are seeing how they can take things forward. The third case I want to reference is the case of the of the of the Midras High Court, which is just an Anand Vengtesh order, where uh, again he references the Supreo matter and says these are the points made by Supreo, and all the points are listed which is the idea that, you know, that there is no fundamental right to marry, the Special Marriage Act is constitutional. Uh, he lists all of that and says, okay, this is the boundaries in which we have to operate. What can we do now in the case of these two, uh, these two women who are in a relationship with each other? And then he comes up with the, with the concept of, can we register what he calls a deed of familial association as far as these two women are concerned, right? And again, you read the judgment, you get a sense of a judge is very close to the grassroots because he's saying that, why do we want to register a deed of familial association? He says, what these, what, these, what these women have been saying is if we have some kind of a legal recognition, how valid or not, some legal recognition of our, of our relationship, it'll help us combat both stigma and violence. So that's the value that this kind of a uh, regulation that this kind of an order has. So that's the that's the prayer which uh, which which Justice uh, Venk Justice Venkatesh orders in this particular uh, uh, grants in this particular case. And the final matter I'll refer to, final madam I'll refer to is a uh, is a case called Jibin Joseph versus State of Kerala. Again, very very this I thought was a very moving case which gets to the heart of the Justice Butt's majority opinion as well. And the and in a sense the the problem with it, this case was a matter of a, of these of both Jibin and Manu in a relationship with each other. And Manu, by some tragedy, died. And uh, when he was admitted in the hospital and he died in the hospital, the hospital refused to release his body to Jibin because Jibin was not in any legal relationship with, uh, with Manu. The family didn't want the body because they said, see, we can't pay one lakh to get the family, to get the body released. Jibin wanted the body because he said, see, I have to pay my last rights as far as my, my, my partner is concerned. And in this case, there's a sympathetic judge and it worked out in a way that the judge ordered that the two, uh, that the body will be released to the family, but Jibin will be allowed to attend the, attend the funeral. But again, see the complicated series of legal hoops one has to go through. And why I mentioned this is somehow I felt that the, this is the kind of, really life and death situation people find themselves in. And this is really the, the question which I think Justice Butt failed to, failed to really address or understand in the course of his, uh, course of his judgment. Because again, you read the judgment, there's an analogy he makes. He talks about the question that, you know, he says, see, enumerated rights, fine, we can have protection, but unenumerated, un unenumerated rights, how can we have protection? He goes on to give an example of, he says, if a poet is going to make the case that he wants his work to be read or work to be heard, can the court grant that particular relief? But I said, that's a wrong analogy. The analogy is the case of Jibin. That's the analogy you have to have. So there's a way in which the depth or the passion or the kind of violation which the queer community su uh, suffers is something which I think Justice Butt's opinion really missed out on. So the question is really, how do we get that, uh, the, the passion and the, the story of which Supriyo and uh, Abhay, as well as a range of other petitioners. Again, we have a friend, Akhay Padmashali from, I will make this one last point, from uh, Bangalore, who's a transgender person, who's also a petitioner. And she makes the point that actually, it's not a case of same-sex marriage. It's a case of marriage equality. Because the question is, it affects the entire LGBTQ community. That's why we're all a part of this case, you know? And uh, I'll end on that point. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Naran, for that comprehensive critique of both the judgment and what the judgment has let loose and how judges are still trying to deal with it. Yes. And uh, from the court as a site of contestation, we now move to the legislature and how the rhetoric of equality is invoked in the form of the Uniform Civil Code, especially in the state of Uttarakhand. 
And to deliver remarks on that, we have Dr. Soumya Saxena, who's an associate professor at the Jindal Global Law School, where she teaches courses on gender and society and legal history, fellow historian. Uh, before joining JGLS, she was a British Academy postdoctoral fellow and affiliated lecturer at the Faculty of History, University of Cambridge, from where she holds a PhD and an MPhil. She holds an MSc from the University of Oxford and a BA from the University of Delhi. Her research interests include legal history, gender, family law, secularism, and politics in South Asia, which she has published in multiple peer-reviewed journals and as a book titled Divorce and Democracy, A History of Personal Law in Post-Independence India, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2022. Beyond her research interests, she's interested in legislative policy and has advised the Justice Burma Commission on amendments to laws on sexual violence against women, the Law Commission of India on Family Law Reform, and the Forced Marriages Commission in the United Kingdom. We are thankful to have a scholar of her interdisciplinary erudition speak at this conference, and especially at this panel. So I now invite Dr. Saxena to deliver her remarks. Um, I want to begin by thanking Srijan for such a kind introduction. And I also want to thank Nalsar for inviting me. And this is a wonderful opportunity for me to speak to you all about this. And although I had planned a different start, I while I was listening to the panel that you know that the panelists who preceded me, which is a tough panel to follow because it was uh, such an interesting uh, discussion. Is this all right? So because it's such an interesting discussion, I was thinking of, you know, what happens when you seek state intervention and the state doesn't intervene in your favor. And what I'm about to speak uh, about today is about what happens when the state does intervene. And unfortunately, the consequences of that intervention were also pretty devastating, as I will go on to talk a little bit more about the Uttarakhand uh, Uniform Civil Code. Now, the Uniform Civil Code, uh, I'll skip the context here because it's a very old debate. We've all spoken about how, you know, very often gender is the entry point for discussion, but it becomes about secularism, national integration, minority politics, and all of that. And in the Uttarakhand UCC, I want to narrow down the focus a little bit on what actually happens when you create a legislative draft for something like a uniform civil code, a uniform code that governs all sorts of family law. Now, Uttarakhand is not the first state to do it. Uh, of course, Goa has a code, but Goa's code, again, is very rooted in local custom. They have community of property. They have all sorts of provisions that can't be generalized. So very often, it's not looked at as though it's a blueprint for a national uniform civil code, an expectation that increasingly I find in, you know, in, in Indian media that they have with the Uttarakhand uniform civil code. And they think it's like a step forward in favor of a national legislation. Now, uh, I will focus very briefly on three major points and three major critiques that I have of this quote. The first focuses on its dealings with Muslim personal law. The second focuses on uh, its dealings with live-in relationships. And relatedly, the third point about what it promises for uh, gender justice. Now, uh, because I have followed this issue not just as an academic, but also somebody interested in policy, I've spoken to a lot of people about uniformity in general. How does it fly as a electoral promise? What do people really see in it? Why is it something that people want so much or do they not want? And one of the repeated arguments that I keep encountering is that with the Uttarakhand uh, Uniform Civil Code, at least it's something. At least we've started a conversation. At least an intervention. And I have a huge problem with, with somewhat interventions or with at least interventions. Because what it basically means is that not only are we exemplifying mediocrity in these legislations, what we're also doing is basically hiding shoddy drafting behind this behind very trigger happy committees, which are not putting these laws through any legislative rigor. So what you end up producing is a community uh, is a committee of like six or seven people, they put together a draft, it never really goes through rigorous legislative debate, it becomes a law because something had to be done, right. And that intervention very often could be politically motivated, it could be motivated by the fact that the state wants to do something, it wants to be the leader in this conversation around uniformity. But nevertheless, it is an 
an argument that dismisses any intellectual engagement, treat it as, treats it as ineffectual. And most importantly, this in a bid to get things done, what we often end up creating is a law that embodies discrimination that it was meant to address. So now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what these, what my critique really of this legislation is. So in its dealings with Muslim personal law, strangely enough, it's never mentioned ever in, in a two, almost 200 page draft, it's not specifically mentioned that it's addressing any religion, but Muslim personal law, as we know in, you know, uh, you know, in common parlance, very often becomes the bait on which you seek legislative intervention. So there is an entire media machinery also deployed towards highlighting the obscurantism of Muslim personal law. And one, one example that I will take from this is, is the practice of Nikah Halala. And without quite saying it, the Uttarakhand uh, law code basically tries to address it. I'll just briefly draw out for you what nikah halala means in popular parlance. It basically uh, means that in order for one to reconcile with a divorced spouse under Muslim personal law, one must enter into another marriage. This intervening marriage has to then be consummated. And therefore, once you are freely divorced from this marriage and you exit it, only then can you reconcile with your husband. Does this practice occur? Very rarely. Is it common? Not at all. Now, is it legal? It's actually not. But the conversation around it makes it seem like this great intervention that the Uttarakhand Law Code is bringing is actually about criminalizing this practice. Now, nikah halala, or the practice of introducing an intervening husband, is in any way or form going to be considered as, as rape if this practice were to be taken before court. There's lots of case law where, uh, not a lot because it's, a, it's not a very common practice, but it's very frequently the Odessa High Court, for instance, at one point said that uh, you can reconcile and you don't need this. On another occasion when this had occurred, the intervening Malvi who had served as the intervening husband was actually, you know, uh, it was treated as a rape case, right? So to take sort of credit for the fact that we've criminalized a practice which was in any case illegal is precisely what I mean about the rhetoric that surrounds law. The rhetoric is to make a certain community's law seem obscurantist. Now, if I were to draw a parallel to what is happening with Muslim personal law and how the Uttarakhand law code without quite mentioning it kind of manages to make it look a certain way, would be that if let's say a case of Sati takes place, the whole of Hindu law is blamed for it. Now we know that Sati at some point must have been a part of Hindu tradition, but it's been banned, it's been criminalized, and it's illegal. And one of case when it happens, it's treated as an individual case. But if this happens in, in Nikah Halala's case, right? if this happens in a practice that we associate most centrally with Muslim personal law, it is not the individual who is held responsible. The entire community and the entire law system, personal law, must somehow become, you know, become a part of this process and must take the blame for this process. right? So the fact that the, both Sati and Nikah Halala are criminalized is never treated on the same plane. One practice is like, oh, Hindu law has already been reformed, and Muslim personal law, no matter how many interventions you, you have in it, will never ever be given that sort of a place. Now, the other point that I want to highlight, again, uh, slightly with reference to Muslim personal law, but also moving a little further away from it, in what capacity and based on what arguments are we willing to accept difference? And the biggest example of acceptable difference is tribal laws, is tribal communities. So there is the sixth schedule in the constitution which deals with exemptions and exceptions given to the northeastern states. And literally their sort of, uh, you know, their, their presence in India is contingent on the fact that these exemptions are granted, right? Uttarakhand also has 3% tribal population, and they thought it was rational, and perhaps rightly so, to not intervene in it. But the difference I'm trying to highlight is that at some level, tribal difference or regional difference is deemed more acceptable than religious difference. So the very idea on which uniformity is mounted, its premise is flawed, because we think that certain kind of differences are acceptable, but certain other kind of religious differences are, are not, and perhaps that's a more politically yielding argument, which is why one can't divorce the conversation on uniform civil court from the political context in which we operate. Now, if it were a conversation genuinely about 
you know, tribal laws, then it would highlight something really important. It would highlight the true antagonism between federalism and uniformity. And that is why nobody wants to deal with the tribal question. Because the tribal question will give you precisely a valid, convincing, and significant argument for preserving difference. And in order for you to eliminate it through an argument of uniformity, you will have to constantly keep reiterating that this kind of difference is okay, this kind of difference is discrimination, right? And that can never be like, I mean, that should be the basis on which you intervene, but that often becomes dependent on who's seeking the difference. Now I want to speak a little bit also about uh, you know the gender justice act uh, aspect of it because very often again that's the that's the sole argument on which you enter into this debate that's like the entry point for your conversations on uniform civil code that it will somehow promise you gender justice now um, there are many aspects of of this code which not only not promote it but actively hinder it and the the first one that comes to mind is of course what they have on live in relationships but before i get into what they say about live in relationships let's think a little bit also about the existing law before the uttarakhand law came into being we had a special marriage act which was about enabling interreligious marriage right it, it, in how in a way that it was originally conceived in 1954 now, this act has seen a lot of, and I can speak for UP, which is where I did my fieldwork, a lot of, uh, you know, casual procedure has emerged around the Special Marriage Act. One such casual procedure is that uh, there should be a 30-day notice. That's that's actually built into the law. But over and above the 30-day notice, now you also have to get a no-objection certificate and have it on an affidavit and produce it before the court. Now, this procedure is not a part of the law, but it's casually kind of emerged. Now, now, with the live-in relationships being registered in Uttarakhand uh, court, where you have to register your live-in relationship within a month, it again reinforces the argument that state surveillance is very necessary for marriage in the name of protection of women, which also serves the argument that women will remain sort of damsels in distress who will need state intervention to pull them out of it. But it's not just as simple as that. The state of Uttarakhand is not just protecting women in particular kind of heterosexual relationships. It's also giving primacy to a certain kind of heterosexual monogamous relationship akin to marriage. So the state, as Srimati Basu and others have argued, is an ally of marriage, but it's an ally of a certain kind of marriage. And if anything, the panel panelists that, uh, that, were, that preceded me make this so clear because people willing to enter voluntarily into monogamous relationships are denied so because we have this idea of a heterosexual marriage, which is now not only imposed on willingly marrying couples, but also on couples who are in a live-in relationship. Now, this idea that uh, live-in relationships are inherently uh, are inherently things that we should be concerned about because they're immoral is not new. Any uh, any sort of uh, very recently, it was the Gujarat government in mid 2023 that said that if you have had a love marriage in in order for you to register it, there will have to be mandatory parental consent. So the idea that love marriage is problematic and a live-in relationship contingent on it is therefore worthy of surveillance is in itself coming from a, a state bias which is very very old now again in 1954 debates on special marriage act now special marriage act i think is a is something that's been in conversation quite a lot today but it, when it was imagined we think of it as an enabling legislation right we think of it as a legislation that allowed people of different religions to marry but when i looked at the legislative debates around it uh, which is kind of what i do as a you know as a non lawyer but a historian is that you look at the kind of speeches that went into making of this legislation and some of these speeches uh, uh, were really, you know, I mean, interesting would be a terrible word to use here. They were really disappointing and, and, and quite scary because at some point it was treated as an act to contain the rebels. These are people who you can't fit into any other law. So let's put them together under the Special Marriage Act. Let's make the divorce procedure easier for them because these are marriages destined to fail. It was not just as benign as them treating uh, love marriages as destined to fail, but people actually cited, and this is N.C. Chatterjee, who was uh, uh, my least favorite favorite member of parliament at the time, he says that um, he, he cites an anecdote about a woman who is Hindu, who, who's an actress, who happens to be an actress, and she's married somebody who's a Muslim, and that marriage is subsequently ended in divorce. 
but he spins this conversation to actually say that the Special Marriage Act is for lipstick wearing butterflies and not for honorable girls of our households. So these are his actual words in 1954. And you would think that, OK, why is this relevant? Because it didn't really make it to the legislation. It shows us the context in which the state operates. It shows us the context in which your litigation will take place. This is how people think, no matter how liberal your legislation might be. So the limits of the law. And there are tons of examples of this. I will not go into each of them. But you know, uh, there are anti-Romeo squads in UP that had become particularly popular at some point. And if you happen to be a couple who was just you know roaming in a garden outside your university or something, and God forbid if you were an interfaith couple, then it would you know it would trigger them in ways, and then you would have FIRs against yourself. And these things change, uh, you know change slowly in the sense that in uh, UP again there was initially a women's power line that was initiated where women could complain about sexual harassment. This subsequently was merged with something called a Nari Suraksha Dal. So you can see empowerment, the rhetoric of empowerment moving slowly towards protection. And again the Uttarakhand uh, marriage code is precisely about that making that kind of uh, you know protection necessary, making it seem like without it you'll be extremely vulnerable. So creating that vulnerability is also something that the state is doing. Now, uh, we know that there are already some judgments that were governing uh this, uh, that were governing uh, live-in relationships. There was one in 2015, which was Dhanural versus uh, Ganesh Ram, which was about if you've lived in a relationship long, long enough, it will be, be treated as a relationship in the nature of marriage. There was also a judgment, uh, Joseph Schein, which also speaks to the fact that you know adultery is no longer a criminal offense, it's a marital offense. So all of this legislation has to be read together with what is happening in the Uttarakhand law code. Now, uh, if we were to treat uh, live-in relationships in the nature of marriage, this would be normally determined by courts on a case-to-case -case basis. But now that they have said that every live-in relationship will be will have to you know be be sort of registered, and I think one of the members of this uh, of this uh, you know committee were questioned, and that mem how much time do I have? Okay, just another couple of sure. four minutes. Okay, maybe. So uh, this member of committee, and I'll conclude quickly, this member of committee actually responded that if you're in a living relationship, just own it. So by owning it, he meant just register it. Now, this kind of stigma that's associated with owning live-in relationships will accrue only to women. How will the state, for instance, ensure that men don't ask for records of people's live-in relationships? Will they ensure that these records remain private? Will they ensure that men don't make it a condition to look at these records before they decide on marriage? Ultimately, this kind of rhetoric only informs, uh, you know, only it, it's a very sort of a, you know, it, it's something that will disproportionately affect women and not men. Now, this, uh, this is the last example I will take, this lack of attention to women's uh, demands and enacting a code for the sake of it because you think it's a good argument or a good intervention, this kind of hasty legislation actually is not, uh, is not benign. So like in the triple talaq case we saw, women asked for the fact that this is an arbitrary form of divorce. What they got was a law that said, oh, it's too fast, but they did not agree, uh, did really address the arbitrariness of the law. So we think, nevertheless, triple talaq is a is a step in the right direction. It's not. This entire idea that we can simply give state credit for intervention also means that social movements lose momentum over it, women's demands remain unaddressed, and these are not benign steps towards progress, but actually these mediocre interventions are extremely harmful. So I will conclude by just saying that I'm not making an argument here that there shouldn't be state intervention in, uh, you know, in, in, in feminist movements and feminist movements on many sides have been on the side of law, have also spoken against the law, but it may be far more productive to actually codify personal law separately rather than to produce this rhetoric of uniformity as a, as a save all solution, which actually doesn't save anyone and uh, in, in the process really materializes some of these stereotypes that we've always lived with and always battled. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, for situating the Uttarakhand Uniform Civil Court in its true historical context and for demonstrating how history can work with law to illuminate our understanding of the law. I'm basically plugging my own discipline. So now we can move on to questions, of which I'm sure there are quite a few. OK, uh, Saksham.
One, two. Uh, thanks. I think that was a great session and I really enjoyed hearing everyone. Um, I have a somewhat provocative question to ask, which is, isn't marriage itself the, sorry, here, here, here. Um, isn't marriage as an institution itself the problem? And uh, I come at this and I think all of you at some level have pointed this out. Um, in a sense, shouldn't we be questioning the state privileging one kind of relationship instead of saying privilege two or three more also while you're at it. Uh, I sort of, it, it just occurred to me, I think when uh, Arvind was making the point about stable relationship, implicit in Justice Bhatt's statement seems to be when you sign on the dotted line on that register or when you exchange whatever, it becomes a quote unquote stable relationship, right? Uh, to me, I think perhaps if I were being uncharitable, I'd say it was a missed opportunity, but I feel there is an opportunity nonetheless in the context of gay marriage and also uniform civil code and also live in relationships to maybe ask and question some very fundamental ideas about marriage itself. And why does the state put so much uh, emphasis, importance on this quite frankly, moth-eaten uh, institution, which a lot of people are unhappily stuck in, right? Let's be honest about that. So I just sort of what thought I'd uh, ask for your respective takes on it. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, my question would be to uh, our justice over here. Does Nepal have a ritual something like the kanya dan and to our indian counterpart has a review of the ritual of kanya dan in hindu marriage ever been done the reason i'm saying that is the sanskrit word kanya dan means gift of women in marriage only you know a, 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 a you know you cannot gift or donate a being who is endowed with rationality and reasonability in that count if you look at it this ritual itself you know, it's kind of like um, it's an atrocity on women where the rights of, uh, you, if you look at the fundamental rights, 13, 14, 15, 19, 21 of the Constitution of India, there is a lot of things that go into it. And why I'm saying this is respect in India, when you look at the marriage, in the window of marriage, flows from the younger women to the higher women, and many a times not the other way around. So has it ever been reviewed is my question. The ritual of Kanyadan. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, hi. So my question is to Abhay and uh, Supriyo. So, uh, yeah. So, so there is this uh, tradition that used to exist and it still exists in some form. It is known as Maitri Karar and it used to exist in Gujarat and it is something that is being used by same-sex couples to enter into a sort of an agreement so that there can be a validation of certain rights in the form of property rights and getting a housing agreement together of sorts. So since uh, Arvind sir had also mentioned a similar agreement that was done in, uh, 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 that was uh, sort of proposed by a judge in the judgment. So when we look at these sorts of agreements, so I would like to know for uh, like uh, uh, specifically from a personal point of view, as well as a, a social uh, a perspective as well, would it would 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 the validity of such sort of agreements, if they, let's say they are mainstream tomorrow through certain judgments or certain sort of a policy, would that uh, essentially also mean that uh, like is that the only uh, thing that uh, the LGBTQ community seeks, or is there also some sort of an importance that is placed on the cultural socio cultural uh, uh, milieu of uh, that? marriage represents in itself so is it yeah okay. so uh, saksham so uh, my question is to professor avind and dr saksena so uh, in supriyo even cj chandachud while rationalizing his judgment of not recognizing a fundamental right to marry he rationalized it on the ground that if a court gives a right it must give a, give a remedy as well which the court cannot give because it's, it cannot hold sma unconstitutional or the second option would have been to change a lot of laws with a lot of intersection with religion 
uh, for example, a Hindu couple uh, married under SMA would still have their succession laws governed by HSA. So uh, something which the court refused to touch in the very beginning, as it uh, said the canvas was only limited to secular laws. So can a UCC, where the idea of any religious influence uh, concerning property, succession, maintenance are not there, be something which the court is willing to alternate or read into the law uh, to maybe provide a remedy for a future uh, right to marry? Uh, moreover, to Supriyo and Abe, can you give us your take on the review to the decision and your realistic expectations from the judiciary going ahead? Thank you. We've got two more there, three more actually. Who are this? Okay. So can I go? No, Kirtana, you go. Can I go? Okay. Hello. Thank you so much for speaking, everyone, today. I wanted to ask since Justice Malla spoke about how we have to continuously engage in this process. We've also talked, um, Dr. Saxena also talked about how when the law is being created itself, there's a lot of policy and rhetoric that frames the way these interventions happen. So would either of you want to talk about how very realistically can we intervene at the stage of these interventions? So how can we actually look at engaging at the policy level or so that, so that we don't have to reach this point where after the intervention is done, we're dealing with a situation where either the state is giving us these sort of hodgepodge solutions or the judiciary is not addressing what we're demanding at all. So how do you think we can engage with this? Uh, Mr. Bajaj has a question. Yeah. Sorry, yes, hi. Uh, so uh, my question is this. Um, to 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 Mr. Narayan and maybe Justice Malha can probably give her insights on this as a as as someone who's been a social uh, as a cause lawyer and then a judge. So I understand uh, this is obviously a big setback and uh, marriage is an important gateway to access a series of entitlements such as insurance benefits, uh, you know, um, um, uh, like driving license related things or whatever else it may be, whatever social benefits flow from and uh, CJI's judgment lists them out, uh, those 14, 15 things. The question though is really this. So while I understand intuitively why it makes sense to attack marriage as the institution where we want to claim equality, uh, strategically though, in terms of creating a favorable legal environment for it, does it not make sense to go step by step and build a jurisprudence that um, recognizes different facets of uh, LGBTQ equality. For instance, I'll tell you in my disability rights jurisprudence, what I have found really helpful and what judges are comfortable with is really going step by step. So, you know, as opposed to saying that all movies should be accessible, if you say this particular movie should have accessibility features, they are much more likely to agree with that. So, for instance, Supriyo mentioned the example of insurance, which they would not be able to have Abhay as a nominee there. So, why not challenge that particular insurance and take that insurance company to court and get that struck down? Of course, this will be a longer process and it will take a, num a number of years to obtain outcomes, but perhaps those outcomes outcomes will then rest on a shorter jurisprudential foundation as it will have been a monu uh, an incremental case by case development. Thank you. Uh, okay. Bhavya, then Sohana. Yeah. Am I audible? Hi, good afternoon panelists. I'm Bhavya. First of all, it was a privilege to hear you all. I think all of us got a little overwhelmed when Supriyo and Abhay was talking. Uh, my question is to actually Justice Sapna. So do you think, um, here ma'am. Do you think a reason behind case-to-case -case discrimination, that the way you describe rape jurisprudence in Nepal, and when we juxtapose the same reason in context of Mr. Supriyo and Abhay's case, it's not simply rooted in the laws that exist or the social context, rather the lack of acceptance in a courtroom of arguments other than those which are positivist or objective in nature. So do you think reform could then be brought in in how the courtroom must be evolved and how when a court is faced with a case affecting the rights of a marginalized individual, especially when that marginalization is layered and historical, the courtroom should keep aside the farce of neutrality and be more engaging and forthcoming with arguments that are beyond strictly criminal or constitutional law. For example, as Mr. Abhay pointed out, the, from daily occurrences of inconvenience to complete in, invisibilization of their identity, how much weightage should that be given over just the text of the law? 
Sohina. Good afternoon. Uh, so my question is very similar to the ones already posed. It's more in the socio-legal uh, realm. So um, I worked on this paper with Professor, Professor Srijan last uh, year, and uh, it was on the marriage equality debate and how the constitutional debates were also in the area of gender rights, but none of these uh, debates ever addressed the uh, gender rights beyond women's rights. They were same sex was same sex marriage was never even envisioned back then and uh, with the discourse that has been going on for some time now my question is that we see that rights are inherently uh, the language of the law is inherently exclusionary and that's what we say see causes the major problem and discrimination occurs as a result of that so my question is a first step in the right direction would be to change the law in the sense to change the uh, the language of the law to make to rectify that area which um, it causes the exclusion in the first place and for example even one of the arguments was um, to include gender neutral language use spouse instead of man and woman even for the constituent uh, constituent assembly debates we had um, the i think the proposed article 42 which talked about a right to marry but it wasn't ever uh, it, it mentioned the words man and woman yet again so the first step would be to rectify this language but in what other ways do you think legally can we work to also address the larger uh, normative or equality related problems that are associated with the inclusion of the lgbtq in the larger uh, marriage framework of india because as justice malla also accounted it's not just the legal status but the social status as well so is the rectification of uh, language the only way to effect change in the soci sociological arena as well? Or is there uh, other any other approach that the courts can take uh, apart from policy and um, the legal way of doing things? Um. Um. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that panel. Uh, my question is particularly for the three panelists that uh, dealt with the marriage equality judgment. Uh, and it's slightly similar to what uh, the first question by Alok sir was. Uh, given that uh, the progress that the Indian queer rights movement has made so far, uh, are the demands for marriage equality rightly placed at this time? Uh, should these demands, instead of uh, simply securing rights for individuals who can marry or want to marry within the queer community, be focusing on something like Dr. Saxena pointed out, the SMA, which in itself has flawed origins. And other than that, personal laws, which in themselves have uh, flawed provisions with regards to uh, perpetuating patriarchy. So even when with the US, we have seen that despite the recognition of same-sex marriages, uh, violence against queer people continues. And in fact, anti-trans bills or drag bans have only increased over the past few years. So should the resources of the queer rights movement right now be focusing on something like Justice Pradhan mentioned, uh, having an equality clause amended into the constitution itself or uh, affirmative action for queer uh, individuals and not just limiting it, limiting it to marriage equality for now, which doesn't privilege everyone or doesn't uh, focus on the real issue of discrimination and violence which uh, queer community faces i hope that was clear um good good morning good afternoon everybody um i'm priyasha um my question is directed to justice malla um first uh, i wanted to understand what your idea of um ma'am i'm here sorry um i wanted to understand um what how you think the law conceptualizes the idea of consent is it enough? Does it take social realities and um, power dynamics into consideration? Um, second question is, if the um, idea of consent does not take inherent power uh, imbalances into question, then why do the rape laws across, like globally, uh, take this very simple understanding of consent that, you know, that it's just a proper yes? Why is that? um the basis of a lot of the rape laws across and my third question is if is it possible to move from the inherent phallocentrism of these rape laws to see rape as just power imbalance and acquiescence of sex 
um, so yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. 10 questions. So maybe we can proceed in the order of the speakers. So Justice Malla, if you... Thank you for uh, many, many questions. Uh, I may not be able to respond to all, but uh, I would start with uh, Mary's uh, institution and Kanyadan. I mean, one, of course, has a right to marry, but right not to marry. It's a personal choice. Uh, but uh, again, like I think we also have to look into the context, uh, society where we live and uh, how, uh, I mean, uh, what will it happen uh, to the people who are in unbalanced power relation and uh, marginalized population. So for certain people, there is a need to legitimize with uh, various reasons which uh, we discussed. Uh, therefore, I think for me, most important thing is how to um, address inequality which is surrounded uh, in this uh, institution. So I think that is where we all need to focus on. Uh, in case of Kanyadan, yes, I mean, Nepal used to be uh, the only Hindu state. Now it's a secular state. Um, I mean, it's a uh, religion, culture is a belief, a personal belief, uh, but culture is changing. Culture is not a static, so it's changing. Uh, and uh, the beautiful language, like sometime initially, like I used to say, Oh, Nepal, we are making so many constitution with every political change, we are making new constitution. But in this new the constitution, we were able to negotiate the right. And the right one, of course, Nepal is a secular state. Second, we even have a language that says if any tradition, culture, custom, religion, discriminatory, it will be recognized as exploitation. So I think sometimes bringing those kind of um, values within the constitutional framework is key uh, to deal uh, with society where uh, there is a huge um, um, challenge uh, or influence uh, with, uh, with um, religion and culture uh, because society is, is still uh, different. Then uh, I would like to uh, address uh, one question like, um, I mean, keeping in mind the present situation how should we move of course i mean it's it's not easy it's not easy uh, but we need to engage i think engage and our own experience because when we initiated like when i was lawyer and when i initiated some of the public interest litigation where the court says oh that discriminatory law it's not discrimination it's a part of the custom and custom is part of the religion and it's a hindu religion is a like a state religion so we cannot say it discriminatory so we had that mindset but it's changing changing because we were able to in, uh, engage in the lawmaking now we are in a, in a law interpretation i think that dynamism has to be changed because i think um, uh, representation of this population has to be in that power hierarchy so that we can understand we can make difference but we need to engage in sensitizing in educating and therefore not only expecting from the judges because now i'm a judge i understand because not only expecting from just but the academician what um, uh, you have been working on what you have been developing what uh, framework you have maybe need to be shared or even lawyer prosecutor everyone needs to um, you know educate and 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 engaging and educating is important but sometimes also i think you have to use different tools i mean what i found like hearing and the voices of the um, the the individual or group like you know and that is also very important because in for internalization at the same time sometimes we also need to engage with the politics but again like it's not easy to answer me because when the nature of the state is different politics is different it's not easy um, but i think we need to continue uh, engaging um, um in continue uh, with our own engagement okay so a uh, couple of questions uh, i'm sure me and abhay together will answer a few um to start with uh, 
You know, when we talk about this LGBTQIA rights, the journey, it's been many years and uh, the main fight, the actual fight is for equality, right? Um, when you talk about the Maitri Karar, if I'm, if I'm uh, wrong for the pronunciation, pardon me. Um, I think one thing that we are fighting for, which is equality, right? We are tired being here treated as a second class citizen. So we don't need things bits and pieces. However, if I talk about pragmatically, um, I'm sure we all agree here that we'll not get everything overnight. However, um, the fight, the ask is for complete equality. I think as Supio mentioned, uh, our, uh, sorry, am I audible? Am I audible now? Okay. Yeah, our, our fight is for uh, full equality, right? So we, we don't want to be, like if this were a bus, we don't want to be sitting at the back of the bus. We want to be sitting where everybody is allowed to sit. So um, like, had there been civil union in the judgment, uh, the Supreme versus Union of India, had the majority agreed with civil union, we would have taken that. But we wouldn't have been totally happy with just that state of affairs. But the reality is that we got nothing. Um, so I think there was a question around whether um, marriage is the first battle that needs to be fought or whether some other battles need to be fought. I think we need to fight on all fronts. It's not an either or situation that either you fight for marriage equality or you fight against discrimination. It has to happen in parallel. Multiple conversations need to happen in parallel. So that's. That's not to say that only one fight, only one kind of actions should be taken up. Um, there was a question around, should we have gone step by step instead of uh, going uh, all out for marriage equality? But in hindsight, maybe yes. Uh, but that hindsight wasn't there uh, when we filed the case. Uh, see, uh, like again, as Sopio said, right, we care about full equality. and. If you're not going to get full equality on day one, we'll get something incremental, we'll take it. But uh, the, the point was that we didn't want to litigate each of the issues individually and go back to the courts again and again and again and again. So therefore, we felt that given Naftej Johar had already recognized sexual orientation as a protected ground uh, under Article 15, we felt that the natural conclusion would be a grant of marriage equality. So that was the reason we went for uh, full marriage equality in the case. Uh, expectations from the judiciary going forward. I think um, uh, I think we are living in a democratic society. We are uh, like uh, the judicial philosophy does evolve over a period of time. We know that 2013 uh, Suresh Kaushal judgment was overturned within a span of five years, less than five years in fact, uh, and. Therefore, our hope is that the judges will hear us, will be more receptive to us when we knock the doors again, and uh, eventually they would see that this is an important fight in which they have to kind of give us the uh, relief that we want. Thank you. Thank you for really, a, really a very important, very wonderful series of questions. Very difficult to answer all of it in the short time that we have. I think a lot of it centers around why the choice of marriage is the next uh, line of battle. But let me I'll just give you one answer that in my own opinion, I think we should see the entire LGBTQ battle, every battle as really a social legal battle. And we hope that the law in a sense triggers a certain way of transformation in society. That's the hope that we have. And I think the, the uh, Navtej battle took over 17 years, and the value of that over 17 year battle is that over a period of 17 years, you saw the fact that change can happen through the course of the battle itself. Give you an example. Uh, we had the entire question of criminalization. We had the question of uh, recriminalization in 2013. And the way in which the level of media publicity around the issue allowed for a certain kind of sensitization of public opinion. What Supriya and Abhay are indicating, which is very important, is the same thing happens even in the course of this defeat. It may be a defeat. I mean, it may be a loss, but it's not necessarily a defeat. And out of the loss, we hope a victory will come. Because your final objective is really how do you change a societal morality and, in a sense, 
cultivate a certain kind of constitutional morality. Going back to again the the important words of Dr. Ambedkar, which is the idea that democracy in India is a top dressing in a soil which is essentially undemocratic. Constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. So really, I think the task we're engaging in is the cultivation of certain kind of constitutional morality in the wider public. And that's not an easy battle, as you're indicating in terms of every conversation that one has. And the question again of, you know, uh, the LGBTQ community being a part of the community for so many years is not in that sense uh, uh, organized uh, community where there's a top-down command and things happen. It doesn't quite happen that way, right? And there's a way in which judgments release a series of expectation, which the the people who are maybe the uh, in various top positions in the movement can't make a decision, right? Uh, post the 2018 judgment, which which happened. Uh, I think expectations were released in the community. Community felt, and rightly so, that we're entitled to a sense of equality. And people around said that we want the best that everybody else has. And so the petitions for equality were filed from really around the country. And again, that's not a, something you can control. It's not a controlled process where you say, okay, fine, we've got decriminalization. Next step is an anti-discrimination law. After that, we'll go to the uh, go to the question of, you know, as Rahul is indicating, I think rightly so, go through a range of small, small reliefs and finally get to marriage. It can't happen that way because there will always be somebody in some part of the country who will say that, you know, I want my marriage equality now. And that's been the case around the world, you know. Everywhere, activists have said the next stage is not marriage equality. There's been some person who said that, no, we want marriage equality today. So I think that that process is very, very difficult to, in that sense, uh, control. And maybe the, the uh, final point is... Uh, Perhaps we also should see the fact that the marriage equality battle was all of three years old. The decriminalization battle took over 17 years. And I think we should see this, I think, as you all are rightly indicating, see this as a broader social legal battle and see this as a battle which, in a sense, again, we believe that we will get to that point. Again, as you're indicating, the Pew survey, et cetera, there's a way in which social morality changes over a period of time. And sometimes the law is a useful way to trigger that kind of a change. And I think that's what the marriage battle has done. So our challenge now is how do we take that learning forward and bring about a greater kind of a uh, transformation? Or one last point on Alok's question of the marriage. Uh, why should that be the priority at all? Are there not other priorities in life? I think it's a fair point. But again, what you learn is by speaking to people from diverse parts of the community. Again, the sense I got is is not marriage from one of the one of the questions is not marriage a kind of an elite priority we had a meeting actually in bangalore and the meeting was with members of the transgender community akai padmashali and others and uh, they wanted to file a petition uh, on marriage equality again filed by jaina 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 kotari and the question uh, we were asking is why do you want to file and intervene in what is still now a same-sex marriage case. Why do you want? Why do transgender people want to be a part of this case as of now? And the answer we got from members from the community, and some of them were from Darwar, some from Belgaum. They all said, "See, okay, we completely support you in filing this case." Two stories they shared. I'll share both stories with you. One uh, one trans trans transgender woman said, "See, I've been in a relationship with this guy for the last 15 years, 16 years, or whatever, and you know the only place he ever acknowledges me is in the bedroom." Others, it pretends they don't exist in any kind of public space. Her point is, see, maybe if this marriage case comes through, I'll have some kind of social status. You know, people will recognize me as a human being who's entitled to this relationship. I'll be seen as a person other than somebody who functions only within the realm of the bedroom. And the second woman said, said, see, I've been in a relationship with this guy for 10 years and suddenly he dumped me. So I have nothing in my hand. I can't even say I was in a relationship with him. So again, her point is marriage is important as a point of social recognition. So I learned from people from a dive, again, it's a very important point because we often think that people who have nothing are not interested in marriage. That's not true. People are complex, they have all kinds of emotions and desires, and people at all levels, that's, a, that's, a, that's what we found. Right from the middle class gay community to people in the transgender community, people are very, very poor. Across the spectrum, people want to get married. Interestingly enough, the only people who are putting forward a critique of marriage are people really who are more, maybe more Western and queer theory, understand these kind of dynamics and di dilemmas. They're the ones putting forward the critique of a heteronormative institutional marriage. And so it's interesting that we have to acknowledge that reality as well. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm glad we went on a note of critique of marriage and uh, in particular heterosexual critique of marriage. So why don't heterosexual couples marry and why do they choose to live in? Why do they choose to live together without marrying at all? Because they want to escape some of the trappings of marriage. And these trappings of marriage are the expectations that one's in-laws might have, which as a couple who's living together may not have to face. In fact, there was a case in Uttarakhand where uh, that where a set of parents sued their children for not producing grandchildren for them, right? So you escape all of that. You escape certain trappings of marriage when you stay in a live-in relationship. Now, the other thing is that when you are in a heterosexual relationship and you try to make that legible to the state in form of a marriage registration or whatever, next time you go with to the police with a domestic violence case, how it actually plays out is they will most likely try to convince you and say that this is a ghar ka masla. So for heterosexual marriages, making your relationship legible to the state hides violence against women. And that is where the heterosexual critique of marriage really comes from. But again, this panel is really productive that way because there isn't, there, this isn't necessarily an argument against marriage, but everything that is wrong with a heterosexual marriage. I do want to uh, very quickly also answer the questions on Kanyadan and Maitri Karar. I will club them. So the bit on Kanyadan, you asked if uh, whether there's been a conversation around it. So yes, there has been a conversation around it. The one example that I'll definitely leave you with is the uh, Hindu Marriage Act, Madras Amendment 1967. So this amendment was uh, brought forth by the Madras government to give legitimacy to Surya Maryathai weddings or priestless marriages. So it was coming from a, uh, from a movement, which was an anti-caste movement. And they said that we don't want any rituals around marriage. And for the longest time, the state government kept responding to the then Madras, now Tamil Nadu government, saying that, you know, oh, but, you know, a large celebration is necessary for a marriage. How do we recognize? How do we find witnesses? Ultimately, they had to, they caved and the amendment became a law. But yeah, uh, Kanyadan has featured in a lot of legislative debates. And while you're absolutely right, women being treated as property was also the case in Christian law when women were treated as chattel. In a lot of religious texts, if you were to look at it objectively, maybe you would you would keep finding that reference. But in the Hindu Marriage Act, that's not a necessary ceremony, even though it ends up being necessary when marriages are uh, solemnized. It's not necessary under the law. Maitri Karar, I'm glad that was brought up. This again speaks to the rest of the panel because you brought it up in context of the fact that through Maitri Karar, is it possible for same-sex couples to, to peacefully cohabit? And, the, and every reference that I've been given of Maitri Karar is that, oh, it's this terrible institution where women are entering these you know, temporary marriages where their rights aren't protected. So we have to realize that these are, you know, these are movements which will be speaking in different voices and that's necessary. So actually, Maitri Karar could be very productive. And to say that all custom therefore should be done away with in the name of uniformity is deeply, uh, you know, is problematic. The question on succession will be a longish answer. So maybe I'll answer you when, you know, when we break for, uh, for tea or something there soon after. Um, there was a question about step by step, how do we move along, what happens, how should jurisprudence progress. Now, I think because a lot of, uh, you know, what I think is not directed towards policy goals as such, but just, just looking at processes around law, I think family law is an area where you muddle along with small wins. So there'll be a win, there'll be a judgment, there'll be a bad one, there'll be a good one, there'll be two steps forward, three steps back, there'll be all of that that happens. But I do uh, agree that, you know, it is, uh, it's a long battle, there'll be multiple battles, and it will not have uniform answers. So sure, there will be a conversation also that people will begin to have about civil partnerships where heterosexual couples say that we don't want a marriage, we want a civil partnership. But the state may agree to grant that and still not grant that to same-sex couples, right? In which case, you have to keep fighting for marriage. You have to keep fighting for, for that because it's relevant to people. So there will be, it's not, it's not a question of shifting goalposts. It's about recognizing that all movements speak in different voices. Um, I'll stop here for now and maybe I'll answer more when we speak for. Uh, we request Regen sir to hand over the mementos.
टू अभे था टू सुप्रियो चक्रवर्ती टू जस्टिस मल्ला टू मिस्टर अरविंद नारायण एंड टू डॉक्टर सौम्या सक्सेना Lunch has been served near Thinking Man statue for panelists, volunteers, uh, APU students. Uh, we'll be reconvening at two forty-five for the next session. Uh, also, guys, the Reclaim Constitution exhibition, which is being exhibited at the Moot Court Hall, will end around three p.m. So everyone is requested who want to attend to go to Moot Court Hall.
people. It is something that all of us, it's like when we as people start engaging with the constitution that courts take us seriously. And I think it's as a part of that enterprise that this panel is moving away from the courts and starting to talk about the initiatives of the people. As you all know, this panel has, uh, has been instituted every year in the memory of Shamnath Bashir and the kind of work he did. Not, I mean, of course, he did some amazing work in IP, but that's not the work we are discussing today. What we are discussing primarily is, and I always say it each year, and I think I'll never tire of saying it. He was one of the few people I met who lit that candle and did not curse the darkness, who spoke in terms of that, all right, we require diversity, we require pluralism, we require these things to be set right everywhere, including in elite institutions like our law schools. And he just went ahead and did it. We have this, you know, so it's like we, we complain a lot about statism and we complain a lot about being very authority conscious. But it's also true that we spend way more time discussing what the institutions of the state do. We don't spend as much time at looking at what we as people do. This panel is a celebration and a stock take an analysis and understanding of what happens, what causes a people's initiative to launch out, and what exactly do you get from it? What are your gains? What are your losses? What's the way forward? So we are doing this public reflection on the whole IDIA program, which was talking in terms of increasing diversity by increasing access. And to see like people who've benefited from that program, what exactly did it mean? What do they see and others in the audience who are also here, how do they see what we can do with it? We're also looking at uh, you know, the manner in which this program can be compared with other initiatives in other spheres of education, not just legal education, but medical education in engineering, what all can be done, not done. So I'm, I'm just giving you this as the context within which we are holding this panel. And also saying that uh, I'm, I'm certain we must, we must look at what courts do. They, they're powerful places and people there who, have, who are personing those courts. But I think it's equally important that we should reflect on what we do or what people amongst us do. And so in remembering Shamnath and the fact that he wouldn't take no for an answer, and with the persistence with which he has, like he had uh, instituted the IDIA and the fact that even after him, the program continues to, it has its struggles like every, every other thing, but it is, it's a, it's a robust program. It's kind of accepted and, you know, like proactively worked on that how are you going to ensure and both celebrate diversity. So I have with me uh, four speakers for the afternoon, and uh, I have told them 12 to 15, but I would say more 12 than 15, more about the fact of that we do need, we want to have that discussion afterwards. And I do think that uh, a strict management of time helps that usually. So um, starting with Yugal Jain, who's uh, an Alsar alum, and now is in some big shot in Amarjan. And uh, uh, I kind of see it's very horrible for me, you know, and I mean, I do this to all my students all of the time. Like, it's like, Tum lekin hamare liye to hamare bacche ho. To hum, and I think at some level uh, that has its own pluses. There's a, there's a bond of affection which I'm not giving up on. So Yugal is going to sort of, you know, speak to us about uh, what the fact that he got this opportunity from IDIA, what, how it contributed to him being the person he is. So he's doing both a personal as well as, in a way, I would say a policy reflection on the program. Yugal. Hi. 
Thank you, ma'am. Hello, everybody. You know, it is quite weird and uh, nice to come back to campus and speak. Uh, last time I must have uh, talked to a bunch of students here was in 2017. I don't really recall what I did talk about, but I do recall that uh, whatever I was speaking about, house was quite divided on it, right? Uh, half of the students were cheering me up and half were telling me F off. Uh, it, it just, uh, it, it was a nice time. I do, uh, I am willing to exchange my current life for that. But uh, before I start uh, tainting your rosy picture of law school, life after law school, let me come back to today's topic. Uh, I I think all of you are aware what IDIA overall does, right? All of you have seen its impact on IDIA scholars and overall in diversity and inclusion across legal fraternity. What I want to talk about today are two things. One, it's narrative around disability. And second is wholehearted living with disability. For me to start and for you to appreciate what I want to talk about, I'll have to take you back uh, to my childhood. I was one of those kids who uh, got called to principal's office uh, more often than it was required, I guess. But uh, <laughs> I did pull off my stunts and uh, uh, just got caught all the time. Uh, I thought it was a bit more. Uh, I got a bit more than my fair share, but uh, no regrets there. Uh, when I, uh, you know, when I was in fifth standard, one day I came back home and I told my mother that, Ma, I just can't see what's written on the blackboard. Uh, you can imagine what happened after that. Uh, multiple visits to doctors, uh, trying to figure out what has gone wrong, pushing me to push, uh, sit on the first bench instead of last. And uh, in a week's time, we realized that uh, I, they had diagnosed retinal detachment in my left eye. Multiple refers surgeries happened, and uh, fortunately, uh, uh, we were, were referred to a doctor in Ahmedabad, Dr. Nakpal, and he performed surgeries, and uh, he was able to save around 20% vision in my left eye. Same episode happened for my right eye after a year. This time, the doctor who has actually, had actually referred us told us that maybe he can do this in Jaipur. And uh, my parents obviously trusted him. It didn't go well. Uh, operation was not successful and I ended up losing my entire vision in my right eye. Now, see, this was the time when I, as a kid, I was seven year old. I didn't really understand what was happening. I obviously understood that I was going through some sort of injury, but it didn't really change my life as far as my social setting was concerned. I still did play cricket uh, instead of telling people that, uh, uh, you know, I bet well, I started saying that I'm a spinner. I bowl well. Uh, I, I started going to a special school. I uh, joined the school in Jaipur, which was for visually impaired students. Now, two things happened there. One is they asked me to restart my education from first standard. Something which I did not take nicely. Right. Uh, and second, for some odd reason, and we all know how it works. It was a nonprofit organization, right? So for some odd reason, we had multiple people visiting us looking at us in classes, studying, and generally commenting and basically appreciating our, appreciating the fact that we are studying. Now, take this in context of me as a kid who never got appreciated, who always had his fair bit of mar. I just didn't know why I was being appreciated for just studying. And it was not like I was, like I was doing well, I was just studying. The entire environment which was in that school was around pity and sympathy right i that point of time obviously i did not know what that meant but the environment was around that only thing i knew at that point of time was that i want to power through this i only wanted to reach back the standard where all my batchmates and peers and friends were so i powered through that phase uh, i 
I changed my school. I went to Jodhpur. Uh, uh, I took admission to into the hostel. That aggravated things because now I was not a daily scholar and was not coming back home every day. So I was just in hostel. What ended up happening was that I numbed one side of me. I uh, I have gone through school, law school, couple of years of law firm, and I just never acknowledged that I had visual impairment. I think today is the first time I'm speaking in public and acknowledging that I have visual impairment. I didn't want to acknowledge it. I thought it limits me uh, by a lot, and I just wanted to power through it. You know what happens when you have a fear or shame of something? It, it takes you over. Uh, if you don't talk about your fear or your shame, it just takes everything over in your life and your life becomes, uh, you, you just start reacting and you don't do well. I was one of those kids who just had problem with everything which idea I was doing. Anything they asked me to do, anything which uh, which any policy, any strategy, I used to raise pro like objections with anything or everything. And uh, I was also IDA team leader for two years. I remember a particular incident. Uh, this was in third year, 2015, when somebody had written my profile to be published on IDA website. I didn't agree with the content. So I wrote a very nasty email back. Shamnath sir was copied on that email. He called me back. He told people to give me some space. I've had multiple interactions with Shamnath sir after that on in general storytelling or just motivating kids, uh, telling them what I, uh, what I, what my law school journey is like, how I'm, how was it doing in law firm, but I just never spoke about it. I didn't like it. I thought I was not doing anything extraordinary to talk about it. Right. One thing which Shamnath sir had in him was that he, he lived with compassion, right? He practiced compassionate life. He had that life. He lived that by that principle every single day. And he had mastery over empathy. He listened to people and he never forced me at, at th that point of time to do anything which I didn't agree with. I'm sure he didn't agree with a lot of my opinions, but he never did. He gave me that space and security. And that's what IDI overall did for me. You know, it has taken multiple years, rock solid friendships and family, and couple of years in therapy to even acknowledge that I have visual impairment. I just didn't want to acknowledge it. Another thing which I want to highlight is what often happens is that we tend to think that if there's a disabled person, we will end up patronizing that person or offending that person. So we run away from connection. You know, pity and compassion are near enemies. So is sympathy and empathy. When you, when you don't exercise, when you exercise sympathy, or when you express sympathy uh, to somebody, you are basically telling them that you are not at equal footing as me and you're talking down, which does not go well and does not work. So uh, what IDIA did and has been doing, uh, apart from the tangible benefits which you can see, is that it sensitized a lot of people I, I can tell you from my own experience that there are so many IDI volunteers across law schools who have gotten a chance to make connection, who understand what empathy is, who know how to talk, and who have been making sincere attempt to make this world an inclusive place. I work at a law firm. Law firms are known to be uh, not that great, but I've come across people who have been working hard, who have not even let's let's not even talk about the part that where they're doing some stuff they're just being there and being there means a lot uh so i think that that's that's two part basically where idea has helped me in uh, being the safety and security and also according to me in changing the world and making it a bit more inclusive thank you
Thank you, Yugal, and thank you also for, uh, I think it's only appropriate that your first speech around a reflection on IDIA is happening at, has happening at Nalsar and is happening with me. <laughs> so I, I would sort of, but I, I just wanted to take this uh, conversation a little further and point you to the fact of that, you know, the, the acquisition of disability is seen as a disaster because that's how we most of the time present it. So when a person suddenly from a non-disabled status becomes a person with disability, exactly what that does to that individual is, I think, what Yugal has shared with us. And also to the fact of that uh, compassion or empathy is not something which has to be exclusively dished out for people with disabilities. If we just operate in that manner, in how we do our daily business. And on a similar kind of thing is that, okay, you did mischief, then if you did mischief, whether you did it as a person with disability or not, you get the same kind of disciplining. It's an equally important part of respect and dignity that when you do something wrong, you need to be also pulled up for it. If you're not pulled up for it, and you're appreciated for doing substandard stuff, it is in some manner disrespectful. It's, it's it, to say that, yes, you know, like when it happened to him as a seven year old, you didn't really know, ki, okay, how your world in some way is supposed to be changing. We've also had, you know, people with uh, blindness talking about the fact of that I don't see myself as differentiating as, you know, that I am as normal as. It's like I am normal because for me, being blind is normal. It's, that you don't ask humans that why can't you fly? Because not to be able to fly is normal. So similarly, if you are blind and you can't see, that's normal. And I think those are the factors which uh, Yugal is stressed on. We need to sort of reflect further and I'm hoping we'll have more conversation on that what are the various ways in which when people are supposedly being kind, how they kill with kindness and what is the kind of kindness that we need to be having extending all around us? Because the idea is not only about people with disabilities, it's about all disadvantaged, it's about all marginalized groups. And it's saying that there is an alliancing somewhere in maybe marginality, but I would say that there is an alliance, a solidarity that somewhere can be built when we start appreciating each other's diversity. I say it every time, but before I hand it to the next speaker, I still also want to say that Nalsar is possibly one of the few institutions which extends reasonable accommodation, not just to its students with disability, it extends it to all students because you recognize the fact that one size does not fit all. And we need to customize on a constant kind of basis if inclusion, if, if, self, if plurality and inclusion are to be like be made the norm, not the exception. So with that, I kind of move on to Yash, who is at the moment a final year student at Nalsar, and who's had his share of travails on, uh, you know, that okay, IDIA gets you in, but evidently just getting you into law school is not inclusion. You necessarily need uh, many more doors to be opened and much, much more of expansion of understanding, I would say, and an understanding of the diversity of competence. Yash. A very pleasant morning to one and all present over here. It's my pleasure to be here today in front of esteemed faculties, as well as uh, my fellow students, as well as judges. Um, today, I'm here to speak about something which I think a lot of us may not uh, know that happens in the legal market, right? But before going on to that, I would like to uh, speak about the initiative that IDIA has taken. IDIA has always been one organization which helps persons with disabilities as well as persons from other marginalized communities to enter the law school, right? But 
that's not only one aspect where person with disabilities might be disadvantaged. Uh, obviously, with respect to law schools, there are various uh, factors which are required to be taken into consideration. Let's say the exorbitant fees that the law schools charge, or let's say other kind of disadvantages that uh, you know students studying here might face. And that's where IDIA's initiative comes in, right? Now, uh, when uh, I was in my 10th grade, I was not aware what all reasonable accommodations we need to take into consideration as person with disabilities, right? I was just only aware that there was some uh, requirement of giving extra time to students with disabilities, right? And at that time, I was not one who was aware about, uh, who was aware how to use a laptop, right? And my mother used to dictate me uh, a lot of things that, uh, you know, I was to study on, right? And other things might be taken care of by my peers. But when it actually came to the law school, I had uh, no parents to give me supporting vision, right? And I had uh, no one here apart from the professors who can understand me. And this is where my law school journey actually started. In 2019, when I entered this uh, space, uh, I asked for some accessible materials, right, uh, which got massively delayed. And due to this, I suffered a lot of, uh, you know, problems with respect to my examinations, etc. Now, when it came to all of these issues, uh, I, I, I was very vocal about this, that, you know, we should be getting uh, modules in an accessible format, right, so that we can get equal opportunity to work for, uh, you know, study here. Now, COVID as a pandemic has been very bad for all of us, right? But for me, it helped a bit as well. Because this time was one time where I studied how to use a laptop, started making projects on computers, started taking notes on my laptop, right? This helped me a lot with respect to understanding the technology. And after that, I did not face any other issue. But to ensure that no one actually faces these kinds of issues in our university. IDIA mooted the idea of an accessibility lab, which got completed in 2022, right? Uh, and this helped a lot of uh, students to basically access the modules in a very accessible format, converting them into OCR format, right? Converting them into Braille, et cetera. Now, uh, th this is what my law school journey has been, but Law school journey for anyone does not just happen because of the law school studies which we do. It also depends on internships and finally your recruitments. And this is my main theme for this particular discussion. I did apply to a lot of uh, law firms, including tier one law firms, judicial internships, chambers, litigation offices, etc. But uh, I, I used to get a lot of rejections from almost every law firm, maybe because I was very young back then to apply them, right? But when this actually started and our RCC and ICC used to take out applications, I did get into a few uh, tier one law firms as an intern. Now, as, an, as a tier one law firm, we would expect that the firms might be very inclusive and sensitive about all of these aspects because the partners or the associates who are working there have gone through or have seen probably how person with disabilities might be affected if the environment is not accessible to them. Now, um, this whole law firm uh, angle, which uh, I was really interested in uh, to join, changed everything with respect to one internship. Now, this internship was in a tier one law firm where one of the associate was very insensitive about uh, my disabilities and, you know, pass some very insensitive remarks. Now, taking note of this, I did uh, go to the HR department as well as the partner, but the HR department cross questioned me and asked me as to why did you not inform us about the disability? I told them that this is something which is mentioned in my CV and I did mention to you in the interview process as well. And then they very, I, I don't know what they were thinking and did they even think of when they replied to this. They said that we need 1000 CVs a day. And that's why we, we may forget this, right? That is something which we did not, at, at least I did not expect from a tier one law firm HR department. Then um, with respect to another law firm, there was some issue 
in uh, using Citrix. And on the day of orientation, I asked them if uh, the Citrix app, uh, Citrix application is accessible to person with disabilities with respect to screen reading. The HR went to the went out of the room and scolded our RCC as to why did not why did they not inform uh, that this person has a disability, right? And these all experiences led me to think that you know law firms are not something which I'm made for, right? Um, with respect to recruitment, again, because um, I really wanted to take a job, I applied for recruitments into various law firms. I did sit for day zero, and day zero became my worst experience. Because at that time, the law firms used to say during the interview that this is one of the best interview we could see. Or would tell the RCC that, you know, he's a very bright candidate, but we cannot take him for now, without obviously telling any reasons of the same. Now. Why is it something which should be there? Every job applications which you see today talks about people having problem solving abilities, people being able to work in a team, people being able to work as a team leader, right? These are the criteria for having a job or maybe, you know, seeing that what kind of interviews might go in. I'd like to point out that we as person with disabilities are nature's problem solvers. And this is the reason why we have those kinds of abilities to solve any kind of problems in front of us. Because the world has been desi designed keeping us out of the picture, right? And that's where this whole question comes in as to, you know, how uh, the people are not sensitized, etc. Now, I was reading a book very recently called The Corporate Commercial. Uh, corporate confidential and this book basically helped me to understand why the law firms or any kind of corporation does this they look for some threats which might occur when it comes to employment of person with disabilities or other persons so to say there are three reasons why law firms or any corporations might be skeptical of hiring person with disabilities one is of course the fact that it might increase their cost in terms of providing reasonable accommodation right Second would be the fact of an actual litigation cost, right? Because if anything goes wrong with a person with disability, it is not just monetary loss to the uh, company because of the litigation, but also a reputational harm which they go into, right? Basically saying that, you know, the company has not been sensitive to person with disabilities, so to say. One third problem which uh, happens here is, of course, with respect to the sens sensitization of senior managers or senior partners, right? Uh, this, I think, um, has been explained very well and, you know, not in a, uh, the Supreme Court judgment of V. Surendra Mohan versus State of Tamil Nadu, which, of course, has been overruled, but had talked about areas where, you know, uh, person with visual impairment or hearing impairment cannot become person with, uh, cannot become judges of the courts, right? And the court said that due to the fact that they do not have assistive technology available, right, they will not be able to perform the duties which a judge is required to perform. Now, this judgment was overruled in the uh, further ruling of Vikash Kumar versus UPSC, where the court basically held that, you know, assistive technology is available with us today, right? And this is one point which Justice Manshur Ali Shah yesterday also referred to. Right, with when he was talking about civil services examinations being non accessible to person with disabilities because of their disability, right? Uh, but now the, the issue which further comes up is that the right and that the declaration of right of disabled person defines a disabled person as someone who is not able to ensure by himself wholly or partly necessities of a normal individual. Right. I would like to basically go further as to what Dana was saying just before my speech as to why do we need to normalize, right? We are a diverse set of people with all of our differences and all of us are different in that manner, right? And due to these differences, we get to know each other's opinion quite well or each other's opinions do matter in this case, right? That is the reason why we should not normalize and let us start celebrating what we have today. Thank you.
You know, we often say that uh, what is good for disability is good for humanity. And I think the entire narrative we got from Yash, be it in relation to the cussedness of the administration or the kind of difficulties that you're encountering as you go along and the necessity for uh, being able to, you know, to have, let's say, a listening ear, which is going to be saying what needs to be set right. If you're accepting this fact of diversity, then I think the challenge for us as educators is how do we diversify our teaching and other methodologies? Instead of having, I mean, I think in the previous panel, we were having this bemoaning of wanting to come up with some one uniform way of addressing uh, how people should be running their relationships. And I think this business of uniformity or one size or one rule, uh, and to be sort of like insisting on seeing the world from where you stand as a person in a position of power. That calling out has to be happening on a constant kind of basis and needs to be happening from as many, you know, like I would say as many diverse uh, perspectives as we can bring in there. The Yash was, the, that's one dimension of it. The other, as I was listening to you, Yash, I was reminded of uh, Sukhdev Thorat's study, you know, where when they had made those applications, when they made, to, made those applications as Dalits to private um, institutions or, or companies or corporations, one where you were declaring the fact of your Dalitness and one where you were not, you were only talking in terms of your caliber and capability and what you have done. And they, their, their experience as such was that where they did not make disclosure, they were called for interviews. And at the interview stage, you know, it's like their heart sank as to who have we gone on and invited. And the other is the, you know, like where, the, in where they had kind of disclosed their marginal or their, their so-called, you know, uh, excluded status, you were not even called. So your experience when you're talking in terms of these, the various human rights, ad, you know, advocates, uh, human rights uh, managers being very, or the human resource department being very upset by the fact as to why were we not told that this person is a person with disability? They've just looked at the CGPAs and they've called on that basis and then found that, oh, they should have read maybe the CV more clear, carefully or clearly. But I think it's giving us one more evidence of the fact that that prejudice, whether you want to admit to it or not, that ableist prejudice exists. And then you trip people up in the manner that where they have only looked at CGPA, found your CGPA to be impressive and hence invited you, and then found that you're confronted with a person with disability. They have to now suddenly walk talk and they can't do it. So necessarily the fault is found in the person who's there in, in the whole interview process and the kind of uh, exclusion that you inflict on that count. Uh, it kinds of also is not particularly uh, nice for anybody to be saying that, you know, um, I'm, I'm good despite my disability. I've had a very uh, sort of an interesting experience on that count of where I had, uh, you know, called for a blind conference and uh, the sort of feeling that you all are getting, you know, the post perandial thing of after the, the lunch is over and if you have your lecture at that point of time, because it was a conference of blind people, one by one, each one went off and had their small nap. And I was just, I didn't know how to deal with it, you know, with having so many people cheerfully sleeping in front of me and feeling that if they can't see me, I can't see them. The next day, my uh, blind friend was doing the lecture and they slept, they woke up, he carried on, there was no problem. And, and I suddenly sort of like it was like, I was then starting to be introduced as sighted hai, but achi hai, you know, so it's like there's a way of uh, your experience can play out in so many sort of ways. But I think it tells us all, all the time that each of us adjusts into the world we are born into and believe that the whole world is like that. I think disability more than any other 
offensive compels us to see that diversity, because that diversity doesn't exist only between the disabled and the non-disabled, it, it in Achmas is in, included within the disability sector. It's like requiring to be understanding another person with disability, not just that all people with disability can be sort of clubbed up together because they all have similar sort of needs. So if we want to, and I think one of the uh, questions which is of concern to this year's version of courts and constitution is this factor of that how do you deal with, you know, how do you sort of address the whole issue of inclusion? whether it is in the federal setup at one level, whether it is in relation to sort of maybe giving equality of funding to everyone, whether it's what we were discussing this morning in, in the context of what can we expect from courts and not, and the last session, the equality session. I'm, I'm sort of very deliberately wanting to say that, listen, this is, uh, we are using this session as a way of what we as people can be doing in relation to policy and what our own initiatives, what sort of opportunities of reflection they give us. And on that note, I'm moving to my third speaker, Anup, who's kind of going to, who's graduated from NLUD, and who's done a book which talks in terms of how being a blind person, the blessing of being blind. And that's more in, to do with the fact of that, all right, I am bringing a certain set of strengths because you don't know them doesn't mean they don't exist. Anup. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I thank Nalsar for firstly conducting this conference. And I'm immensely grateful to the CAC committee, along with Amita Ma'am and Siddharth Sir, for giving me uh, this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it is indeed a privilege for me to be speaking in front of legal luminaries and established personalities. And therefore, and because Yugal and Yash have very well, and in the morning Rahul very well articulated the issues associated in uh, issues in the society with respect to people with disability, I would slightly go in a different direction and try to talk about the impact that IDIA has created and why other institutions need to get into this field if they really intend to ensure inclusion in other aspects. So this, this panel is in sitting in the memory of Professor Shamnath Bashir and I consider myself the perhaps the closest example of what he intended to achieve through increasing diversity by increasing access. And therefore, I feel that in order to make every person who is underprivileged by virtue of any kind of disability must be given equal opportunity in whatever aspects of life that person is. Since IDIA is limited in the legal sector, therefore, I feel that the scale of operation and the idea of IDIA must get into and must permeate the other sectors of the society if we look at the population figures. So as per the last census data available to us from 2011, the estimate is that 2.21% of the total population are persons with disability, which in present context translates to about somewhat 3 crore people in India. This data in itself is already contested, even if we were to ignore these contestations. This is surely, this number is surely going to rise because when the last enumeration was done, it was done for merely for seven kind of disabilities under recognized under 1995 act, but the 2016 act has increased the number of disabilities by 200% from seven to 21. So this number is going to rise whenever the next census will be conducted. And therefore there is a need to let other fields also be included and do something about them. 
And therefore I ask what exactly has the institutions like courts and the law and perhaps the executives done to provide us the facility. So therein, I look at the case of Rajiv Raturi versus Union of India, wherein the court came up with certain guidelines that the public institutions had to comply with in order to ensure accessibility. In pursuance of that, UGC released a circular asking all the educational institutions to file a compliance report before June 2019. After this deadline in October, I sought an information through RTI from UGC asking them as to how many NLUs have filed the compliance report. And I was shocked to know that only CNLU had done so. This is not to suggest that others would not have done anything in terms of ensuring accessibility and providing reasonable accommodation, but to assess as to what extent the work has been done and the work needs to be done. It is really important for these reports to be filed or as such bodies can think of conducting accessibility audits in these institutions. This judgment and the related RTI that I filed underscores the very limitation, the limitations inherent on the implementation side of the law. Therefore, I am of the opinion that it is not just the responsibility of any particular institution, but it is a responsibility of all, perhaps includes voluntary assumption of responsibility on the part of individuals to walk towards the line of reasonable accommodation. And this is also because different people with different disabilities may have different experiences and people with different degrees of disabilities will have different experiences. Just to give you an example, in a classroom environment, me being a visual impa visually impaired student would naturally expect my professors to be a little louder when they are giving us the lectures or perhaps use bikes. At the same time, someone with hearing impairment would want the professors to stand in front of them so that they can track the movement of their lips and read through. Similarly, since I can't see both because I have 100% disability, someone with 55% of disability can see the board. So therefore, this requires an attitude change, which I don't think the stick part of the law can enforce. It is the persuasion that needs to be done and which is what Professor Basir sought to do and ID institutions like IDIA is trying to do. Now I come to the employment part, which is really interesting. You know, when I appeared for the interview, it was the first and last interview that I appeared. Unfortunately, when my company announced the list of selected people whom they had interviewed, my name was not there. They took about 15 days to confirm whether this guy is of any utility to us or not, whether he'll be able to work on system or not. And this is quite unfortunate because I was being interviewed online. Right. So the recruiters even had a doubt to the extent whether this guy has been able to log in to the tool that we are using for interview independently or has he taken help from somebody. So therefore, the employment scenario, because of the reasons highlighted by Yash and perhaps also highlighted very beautifully in the morning by Rahul, it's not that great and which is reflected in the report published by Economic Times in August 2023, which said that the Nifty 50 has reported that out of 50, only five companies are there who have at least one or more than one person as their employee having one or the other disability. And out of these five, Four of them are PSUs who are bound by the RPD Act of ensuring, of reserving seats for persons with disabilities. So then the question is, 
where exactly is the problem? And I will not emphasize much on this. This is more to do about what exactly is reasonable accommodation. To my understanding, it is not just about equipping us with accessible tools and technology so that we can function or creating physical infrastructure in the building so that we can operate independently. It is also about some sort of constant support that needs to be put in place, which requires expenditure on the part of these companies and these sectors. For example, everyone is using some sort of data room or tool or web-based applications or web-based platforms. Because of the internal requirement of the companies and uh, to maintain the security postures, these have to be constantly updated and upgraded. When this is done, the accessibility part or, to, or the compatibility part of this gets ignored. So can we really push or pull the corporate sectors to sort of make an expenditure in order to fix this issue? Again, in this scenario, I'm not a watery of going the court's way or maybe the litigation way to get this done. Because if this is done, the problem is the people would take to maintaining the optics and not really getting onto the ground to work. For example, somebody may be able to see the screen with just 42% of disability, right? He is or she is a person with disability. And that companies would be fine with, but why would the companies hire somebody with 100% of disability? Because in that case, they will definitely have to do something more for them. I think in my personal experience, my look towards disability has been different. I have been very assertive about my disability and I've really hardly cared about what the person in front thinks of me. And because I have received the uh, inclusive education throughout the life, thanks to an institution called National Association for the Blind, and later on the IDIA, today I am able to speak whatever I'm able to speak because of a conversation of mine with Professor Bashir, wherein he told me, go on speaking whatever you want. And that is what I am being to I am following till now. And, men, and, 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 and this is something that gets reflected when I interact with my bosses. They are of the opinion that I should come out of the hangover of the college. So with this, I think I leave you with those thoughts. And uh, thanks to Nalsa, thanks everyone for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Anoop. I agree. When I, like I'm saying, the theme that I am carrying on as moderator is primarily just this, that this business of speaking out and this business of coming out and asserting and demanding what you are entitled to, I think is, is something that has to be learned by every excluded group and every silenced person. So if you were to see it as just that kind of a conversation, that you know, all of us are scared the first time we want we want to say what we think and believe. And yet, when someone comes and maybe does one level of holding of hand and tells you it's okay to disagree, it's okay to call out, it's important to dissent. And I think your speech this morning, as I mean, and, and I mean it's kind of great. I've I said I'm at any anyway, I can say we are horrible at filing any kind of returns. So if we didn't file that one, it's uh, got more to do with, I, sometimes you have, you know, the most disobedient followers of law, people from law. So possibly that is an example for, 
And I think it's also ironical, just shows you what stereotypes that the, the, the law school which filed was CNLU, and we talk in terms of Bihar and Patna and not that that is the infringing kind of community, but just shows you that actually infringement is maybe more rife. And But I, I just wanted to take this one thought away from what Anup was saying. One is that uh, if we were to see this session as an important to start reflecting on how much of freedom of discourse and how much of agreement, disagreement do we nurture in our educational spaces? And it's not just about like, maybe at some level in, with, with identity politics and what have you, if you are belonging to a marginalized community, you at least have your own community which is telling you to speak up. Whereas for people who come in from the so-called majoritarian sections, for you to differ or disagree is in some ways more difficult. In some ways, I'm not saying at all, I'm not in any way denying the other things, but I want us to keep that thought in mind and to sort of see in terms of the, the narrative that each, each speaker is unfolding, does it in any way speak to you too? And it's not just seen as some quintessential disability experience. Keeping that in mind, I now turn to the, I would say my colleague on the panel and somebody who I recognize as one of the foremost uh, disability studies scholars in the country, uh, Dr. Shilpa Anand, who would sort of reflect on both I mean, as such, on what the speakers have spoken, should also make a comparison with other IDIA-like experiments which have been working out in other parts of the country. Very often it is like we don't know. Uh, if we don't know something, we believe it's not happening. So from both those perspectives, Shilpa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Danda, and thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here. Uh, it's an honor to speak uh, on a panel that uh, critically celebrates the initiative of uh, uh, Shamnath Bashir, someone I did not have the fortune of knowing. Uh, in what I say, I will reflect on what the speakers before me have said uh, about diversity and inclusion initiatives uh, from my disciplinary location of disability studies. Uh, which is an interdisciplinary field of study that centers uh, disability. So if there are uh, one or two things I have uh, found very significant um, in disability studies, uh, one is that uh, it is the person with disability who is the expert and not the uh, you know, medical practitioners or uh, other practitioners that we come across. I think that's been proved uh, uh, by this uh, panel. And uh, so, uh, the centering of the experiences of people with disabilities uh, in order to think about any initiative uh, becomes very uh, significant. Uh, so uh, building on Yash's observation uh, that even if impairments are similar among people uh, in an educational institution or organization, disability experiences depend on factors that include socioeconomic capability, gender, caste, and other social orientations, along with the role of the individual as student, uh, teacher, employee, uh, etc. Uh, this needs to be uh, factored in. Uh, within disability studies, we speak of this as the social model, as something that uh, allows us to think about disability in terms of that encounter between uh, the individual and various kinds of barriers. Um, and when one determines disability on the basis of impairment, uh, it is called the medical model uh, approach. And uh, if you're familiar th with the Vikash Kumar uh, judgment, you'll know that uh, you know, it's a tussle between uh, these two that actually uh, plays out, uh, that uh, a certain kind of uh, reasonable accommodation is denied uh, because the disability is only uh, computed in terms of um, you know, medical ability or ability that can be determined medically. And uh, uh, so it's that uh, idea of the benchmark disability that's taken into consideration, but uh, uh, later the uh, judgment actually comes in uh, favor of thinking about disability uh, uh, in terms of the various kinds of encounters that 
uh, students with disabilities face um, at various levels, be it in the entrance exam or uh, later. I think uh, everyone here has spoken about uh, different kinds of barriers and also that barriers are not necessarily only in terms of physical infrastructure uh, or sensory infrastructure, but uh, also that uh, uh, they need to factor in uh, emotional aspects uh, and uh, also uh, social aspects. So um, I think one of the major uh, challenges that has not been addressed by a lot of educational institutions uh, is uh, what is reasonable accommodation when we think of it in the non-physical sense, uh, right? When we're not thinking of it in terms of uh, providing uh, a certain kind of a tactile pathway uh, or uh, you know having a scribe uh, and so on. So uh, there have been conversations around uh, mental health. Uh, I'm guessing across institutions, it surely uh, has come up in mind. It keeps coming up uh, again and again. Uh, and uh, very often uh, we find that uh, it, it's easier to individualize questions of mental health than to think of it in uh, structural terms where uh, it may in fact be uh, a certain kind of an oppressive structure that uh, you know is causing uh, distress uh, to occur. So, um, so uh, the concern has been that uh, certain impairment experiences or certain disability experiences get over medicalized, uh, whereas certain disability experiences can still be uh, thought of in terms uh, of uh, the social model and how uh, you know it is the uh, stigma and other kinds of barriers that are in fact um, inhibiting uh, progress of uh, any kind. So within this uh, context, reasonable accommodation has been uh, a very significant uh, quality and has been uh, argued uh, in different ways. But I think what left, uh, what is left to be imagined, and this uh, imagination is an important part of living with disability. I think we have panel members who have spoken about how um, all disabled people are problem solvers. They have to get creative because they're living in a, a world which is uh, um, already uh, inaccessible and needs to be uh, navigated. So what needs to be imagined uh, is uh, things in terms of neurodivergence or uh, living with mental distress, uh, either that has a diagnosis or no diagnosis. Uh, and uh, what, what then is the reasonable accommodation that one can uh, demand? And uh, how, uh, how do we imagine that institutions will uh, address it? Now, uh, in what my panel members have said, I've also noted, noted that there are uh, non-academic ableist structures that operate on each uh, one of us in very different uh, ways. These are ones that don't uh, come up in, uh, in terms of the teaching learning material being inaccessible, but they're more in uh, terms of how classrooms uh, themselves may operate in uh, uh, ableist uh, manner. So I'm thinking here, of a situation where uh, someone with uh, severe anxiety feels uh, uh, feels a ter feels terrified to actually make a presentation uh, in front of an audience, uh, right? So, uh, what would the structural barrier there be identified as, and can we address it? So, this brings me to the um, um, point that I wanted to talk about, which is how do disciplines. Uh, reorganize themselves, or how should we expect academic disciplines uh, to revise themselves uh, uh, in in relation to disability? Um, now, this would be um, a, um, a method that is counter to the usual one, uh, and the usual one is that uh, all disabled people have to be mainstreamed. So you push disabled people, uh, and we've had several instances uh, of that already discussed. So you push them into uh, doing STEM in certain ways, doing law in certain ways, doing engineering uh, in certain ways, or even literature for that uh, matter. Uh, so I think the, uh, the question that's very important for me as an educator and also as someone who works in these interdisciplinary uh, fields is uh, to what extent do disciplines take on the challenges uh, and uh, how do they uh, address them. Uh, one of the uh, initiatives that I've seen is by uh, Satendra Singh, who's in the University College of Medical Sciences in uh, Delhi. And his way of addressing it is to um, initiate medical humanities within standard medical education, uh, right? So uh, the uh, long medical program that there is uh, will take on 
uh, electives or uh, other kinds of um, you know sections of regular papers uh, to include medical humanities uh, which draws attention to things like uh, sociology of illness and uh, medicine uh, also the um, uh, critical uh, rethinking of doctor patient relations uh, and so on so these are inserted uh, uh, into medical education. Another initiative that I wanted to share about uh, is something that is beginning at the IIT Madras, and this is led by uh, Dr. Hemachandran Kara, Dr. Saji Matthew, um, Dr. Vasa, and others. And what they are proposing uh, is to organically evolve toolboxes by disabled people uh, to enable different disciplines to adapt uh, to disabilities. So, uh, Hemachandran, um, he uh, he's also a collab collaborator, which is why I'm speaking of him uh, uh, with the first name, uh, has um, put in place certain uh, pedagogical initiatives already within his classroom, which uh, include, uh, you know, his experience uh, of being a blind scholar uh, of literature and uh, therefore the methods that he would uh, use to teach um, poetry, let's say, uh, to blind students uh, because he's familiar with that impairment uh, effect and the disability experiences thereof, but he's also familiar with that field. So what they're trying to do through this Center for Inclusion uh, is to uh, collate together uh, video resources for various teachers to uh, teach very specific disciplines uh, to people with a particular kind of impairment effects. Uh, so uh, he was talking to me about it and saying that uh, he, he has no clue how he might teach the same poem uh, to a student who has identified as autistic while he may be able to uh, teach it to a student who's identifying as blind. So he would want the resource input of uh, somebody who, uh, you know, is a self-advocate, uh, but also, uh, you know, works in poetry uh, to communicate uh, that. Uh, so um, I thought that uh, this is one such initiative that um, takes forward, um, um, you know, uh, something that was begun in IDIA maybe, but in other different ways. I don't think Hemat Andankara knows about IDIA, but then we also see that uh, all of these initiatives uh, emerge or evolve organically, which is something that is very necessary uh, while we're uh, thinking of uh, locales such as this that we work in. Uh, I want to conclude um, by reflecting on the fact that um, thinking, <laughs> sorry. Thinking about and working on uh, accessibility initiatives, uh, in fact, uh, allows us to uh, critically reflect on what merit is. Uh, to some extent, this work has been done within caste studies uh, in terms of uh, Satish Deshpande's work and uh, Ajanta Subramanian's work. But uh, I was uh, uh, thinking that it's also necessary to do it within the context of um, uh, uh, disability and uh, think of how uh, many times it's uh, very flimsy um, notions of merit that are uh, forcing this kind of mainstream of mainstreaming of disabled people uh, to write uh, write an exam in a certain way or to um, uh, you know to respond to assessment techniques um, in the way that the assessment techniques want them to respond to, uh, but not challenge the uh, status quo. I think challenging of status quo was something Rahul Bajaj spoke about when he spoke of the principles that came out of the uh, Supreme Court accessibility uh, report, uh, which uh, I think is a significant um, uh, you know, area in which uh, academics can uh, contribute. Thank you. So uh, you've heard all the speakers, and I think what is coming to us majorly is that evidently uh, there is a lot to be said for such like initiatives, like the IDI initiative is one, and we are also right up to publicly reflecting on its uh, what all it kind of opened up for people. Shilpa's uh, intervention now is also demonstrating to us what are the other ways in which we can be deepening the whole access, 
the whole intrusion experience. So I would think that um, it would be appropriate at this time for me to open up the panel to the house and have you both maybe, you know, converse or dialogue with the panelists, but also bring in your own perspectives on possibly what is the way forward, what are the way in which we, these things should be happening. And I, I'm, I'm sort of stressing this on an again and again basis that it's important for us to uh, foreground our own reflections and think further on them and not just reflect on what administrations and people in authority can to do. So with that in mind, I'm opening up this panel, uh, this uh, to the house. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Even uh, so I guess uh, it comes from a position of question, uh, questioning only. So I have had the privilege of uh, I've had the privilege of uh, involved in a lot of peer review rights issues through my internships and stuff. Uh, I have two questions essentially. Uh, so one of them might sound a little academic, but so uh, if you Article Twenty Nine of CNCRPD uh, mandates the state. Hello. Uh, so, uh, so first of the question that come to my mind is the so article and this come based off a conversation that I've had. So Article Twenty Nine of UNCRPD uh, mandates that the state uh, uh, incentivizes political representation. Uh, so I was I had the privilege of being in the last annual meet on implementation of RBWD Act uh, in Delhi in November twenty twenty three. And uh, it had secretaries of ministries and CCPDs and SCPDs and everything. So uh, this conversation came out there, and it, it was recognized that uh, reserving seats in legislative assemblies that's near impossible. But something which the state can be convinced to do, pragmatically speaking, is to uh, reserve places in political organizations, positions of power in political uh, organizations, primarily political parties. So uh, that is something that can enhance the perspectives because it was a realization that the those who are in the legislature uh, and even the executive per se don't don't have any idea as to uh, the problems faced by persons with disabilities. That was one thing. Uh, another thing, in light with Dr. Handa, as you mentioned regarding solidarity, uh, uh, that needs to be out there and. Uh, it uh, it may, might reflect my own uh, uh, lack of understanding as to just being limited to seeing authorities as something uh, which can bring upon a change. So this is again from a personal uh, uh, information that I have. So I am personally aware of a high-ranking executive in the Ministry of Social Justice, Justice and Empowerment who categorically instructed to remove recommendations which would have recognized. Uh, so this is concerning a report on improving RPWD Act. And he categorically instructed to remove recommendations recognizing uh, intersectionality of a person with disability and their uh, and their transgender identity uh, that not needed to be brought in line with the Transgender Act. And now I come in this place where I we already have this idea of seeing authorities as something that that will implement the act that will bring upon change. Um, so, but these institutions are run by people who who have shown that I cannot trust them. So. Uh, I, I just face this moral dilemma. I, I try to never confront it personally. Uh, and uh, obviously, I was told he never sell this to anyone. And I've made sure that his identity is not revealed. Uh, but I'm saying this for the first time. I, this lack of trust institutions, how do we go about this? How do we go about this? I guess these are my two questions. So, yeah. uh, good afternoon. So uh, to the three young panelists here, uh, I've kind of seen a, a different kind of a disability. I've probably lived with a disability for many years. I've been in the construction industry for over 20 years. And uh, I couldn't see that there are two kinds of Indias. You know, the India that is have and the India that doesn't have, and the India that has an inclusiveness, and the India that does not include it at all. So, you know, uh, uh, the UDHR was formulated, um, came about at the backdrop of the world wars. And our constitution was written in the backdrop of independence. And our founding father, Dr. Ambedkar, very clearly you know, uh, looked into the 
non inclusive aspects of our society and said that you know right against discrimination and many rights came about and the right to you know abolish titles also came about but in india you will see there are many many titles and the titles that it is is sir everyone has to use sir or madam everywhere and it is like you know it is mandatory that a certain section of the society of the people have to address the people above in government offices they have to be addressed by sirs and madams and in the work environment the younger has to address as the seniors with sir and madam and the people who don't have have to be addressed you know with sirs and madams and even if you see in your environment around schools colleges everywhere the names akka anna aya ai whatever goes around why is that why is that why do you have to give a title to a driver as a driver when why in foreign countries if you go to western countries there is no question of you know addressing anyone with any kind of a title other than the name and you also see that in india we are very far away from all of us sitting on the same table and eating that's not the case outside so where can we start you know where can we start this aspect of like uh, uh, mr jain said sympathy and compassion don't go together you know you we the excluded or the marginalized sections of the population are not expecting sympathy from us or you know any kind of compassion aspects so what can the courts do can the courts or can the government offices start excluding this aspect of maintaining hierarchy to expect people that they don't use these uh, tag lines because you spoke about the inclusion ma'am and i think this is a very big problem i'm seeing respect of it as a sing one way street in, in our country not a two way street you know it it's not it's not going two ways and until that exists we don't see a a table of our aspirational equality arising in our country so i think there is ground work to be done to make that happen thank you oh ma'am ma'am here uh my uh, thank you panel for the wonderful discussion my question is of uh, both for mr J uh, mr yogal jain and yash uh it's about the recruitment process at least uh in the university level and i believe uh, your answer would be very valuable because the future recruitment coordination committees of nalsa would be listening can we have an uh, like and the answer would be coming both from a student who sat through the process a student who by the way is more able than most of the students i have met at nalsa and uh, yugal sir who who is in a firm right now what can be done sir at a student level at a you know at the university level at the firm level to ensure that what yash went through does not happen is there anything that can be done the committees may be uh, the entire process is there anything that can be done because uh, if, if being part of the icc and uh, currently also we are going to uh, start another recruitment process so is there anything that can be done to ensure that what yash went through does not happen again so uh there are a couple of things right uh one uh i i have a very different like i i know that there's a lot of work which needs to happen uh in in a lot of areas to ensure that everybody gets reasonable accommodations and we have inclusive policies but uh, i have a very different take on it i really don't i i think it can only be solved uh through uh positive conversation and through attitude of people right it 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 will change with education i i am of the sincere belief that everybody is doing the best at at their point of time given the circumstances they have uh because of lack, lack of education and lack of awareness this happens what we can do tangibly uh, for example in law firms first i i don't think uh, rcc uh, on campuses or anybody at law firm can really take that call whether you will be for example with yash whether you will be disclosing disability or not that's that's an individual call which uh, the person will take whether he intends to highlight his disability rcc really should not have a say in it uh, and how he tends to uh, deal with it when it comes to law firm i have worked at one of the i have worked at sirela merchant and i have worked at shardula merchant it's been 7 years i truly believe that once people understand what a uh, person is looking for they are more than willing to accommodate right cost is never an issue for these law firms arranging accessible arranging 
accessibility related instruments, for example, JAWS or Adobe Pro, et cetera, whatever person may need, uh, cost is never an issue. Let's, let's look at it from a corporate's perspective, right? I hire anybody. And if that I will sustain, that person will sustain and grow in that organization. If the person makes money for the company, simple, it's, it's simple Marwadi concept. If you don't make money for me, you, you, I can't give you money back. Now people right now at, are at a place where they are just not aware how exactly this person will fit in the environment. And that can only happen through internal, like I'll give an example at Sam, right? We have conversations regularly. Uh, about what can be changed and, uh, it takes time. I'm not saying that it happens in one day, but it takes time and things do change. So I would suggest that, uh, we, we should just keep having conversations. Uh, law firms are made of people who uh, graduate from these law schools and, uh, they, they are the one who can change things. Right. Um, I think I largely agree with uh, Yugal and uh, you know, uh, one of the very effective way by which this can be addressed is ensuring more visibility of people with various kinds of disabilities in different, different aspects of the society. For example, if today Yugal is uh, at a significant position and is being influencing of uh, uh, his bosses and his juniors. I don't think people who would have seen him work would ever hesitate to hire somebody with visual impairment. Same is the case that goes with my institution. At best, the hindering factor could be related to persuading organizations to sort of create that workable infrastructure. Because at times when you are in the big institutions, so for example, the institution that I work with has around 250,000 employees. That's very big and nothing depends in the hand of any single individual. So at best that could be a hindering factor, but I think that too can be addressed by creating more sensitization and more uh, awareness in the society as a part of RCC. Since I've been a part of RCC when I was uh, on campus, you could also perhaps think of creating awareness sessions with the recruiters. I think uh, that's it for me. Um, thank you. So I also largely agree with what Anoop and you will have to say. But apart from uh, the alternatives which uh, they have given, one another alternative to spread awareness in the law firms, maybe through NGOs, similar to IDIA. See, IDIA is only working with one aspect, which is making sure that people from marginalized communities get entry into the law uh, in, into the law schools. But IDIA has very little to do when it comes to recruitment in the law firms, right? And that's where since IDIA's resources are also very limited and most of them do get spent in uh, making sure that the people from marginalized community enter the law schools. I think more such initiatives are required at various junctures uh, if possible, right? Apart from it, uh, RCC and all again can only work so much and cannot basically affect the workings of the law firms, right? So that's something which I would like to add. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on the two comments we got? Because I'm kind of wrapping up the session. So I had only one thing to say to you, the person who was talking about political participation. That, you know, instead of beginning from the reservations end, it might be worthwhile to start looking much more at the consultation end and the fact of like how much of participation you give firstly to disabled people in their organizations in the making of policy. You know, it is true that if you are sitting in that position of authority, you would contribute maybe, maybe more, maybe less. 
But I think to create a normative uh, way of operating where you can't make a policy affecting a constituency without consulting the constituency. If this is, an, if this is a thought we can take from uh, disability rights, that about nothing about us without us, to all other ways in which uh, we function as a democracy, maybe there would be this one of the signal contributions that can come from disability rights. And I would say that instead of spending all our time and energy on like working out how we are going to do that reservation, where should that reservation be, if the whole right to participation dimension of disability rights was kind of uh, magnified, we may be in a better off place. Sometimes it's worth it. You know, it's like in the previous panel, you did have people say that maybe if we had gone in a staggered manner, we might have achieved more. It's, on the other hand, it's also true that if you don't have anyone kind of uh, making the big ticket statements and saying that this is how you have to be doing things, you really can't challenge imaginations. And we are primarily talking in terms of imaginations in a preconceived way of looking at things. The whole process of getting people into education, as well as deliberative panels like these, is to sort of shake up that way of thinking. I think we were trying to do that through this afternoon with you all. And we are also sort of wanting to do the administrators of the program the, a good service by having one panel at least finish nearly on time. So I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist that. <laughs> So thanks a lot. I think possibly sometimes it is like uh, important to give people time to reflect. And you had a lot of reflective thoughts coming in from the panelists, as well as the questions that came in from you, sir. I emphasize on that fact. It does work for this. If I call you, sir, and you call me, ma'am, we are fine. No. So I, I take your point. I absolutely agree. But I think as a oh, yes. culture, yeah. we are not very comfortable okay. with using first names. Okay. It's something that we have to also admit, you know, that we are not comfortable. Even with teachers who will say, call me by my first name, you would be finding ways around it and saying, no, I'll prefer to call you prof or I'll prefer to call you something else and all. So maybe that's some, it's an additional reflection point I will leave with you. So thank you, everyone. Just a round of applause for the panelists. Uh, I, I request Professor Dhanda to please hand over the small token of appreciation to our panelists. Uh, Mr. Yugal Jain. Mr. Anoop Kumar. Mr. Yash Jodani. And Professor Shilpa Anand. Uh, thank you, everyone. We will be taking a short 10 minute break. After that, we have a book discussion. So please be back on time. Uh, I request the panel to stay back for a while. The IDIA team wants the photo with you.
Sudah di sudah di sudah di ada
Hi everyone, please be settled. We're starting the book discussion now. Uh, the book is of law and life, uh, P Professor Upendra Bakshi, and we have Professor Sitaram Kakarla and Arvind Nayan, who will be starting this panel. Yeah, uh, thank you everybody for being here. We are here to talk a little bit about this book called uh, Of Law and Life. It's a uh, it's called uh, In Conversation with Upendra Bakshi. And just a little bit on what do we mean by a conversation, why a conversation with uh, Professor Upendra Bakshi. Uh, it's not exactly, obviously it's not an autobiography, he's not written it fully. It's not a biography either. It's somewhere in between. What do we mean by the somewhere in between? The idea of a conversation is somewhere the direction of the of the book goes in terms of the forms of questions we bring to the entire uh, Professor Bakshi himself, and the the why we thought a conversation with Professor Bakshi was important is I think all of you must have read enough of Professor Bakshi by now, and we have been very 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 big fans of uh, the spoken Professor Bakshi. The written Professor Bakshi sometimes can be very difficult and very dense. The early Professor Bakshi is very 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 easy for us to comprehend and to grasp. But later Professor Bakshi is a little difficult. But at the same time, you speak to him about what he's written, the later Professor Bakshi, he explains with a great deal of clarity and lucidity. So there's a way in which his conversation, I think there's a certain kind of a passion, there's a certain humor there, and there's a certain spontaneous erudition, which we thought would be quite lovely to capture in the form of a book. And so that's why this conversation happened in 2000 and a long time ago, 16 years ago. And over a period of time, we've been chatting with him, and the, this book is the final result of that, uh, that entire question, and the idea of capturing the oral voice of Professor Bakshi. Make a couple of other quick points on, on, the, on the book. See, often when you speak to someone in terms of an autobiography or a biography, right, uh, it, sometimes it can be very dull. Because it'll be like, and then I did this and I did that. I went to Nalsar, after that I went to the National Law School and then I went here and I went there. And you're like, that might be great in your life, but who cares? Beyond the point, why do I care why you go here, you, you go there? The What is so unique about Professor Bakshi is there's an internal dimension to his reflections, you know? And suddenly the book will suddenly say, you know, the other day I read Marx and that was the most incredible experience of my life. And the way he describes it is, I'm a teacher and I read Marx Capital Volume 2, and I could not understand what was there. And I felt a sense of almost a sense of trauma saying, I'm a teacher, I'm supposed to understand books, I don't understand this book. And from that emerges the idea that for Professor Bakshi, he says reading is a form of manthan, right? It's a form of churning. So the way he describes it, when you read something, it's not to produce a citational universe and somebody who's like, uh, who is a figure in your citational universe. You read something because that person transforms you. And that way, Marx transforms them, Gandhi transforms them, as does Ambedkar. And he describes this idea of reading as a form of self-transformation and the way in which your your the way in which you take your life changes or alters. And I thought that is really a very, very fascinating thing. Again, in some ways, it reminds you of the idea of, you know, of James Joyce's Ulysses, where the description is of a day in the person's life. But it's not just a day. That days, there's a history, there's memory, there's metaphor, there's a range of things that are attached to that day, making it much richer than just the events in a person's life. But of course, the events themselves are of great, great uh, significance and great importance. Be it the declaration of emergency, be it the emergence of the public interest litigation phenomena, be it the Mathura open letter, be it Bhopal, be it the 1990, uh, be it the Mandal agitation and his vice chancellor's trip during those days. These are the significant events through which he lived. And all these events, in a sense, also captured with that mix, mixture of a Bakshian sense of humor on the sense of humor maybe i'll just make crack I'll, I'll just make one joke which he told us and leave it at that and leave it for you to read the book the he was talking about uh he said the first the first and the last time ever he said he shrieked in the chamber of the chief justice he says he'd gone to the chief justice hidratullah's chamber and suddenly he shrieked and chief justice hidratullah asked him why why are you shouting like this he said i saw a rat chief justice hidratullah said i mean so what? A rat is a rat. Then uh, Professor Bakshi said, no, it is a really big rat. And Chief Justice Hudiyatullah's response was, I'm the Chief Justice of India. Our rats are, of course, going to be very big rats. And he says, the reason I got along so well with Justice Hudiyatullah 
is because you have the most lively sense of humor, which again links you to perhaps one predominant quality of Professor Bakshi, which one hopes he's going to be on campus, you have a chance to interact with him, get a sense of his really absolutely charming sense of humor, right? And, and humor again, what do you mean by humor? Humor is not just a question of, you know, uh, of a certain kind of, a, it's not a frivolous sentiment. Humor is a certain way in which you approach the world itself. It's a way in which you subtract a sense of seriousness from the world, right? And a sense of humor allows you to approach the world very, very differently, which perhaps leads me to the last point I want to make and leave it to Ram after this, that uh, humor is also an approach to the world. And for what Professor Bakshi has is you speak to him, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, Professor, Professor Dunder said in the last panel, <laughs> about Shamnath, uh, she said that Shamnath was not one to curse the darkness, but was one to light a candle. And you have a similar sense about him. You're speaking about the darkest events with him, but you come back with a sense of hope and optimism. And I think that's a quality which, which one must generate because that's a quality of a, a, a speaking to the future as it were, which is a very important quality for us to cultivate now in personal lives. I'll end with the way we ended this book actually, uh, sorry, the, the introduction actually, with a quote from a uh, 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 thinker, Hannah Arendt, written this really marvelous book called Men in Dark Times. Of course, as sexuality activists, activists, we won't say men in dark times, we'll say persons in dark times. But the way she, it's a, it's a form of a tribute to nine or 10 very important thinkers who Arendt in, in her time, including people like Bertolt Brecht and Rosa Luxemburg. And she put, paints these really marvelous pen portraits of these individuals. And she, in the introduction, she says, sometimes, even in the darkest of times, we have the right to expect some illumination. That illumination may not come from concepts and theories, but almost invariably will come from the lives of some people who under almost all circumstances will kindle that light. Whether that light is the light of a sun or the, or the light, of, or light of a candle, only the future will tell. And so the way I see this book is really, it's that, it's that form of a light and again, what is the form of a light, right? Again, this very, very interesting thing that Professor Bakshi does. We all heard of the Gramscian dictum, which is that it's a really, really difficult time we live in. So what we need is uh, what Gramsci puts it, is a pessimism of the intellect and an optimism of the will. Professor Bakshi reverses the dictum and says, what we need, especially in the, in the, in the academic sphere, is what you need is an optimism of the intellect. So this book is really an invitation to open out that area of the optimism and intellect. And I hope, uh, apart from reading it, reading it is one part of it. More importantly, I hope you really will use this as a chance to get to interact with them in as much as, much as one can. And uh, read is really extensive writings because that's really, as Pratap Bhanumaita puts it, there's no area of Indian law on which Professor Bakshi has not written. So it's, it's a very, very important that you read Professor Bakshi in the original. So Ram, I'll leave it to you with that. Thank you, Arvind. It's indeed a privilege to talk about this book despite being an interlocutor in it. Unlike Arvind, I'm not going to take for granted that you know Professor Bakshi's work too well, and I'm not going to use once again Professor Bakshi because it's an insult to him. So I'm going to use Upen from now on. Uh, I'm not going to take for granted that you probably are too familiar with his work. I mean, I would be very happy if you uh, heard of him because he's coming thanks to uh, Amita's work and invitations that he has been spending time. And I'm sure some of you had an opportunity of having discussions with him. I mean, uh, Upen is a wordsmith who is in the business of writing for the last 60 years, uh, ever since he wrote his first piece, or one of the early pieces that may not be the first piece, the major piece that he has written on Little Done and Vast Undone, on as a review of uh, Austin's uh, Cornerstone of the Nation, Constitution of India. right? So if you take that as one major academic beginning in his career, uh, he is close to spend 60 years in producing words. So such a person, I'm sure, 
must have done a lot of writing. When we were trying to prepare ourselves for this conversation some 15 years ago, um, I must acknowledge the effort of uh, one of the NLS alumnus, Ramanjit Chima, who is now in a legal uh, technology policy position elsewhere. Uh, he has compiled very painstakingly something close to seven volumes of photocopied materials of his work. So it's a massive reflection that you will see from Upain's work. Right? So in other words, I would certainly see there's something more than a life story. There's something more than knowing Upain the scholar, something more than knowing Upain as the person, glimpses of which Arvind has presented to all of us, right? So I think the attempt here is to really capture this uh, connection between the emotional self and the writing that one has done as a person, as a scholar, as an activist in whatever walk of life that one has moved in. I mean, I don't know whether uh, you read autobiographies and biographies, but I think the quickest sort of contemporary sort of thing, if I can give, uh, the South African Constitutional Court judge, Albie Sachs, has a two-part autobiography, uh, Alchemy of Law and Life, uh, and in which what uh, Justice Sachs does is the uncommon thing that most judges, I think with I would, with due respect to uh, Justice Bhatt here on the panel, with very few judges would be able to say, that is, what motivated me the way I decided on X case, Y case, right? So it's a discussion of the inner world of the judge. In other words, the inner experience of law as perceived by somebody who decided a particular case is something that one put very forthrightly. That's what you would see in the work of uh, Sachs and the alchemy of law and life. And I'm saying actually the reason why that is important is where you see the connection between the inner emotional self of the person and the outcome, the articulation, the reasoned outcome of the judgment that you would see. And in a similar way, I think uh, our effort is to capture that the entanglement of the emotional self and the reasoned outcome that uh, Upain has produced over the last 60 years or so. So I think uh, that I would say is certainly the context that is the reason all the four of us were very inspired to have this conversation with him. It is, as Arvind rightly pointed out, is an uncommon form. It's a, an experimental form. And it's an experimental form because it's not a conventional autobiography where Upen was sitting somewhere and trying to produce something and then we are reading as an after act of it. It is not a commissioned biography either. In other words, one hasn't really sat and said something and then there is an ornamental way of rewriting by us. That's not happening. And it is neither oral history, if you see as a form, like I suppose I'll give, I don't know how many of you are familiar, like for instance, the Penguin published the Komal Kothari's uh, oral history of Rajasthan or some such sort of work, because it's like you're trying to articulate something about a period, a place, et cetera. Here, I would say what this particular effort or a novel experiment that the four of us seem to have done is, something you perhaps could call as an interlocutory autobiography. So in other words, this is a conversation. The conversation is an effort to draw the emotional life and the reasoned outcome of the scholarship. And in doing so, uh, I would certainly hope uh, we come out in this sort of a thing as not like four devotees talking to their totem figure, but rather as true friends and interlocutors. In other words, I hope we produced an honest conversation. And for me, the hallmark of an honest conversation is never take on any word on the face value, right? So in other words, the privilege of friendship is the really at the base of producing honest friendship, right? So I would say um, the, the, the privilege is to 
critically being an interlocutor and engage. And so this conversation, when something comes up from the other side, you're once again spontaneously pushing the person to say something different, something more. Uh, and through that, obviously, there is a spontaneity on the other side as well. I mean, one may not have thought when express something about it, and these are four fellows sitting and then pouncing on back, saying, no, no, why do you think it is that way? So could you say something different? So in that sense, I would say it's a kind of a very different kind of a interlocutory autobiography as a form, in, in my view. And how good, how bad, how ugly is it? Um, uh, I'm sure whenever you had an opportunity, if you read, um, you perhaps can uh, come to a judgment. I would say two other broad points in terms of the context. One uh, historian, Ramchandra Guha, um, uh, some time ago basically said in a personal conversation that India has um, a very thin institutional history. And especially, I would say, I mean, not only that we have very few works on the larger constitutional uh, and political institutions in this country, very few handful of books, even Supreme Court, we have a very handful of books on its history. We have very few biographies and autobiographies of the judges from that vantage point. And so I would say the reason why uh, you need histories, I would say is, um, you know, Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, at one point said, um, the very essence of modernity is we are condemned to reflect on ourselves. I'm not sure. So if we don't reflect on ourselves, one possible way of interpreting it is we are not yet modern. And now you tell me how much of history of legal education that you know, having been in a privileged um, elite institution like Nalsar and having studied four years, five years, whatever time that you are here, if it is LLM, probably only one year, but how much of legal history do you know, right? In other words, I'm saying the, clear point uh, to think about is this whole question of how to reflect on ourselves, which means how to reflect on understanding what has been 25 years of Nalsa. I mean, I think some of you said this is the Silver Jubilee year and so on. This moment is important to reflect on what resources do we have to construct the history of 25 years of Nalsa. I think that I would say retrospectively I can justify if you want to understand the legal cultures, history of legal cultures, uh, legal educational cultures in this country, there are not many sources. There may be some broad histories of which college was started when, well, maybe 1855, maybe some other kind of uh, history. That's about institutional chronology. But if you really want to understand what are the ways by which uh, you know, the law was taught, whether there has been some difference in terms of, uh, you know, over a period of time. Uh, we don't have too many. I mean, even other places it is new, frankly speaking. I mean, I would refer to William Twining's more recent uh, general jurisprudence written about 10, 15 years ago. If you see, the first part is dedicated to what has been the errors he made as a teacher in teaching about uh, family law, teaching about jurisprudence, teaching about criminal law, etc. right? In other words, you will come to understand how law is taught and understood and changed over a period of time by looking at those experiences, which I am metaphorically saying, where you will see the emotional self and the rational articulation, the entanglement of it becomes more clearer and expressed. I would certainly see the volume then is one of those attempts to bring that out. The other, of course, is another point I've used Ramchandra Gua's thing. He also said writing biography in South Asia is very difficult, if not impossible. Why is it? Because often the biography then he said in his own words, I think he has written a op-ed piece somewhere. He said the, the distinction between a biography and a hagiography blurs in South Asia because the kind of expectation from the other side often is assumed by the authors and then played into that. So there is a problem of writing biographies 
in the way that they can be honest, that they can be very clear, even if it is controversial. That I think is something that one needs to attempt at. And I think uh, the, the kind of, because it's not a conventional biography, but see this four interlocutors, mild interrogations, uh, hopefully will bring a self, uh, which is very, very, uh, I mean, transparent in our understanding uh, in this whole um, sort of a thing. <clears throat> Okay, so I would say then, um, uh, I think most of the things that I wanted to say is already uh, done. Um, uh, that's it. I think um, maybe it is an opportunity and we hope, I mean, I think I was just sharing with Darwin that uh, we, I think it could have been much better to have a m more detailed introduction. Uh, we both attempted in this book uh, it's a bit of unhappy uh, closure that we had to do because of the pressures of the work, etc. Um, but I think the uh, the human self and the scholarly self of Upen uh, to give some kind of detailed and meaningful expression to it, I would certainly think we need to write an intellectual biography ourselves. So hopefully that's a future project. That's a project that we might return to at some point of time uh, if our uh, other times permit certainly it's a it's a it's an obligation we owe to upen and his uh, interlocutory inspiration to all of us in a in a, a role of a teacher as a friend i don't think he would agree that he is a teacher he would always say i'm only a friend right he is obviously something that uh, very clear that friendship is the ultimate kind of a privilege that we have in our lives so i think we will come back to it but it would be a, an opportunity for most of you to see uh, a bit of work that is often not in circulation. So I think one of our uh, vicarious kind of hopes, in a way, is that uh, you know how to bring Upen's work into circulation using the social media terminology of how to keep the ideas continuously discussed in the scholarly way. I think it's important uh, that we bring some of his fascinating work whether it is towards the sociology of law in India, uh, which is something I would say profoundly interdisciplinary work that very few scholars can really uh, put themselves to, or his interesting work on Supreme Court, because this is Courts and Constitutions con uh, Conference, his interesting work, a series of things from Supreme Court and politics of India to courage, craft, and contention to uh, many other kind of things that he has done subsequently or his work on constitution, as I said, the thing that brought him into focus is little done was undone. So you would see a 100 page plus review for a 250 page book, right? So that's, I suppose, is what Bakshi to all of us and to your generation. And I hope it would be interesting to you. Thank you. I thank Professor Nayan, Nayan and Professor Kakhayala for that wonderful introduction to the book. I'm sure we're all very excited to read it. I now call upon Justice Savinda Bhatt to give the valedictory remarks of this conference. Vice Chancellor, Dr. Krishna Devarao. Uh, Dr. Narayan and Dr. Ram. Uh, it was a pleasure, in fact, very fascinating to hear this discussion of the what you what one of you described as an interlocutory form of a new kind of well, one find for for uh, dearth of a better word of a different kind of philo uh, of biography, and what uh, uh, Arvind described as a kind of stream of consciousness. Uh, method that you have uh, adopted. Mm, what struck me was this uh, allusion to Albie Sachs, uh, the emotional entanglement. I, I would assume that's unique. And I completely agree that uh, in Supreme Court, you, or at least the judges of the Supreme Court or jurists, generally don't write accounts which speak about events. It is more about uh, events that concern themselves. I uh, have often bemoaned, sometimes, most of the times to my law clerks, erstwhile law clerks, 
and sometimes to my friends that judges, when they have their wits around themselves, when they so retire from service, they, they don't pen down what they thought about the judgments, not necessarily that they wrote, but about the judgments that were written during the time that they were judges or lawyers. And um, I can't say I made a resolve to uh, do something in that direction, but definitely this idea of entangling your emotions is very fascinating. But then I'll add one, one caveat to what uh, the previous speaker said that it is not easy to untangle the emotional from the intellectual and one has to put a little distance and then then alone i believe you can get something worthwhile otherwise you could be in the route down the road of self justification or something worse so therefore this business of untanglement of the emotional i mean i have not read albi sack's work though i've heard about it and it's one of my resolves to read many of these things which I could not previously. Uh, but yes, I have read a lot of biographies and uh, not really autobiographies, especially uh, the works of uh, uh, Justice Stevens, who was remarkably lucid in the way he wrote uh, late St uh, Just Justice Stevens, a, a remarkable life. Uh, I read both his books. One was called The Nine Chief Justices. And the other one was a more recent one, and the title was very interesting. The first 94 years of my life. <laughs> so a remarkable man. And then I also read about uh, people like Justice Brennan, and uh, I, I read Sandra Day O'Connor's, and I've read uh, Antonia Sotomayor. Well, that's a different genre. Uh, uh, but uh, I do believe that judges, rather than speaking about ourselves, it is better to comment about the times we lived in the judgment that we were we might have written and certainly we might have thought something about or issues more importantly uh, in that perhaps if i'm not wrong albi sachs stands out if he could actually untangle the emotional from the intellectual part and i think it's a great idea to work on uh, well what to speak of uh, Upendra Bakshi. He was a teacher. Of course, I didn't have the privilege of learning from him. Although he lived during the times, uh, he was a tutor for the likes of Professor Danda, who is here. And uh, he used to teach LLM students and I think he used to guide doctoral uh, candidates. Uh, but then one did get glimpses of his brilliance uh, when he spoke. And the uh, earliest memory I have of uh, Professor Bakshi's uh, getting into his uh, chamber and inviting him to preside over a moot court, which we had organized. Uh, it was very difficult to get to him. So I took the bull by the horns and uh, I just tapped the door and walked in. And he was in serious conversation talking to his students. He looked irritated and he said, oh, what do you want? <laughs> Then, of course, like a fool, I said that I wanted uh, something, but I'm sorry, I barged in, I'll go away. He said, no, now that you're here, tell me. <laughs> and of course, very graciously accepted, and then he judged the moot court. And um, then I did attend a lot of his lectures. And then, of course, I was away from the campus, having practiced law. But uh, of late, I have run into him many times. And uh, it's been, whenever we have been together, it's been a very rewarding experience. Well, this is all very inane, but the kind of conversations that the two of you have engaged with him seems to be remarkable, and you have uh, produced something which is unique, and uh, you have hopefully you've created a new genre. Uh, but this is not this. My speech is not only about your book, which uh, is the highlight today in this session, but also about the uh, closure of this chapter of of this uh, event two-day event where you had six sessions. Uh, I, was, I had the privilege of uh, attending three of them, uh, including one in which I participated and the inaugural one. But I think the livelier ones were today. <laughs> and I, I definitely uh, missed and they were, and I explained to Arvind uh, my own reasons for omitting to attend it. Uh, and he understands it. So I'll, I, I hope he has excused me for it. Uh, 
other than that, I think the uh, section on electoral uh, laws and federalism and uh, today's on equality and uh, the court system and lastly on disability, all of them uh, brought out remarkable insights from what I heard on the federalism aspect. It was indeed uh, quite uh, interesting, Sudhir's and uh, I think Snigda's uh, presentations were excellent. I read about them. And um, uh, now that I'm involved here with the Sark Law Center, I, uh, this, this uh, two-day event has been a, a, a very educative one for me. And I hope to be here, uh, at least involved in some manner or the other. Whether I'm here physically or not, is, it all depends on uh, the university's abil, uh, b b b willingness to accommodate me and also my <laughs> availability, if I may say so. So uh, I think uh, all of you, uh, and I see almost a full house, which is very promising. And I, I feel that this is a, a great thing. And I hope the university keeps it up. And taking a cue from uh, Professor Ram sets about the idea of tracing its own history and coming out with something at the end of this year. Uh, with that, I would say thank you and wish you all the best for the coming year's activity. Thank you, Justice Bhatt, for those valedictory remarks. Uh, Justice Bhatt has actively participated in this conference of ours. I've had so many juniors and friends run up to me and say, this is what we spoke to Justice Bhatt, this is how much time we got, we're so excited. So thank you for that. Uh, I now call upon Payaka Kamra, who, along with Lavesh Garg, who's with us today, were the first edit student editors-in-chief of the Law and Other Things blog to share some remarks. Hi, uh, thank you, Vishan. Uh, so I would first like to start by extending my gratitude to the Vice Chancellor. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this event. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Vikram Raghavan for uh, bringing in the legacy of Law and Other Things blog to the students of Nalsar. Uh, and I would like also like to extend my thanks to Siddharth Johan, sir, who has unconditionally provided his support To, uh, to, to basically all the editorial teams on campus. Uh, since the time that I was here, Chauhan sir has guided us in every possible way. Uh, and I would take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, uh, Lavish Kar. He was the first, uh, first co-editor-in-chief with me on the student uh, panel of the Law and Other Things blog. So, uh, the namesake of the blog, Law and Other Things, comes from M.C. Sethilvad's uh, autobiography, My Life, Law and Other Things. But at the time of the introduction, uh, the founders uh, focused mainly on constitutional law, courts, and the legal systems of India. But uh, if you look at the blog today, it has uh, truly lived up to the other things part of its name as well. And uh, I think I think the, this conference bears testament to that fact. Over the last two days, we saw how uh, law interacts with so many other aspects of the society. So, for example, uh, the panel on elections was very enlightening in the sense that they told us how uh, the players of elections have moved beyond what the con constitution initially envisioned. Then uh, the panel on federalism taught us how uh, a constitutional principle of federalism is closely related to the political history of a country. And of course, like I think today's panels as well, uh, we got to hear about the life experience of uh, the same-sex couples seeking the right to get married. And uh, I think the last panel, all of us would agree, was very moving and made us all reflect in words. And uh, I... I think I think this fifth edition of Courts and Constitution was a huge success, and I, I feel very old as I say that uh, the first edition of the Courts and Constitutions conference happened when uh, 
I was the first co-editor in chief of the Law and Other Things blog. And I still remember it was some, uh, some seven years ago when uh, Vikram came on campus and he wanted us to, he wanted, he spoke to some of the students of NALSA and he wanted to revive the blog basically. And at that time, uh, Law and Other Things was facing a lot of competition from uh, websites like Bar and Bench and Live Law, you know, who were very actively posting content. And we also had a lot of uh, competitive blogs on constitutional law and public law, which came up and uh, were dominating the space. And uh, I, think, I think as students, what the first thing that we did was we interacted with other students of NALSA and we asked them, what do you think about the blog? How can we improve? And uh, I think it was their active feedback that constantly helped us in uh, bettering the blog. So for example, the, one of the first things that uh, our team did was change the interface of the blog. Uh, it seems like something so simple, but it helped gain a lot of traction. And I think since then, uh, a lot of the, the, the following editorial teams have also uh, made a lot of positive changes to the blog. So, uh, for example, uh, one of the teams started uh, uploading podcasts on the blog website, and uh, we also have we also have a, a, a section which breaks down complex legal judgments and makes it accessible to the non-legal audience, basically. So, uh, I mean, we need a lot more changes as well. I mean, I know uh, the trajectory of the blog has certainly grown has certainly be, certainly been an upward trajectory but there's still a lot to be done and there's still a long way to go and uh, in this coming year or the coming years we will focus on making the blog more interactive uh, be it in terms of comments from the audience or in terms of uh, having uh, non-legal personals interact with the content on the blog we will also try to increase our activity on uh, social media and reach out to more people and uh, perhaps use artificial intelligence to uh, you know, make the blog more accessible, be it in terms of uh, crossing language barriers or uh, in terms of creating accessibility by using voice tools. So, uh, and I think, I, think, I think I love the, the last panel on the Shamnath Bashir Memorial Roundtable. I think uh, that uh, has given us a lot to think about in terms of how we can uh, improve the accessibility of the blog across uh, to different sections. So, uh, but having said that, yes, law and other things will maintain its focus on quality articles because uh, at the upfront, uh, law and other things is about producing quality work, which has gotten us so far. But at the back end, it's also an organization which has helped mentor a lot of students from NALSA. If you interact with uh, your seniors who have been a part of this blog, you will realize how uh, an opportunity to be a part of the blog helped them improve their writing skills, help them improve their research. So uh, I, would, I would highly, highly encourage all the students sitting here to apply for the blog uh, as an editor, as a news writer, or even as a mentor. And if not apply, then write for the blog. We are very open to accepting all good quality articles, regardless of where it comes from. So do try. If nothing, you will end up getting a great feedback, and you will end up improving your legal writing in massively. So thank you all for uh, coming here. Thank you all for being a part of this wonderful conference. And I hope to interact with many more of you through uh, Law and Other Things blog. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Payaka, for your words on the journey of the blog and the plans ahead for both the blog and the conference. Uh, I now request Utkarsh and Jay to join me for the vote of thanks. You've been a wonderful audience. It's the last piece now. Hi, hello, how are you? Uh, my thanks to the Honorable uh, VC and the Honorable Registrar and to Professor Kakarala for extending the greatest level of institutional assistance possible. 
On behalf of the student body, I express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Chauhan, who has held this conference with a dedication and uh, initiative that's unmatched. And uh, so sorry. It's been a single-minded mission towards instilling constitutionalism that's been 75 years in the making. I also want to accord my sincere thanks to Professors uh, Srijan and Eamon, who really, really took, took charge of this conference and burnished it to the glorious sheen we saw over the last few days. Uh, Ishan will go into further and requisite level of detail about the OC and other people who helped us along the way. But I've been tasked with talking about things of sentiment of, and the past and the future. One of the great things about being a fifth year student is that you can make definitive statements about anything and maybe you'll inspire less level of scrutiny. Across my four and some years of uh, living here, this hall, this hall that you're sitting in has been a veritable temple of learning and discourse. Uh, this blue and white approximation of liberated Hippomacian dialogue. Uh, judges and academics and lawyers and uh, people who raised eyebrows for various reasons. I believe this constellation of voices seldom strikes twice. Uh, over the years, we've seen student participation in these events rise and fall and rise. Uh, we heartened that, we heartened uh, uh, on this particular occasion by the audience turnout and are glad more and more people see events, events such as this uh, or what they are, that is the crucible of real life and idealism and where the tension between what people say, what people write and what people do is sufficient to arouse the sleepiest of our people, maybe even a bunch of law students on the weekend. I'll miss this, but I can hope uh, advancing batches share the sentiment and the duty that is manifest in these things always. Thanks. Uh, it's often said that one should not ask how sausages are made. And as anyone who has organized anything, a principal joy and calamity of the event is that the process of making it work might fall short of the event itself. That has not been the case in any edition, any previous edition of this conference. And I'm glad to extend my thanks to everyone who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes. My special thanks are to the Vice Chancellor, his office, Mr. Chidambaram, Mr. Suresh, in registrar's office, Mr. Bhaskar, Mr. Ramesh, the IT department, the accounts office, the exam office, the engineering department, the convention center staff, the university drivers, the housekeeping staff, the maintenance staff, and countless others who form the pillar on which this conference rests. After this conference, I'm pleasantly surprised and taken back to my first year, where all of this began. At the conclusion of the fifth and my final edition of this confluence of sorts, I'm most proud of this conference and what, how it serves as a mirror and a bridge for this institution and how it builds a culture where we can come together and discuss. Thank you. I don't have the wit and humor that Utkarsh and Jay have led with, so I'll get straight to the substance. Um, as student coordinators, Utkarsh and I have been absolutely lucky to have a wonderful and incredible organizing committee. Um, everyone was personally invested in this conference and uh, it showed from their willingness to go well and above uh, their calling and um, to truly embodying what a student-led conference should look like. The event management team was the first to start working way back in November they conceptualized the themes of the panels and put together the wonderful list of speakers that has been on display before you the past two days. Uh, the event management team comprises Jay Agarwal, Utkarsh, Tisha Chaudhary, Rashika Bodh, and Avni Vijay. Avni was also leading the tech and social media team. Sorry? Oh. Yeah, uh, Rashika, Tisha. Avni, please. Avni was also leading the tech and social media team comprised of Bharati Challa and Devi Nandana Baiju. Uh, everyone, please come on stage as we take your name. Yeah. Who designed all our posts and banners and actively covered social media for this event. Uh, next, we have the logistics team who have been working tirelessly for long hours in setting up the venue, 
in uh, the banners, crowd management, and taking up every little detail and every other thing that didn't fit into the buckets of one of the other teams. Uh, the logistics team is comprised of Harshita Adai, Rishita Nimani, Kirti Satvika, Vaibhav Gautam, Gangavat Etika, Yash Dadani, and Harsh Jain. I also wanted to thank uh, Harsh Jain, Sukrit Khandekar, and Archita Satish, who excellently managed the LOT blog uh, for the past three months while many of us were engrossed in this conference. We are also grateful to Payaka Kamra, Lovish Garg, Daya Singla, and Gayatri Gupta, who have guided us in this endeavor with their experience of organizing the conference in past years. Next, we have Jitendra Vishwakarma, who took care of accommodation with exceptional efficiency. Jitu also single-handedly organized the um, Kunal Ambasta talk a few days earlier, and along with Ayush Bajpai, handled the transport and accommod and uh, with yeah. Next, we have Suina Pava, Nupur Barman, and Moni Shraj, part of the hospitality team, who organized all the food, snacks, cleaning, and more, guided by Jay Agarwal, with his years of experience organizing CNC. Jay also brought the Reclaim Constitution exhibition, which has been immensely popular. We also have Advika Anandal, who's helped, who's helped with our SCC collaboration and our finances for this conference. Lastly, we have Sharanya Ravindran and Rujul Arora, who have sat and diligently prepared summaries of all the panels as heads of the rapid showing team. Shayanya and Srijan sir also handled the live updates and of the discussions on the SEC online blog. To conclude, I'd once again like to give a huge shout out to Professor Siddharth Chauhan, for whom we have something special planned after this conference. He's been a pillar of support for this conference and a genuine mentor to all of us. Here's to us all for an incredible Quotes in the Constitution Conference 2024. Thank you, everyone. Can we have a round of applause for Ishan and Utkarsh? This would not have been possible without them. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience. We can conclude for the day now. Our volunteers and OC members are requested to please stay back. I don't know.